All right, it looks like everyone's here. So why don't we go ahead and get started with our regular meeting. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 10.30 a.m. session of the November 10th, 2020 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. I have a few announcements, and then we'll move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on Community Television Channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All city council members are participating in this meeting remotely, and I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's city council meeting. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, call in at the beginning of the item you're wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through your phone. Please note there's a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it's time for public comment, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it's your time to speak, you will, be, uh, you will hear an announcement that you've been unmuted and the timer will be set to two minutes. You may hang up once you've commented on your item of interest. And with that, I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Byers. Here. Matthews. Brown. Here. Boulder. Here. Watkins. Vice Mayor Myers. Here. And Mayor Cummings. Here. I would like to acknowledge that the land upon which we gather is the unceded territory of the Owasso speaking Yupi tribe. The Amamutsan tribal band comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to Mission Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historic trauma. Um, with that, we'll move on to the uh, first item on our agenda, uh, which is uh, mayoral proclamation declaring November 10th, 2020 as Veterans Appreciation Day. Um, I'll start by just reading a few items on our proclamation. And so whereas we celebrate Veterans Day on the anniversary of the armistice ending World War I on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, and whereas 101 years later we expand on this tradition, celebrating the heroes among us who have continued to serve our community even after taking off the military uniform. And whereas it is important that we continue to serve with them, appreciate them, and thank them by giving back to our community in any way we can. And whereas City Hall has, the city has all branches of the military represented and dozens of employees who have donned the military uniform in service of our country and community. Whereas by their service and their dedicated efforts, these men and women have earned the gratitude of the city of Santa Cruz. Now, therefore, I, Justin Cummings, mayor of the city of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim Tuesday, November 10th, 2020, as, C as City Veterans Appreciation Day in the city of Santa Cruz, and encourage all citizens to join me in saying thank you to these employees for their dedicated service to our country and continued service to our community and committing to causes that are greater than self and promoting public service. The next item, um, I just wanted to take an opportunity to make a brief announcement. Um, earlier, well, on October 30th, 2020, we actually received a letter from our state treasurer, Fiona Ma, um, and informing us that uh, Planned Parenthood West Side, located at 1111 Pacific Avenue, Suite 200 in the city of Santa Cruz, recently uh, received approval for a lifeline grant in the amount of $55,242. And so I just wanted to say congratulations to Planned Parenthood for receiving that state funding that will really help many um, individuals within our community. We're gonna have a few other presentations later on this afternoon. Uh, and so I'm gonna skip ahead to uh, presiding officer's announcements. And so I have a few announcements and we'll move on to our regular meeting. So today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the website cityofsantacruz.com. Um, if you wish to comment on an item 
On agenda item today, the instructions will be on your screen, and we'll provide these instructions throughout the meeting whenever we move into an agenda item that will be open for public comment. So please note, public comment is heard only on items on that the council is taking action on today and not regular updates or reports. So the items that will be open for public comment during today's meeting are numbers 10 through 28 on our agenda. So next item, um, statements of disqualifications. I'd like to ask if there's any council members uh, who have statements of disqualification today. If hearing none, we'll move on to the next item. I'd like to ask the city clerk if there's any additions or deletions to our agenda. Um, no, there are not. Okay, next item, uh, I'll make an announcement regarding oral communications. Uh, oral communications is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us on items that are not on our agenda. Uh, oral communications will occur immediately after agenda item 27 today. So if you wish to make a comment during oral communications, please call in towards the end of item number 27. Next item up, uh, I'd like to call on the city attorney to provide any reports on a closed session. Uh, thank you, Mayor Cummings, members of the City Council. The uh, Council met remotely uh, this morning um, at 9 a.m. Uh, to discuss the following items. Uh, first was pending litigation. Uh, the Council received a report from and gave direction to legal counsel in regard to the four uh, following matters. One, Save Our Big Trees versus the City of Santa Cruz, currently pending in the uh, Santa Cruz County Superior Court. Second, Regents of the University of California versus the City of Santa Cruz, also pending in the uh, Santa Cruz Superior Court. The third is uh, entitled City of Arcata et al. versus Pacific Gas and Electric Company. That's currently pending in the San Francisco Superior Court. And item four is the case of Donald J. Trump et al. versus the State of New York. And. Uh, in, on that item, the council voted unanimously to join the County of Santa Clara and the Public Rights Project uh, in an amicus curiae brief currently pre uh, being prepared in a case before the United States Supreme Court that challenges uh, President Trump's memorandum directing that undocumented immigrants be excluded from the population count to apportion congressional seats. Uh, a three-judge lower court in New York concluded that this memorandum was unlawful. Uh, in a related case, a three-judge court in California found that the memorandum violated both uh, statutes governing the census and the U.S. Constitution. Um, so that was an action taken by the city council on that item. Item two was an item of significant exposure to the litigation in which the uh, uh, council received a report from the city attorney's office and gave direction. There was no reportable action on that item. Uh, item three was a conference with labor negotiators in which the council uh, received a report from its negotiator uh, concerning the uh, SEIU Local 521. There was no reportable action. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item on our agenda is uh, city manager report. So I'd like to ask the city manager uh, to report and provide updates on city events and other business items. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, today we wanted to provide the council with an update on preparations for the winter and in particular winter storms and winter flows that uh, we may see uh, an increase of as a result of the recent fires up in the, the uh, uh, north, uh, uh, north of us in the San Lorenzo Valley in particular. And so uh, to do that, uh, we will have uh, our fire chief and our water director give an impact on, uh, give a presentation on the impact, particularly to the city and to our water system. So with that, I'll turn it over first to uh, Chief Hyduk, and then uh, after that, uh, uh, our water director will also do a presentation. So thank you. Mayor Cumming, City Council, uh, Jason Hyduk, your fire chief, um, and Bonnie's gonna pull up a very brief presentation on the post-fire debris flow. And what you're looking at right here, this is a map uh, that is generated by the county. Um, and the area that's outlined in black is actually the fire perimeter of the CZU uh, fire that occurred. 
uh, 85,000 plus acres. And inside of that footprint, you see a uh, shaded area that's blue, and there's light blue and dark blue. And the light blue is at an elevated risk of uh, fire, uh, host fire debris flow. And the darker shaded areas are at an even more elevated risk. What's important to note about this is that the debris flow uh, footprint is greater than the footprint of the CZU fire, and that's just based on the topography and the terrain that we have up in that area. And so this is a county-led effort. Uh, this information uh, later on, I'll, show, I'll uh, share the link that you can go to. But really, uh, the, this is a big deal, and people need to pay attention to this. Uh, they need to take this seriously. Uh, the post uh, debris flow is going to have the potential to have a greater impact in the fire itself and also outside of the footprint of where the fire was. What we don't want are for people who are in an area that didn't uh, suffer any consequence from the fire to not take this seriously. Uh, if they're downhill um, from where the fire occurred, they're at an elevated risk. And so this map uh, just kind of shows the, the area that uh, is of greater concern. The majority of the area is located in the San Lorenzo Valley along the Highway 9 corridor, and then there are some other areas on the western uh, edge of Empire Grade out toward the coast that because of uh, the fire um, uh, impacts that they are at increased risk. Nothing inside the city itself uh, is uh, at risk right now, even though we do have the potential of having some um, impacts from that. If you can go to the next slide, Monty. So how can the debris flows impact the city of Santa Cruz? Uh, debris flows, uh, they can be called different things. Uh, so just wanna make sure that we're on the same page when it comes to the nomenclature. Uh, mudslides, mud flows, debris flows. Um, and they're a little bit different than some mudslides that we've had just from rain um, because of the impacts of the fire. So they can move uh, large objects, not just mud, but rocks, boulders, trees, and they flow over a large area. And what happens when we have a fire of this magnitude in the scope is it, it's so damaging to the ecosystem and the vegetation that would normally absorb a lot of that water. Uh, if you think about a redwood forest and the duck that's underneath that, um, that material was really damaged by this fire that occurred. And ash that is left um, is very mobile and it's also hydrophobic. It does not absorb water. And so when we get rain that would normally be absorbed by that biomass, by that, um, by that uh, ecosystem that's, uh, that lives within the redwood forest, that's been changed. And so we're at much higher risk of uh, having a debris flow. And that's why a lot of planning has gone into this. So that excess material, what the impact for the city can be, um, besides just the people that may be impacted by this, is an increased uh, risk of debris coming into the San Lorenzo River, uh, increased risk of material that could potentially damage uh, one of our biggest uh, areas of concern is the Highway 1, Highway 1 bridge as you come into the city. Uh, that has a center pillar. And so if we get a large amount of material that gets uh, flushed out of the San Lorenzo Valley and uh, builds a dam, uh, it can actually uh, erode and take that bridge out. So that's something that we've made some plans for and we'll be keeping an eye on it. And the other uh, consequence, and I think Rosemary will talk about this, is that um, the water quality and the water quantity may be impacted. Uh, next slide, Bonnie. So what are we doing as a city to uh, prepare? Uh, we'll be monitoring all rain events. We do this anyway. And we'll be pushing out early notification to our employees and the community for the potential of flooding uh, when we're notified by the National Weather Service. Um, the city, uh, through the EOC, through the fire department and the city as a whole, We've been working with all of our allied agencies uh, for both the response component as well as the planning and the communication and the coordination. Uh, 911 has developed our, uh, our polygons or areas where people will be at increased risk, how they're going to communicate with them, working with the California Office of Emergency Services, and really importantly, the National Weather Service in developing a uh, flow uh, response plan and monitoring the weather and those trigger points for how much rain that we get, when we get that rain, and when we need to notify people. Uh, two weeks ago, we went through a disaster preparation tabletop exercise with all of these partners, the county, uh, the city agencies, uh, Cal OES, the Weather Service, uh, Public Works in the county, um, and went through a tabletop exercise for how we would respond to this so that we can make sure that we're as prepared as we can be. 
And I also want to highlight that this is a county-led uh, effort. Uh, none of the impacts from the CZU fire occurred within the city itself. And so the county is really the, the lead for this. And you can go to the County of Santa Cruz um, website, and they have two main tabs on there. One is for COVID, which is still going on. And then they also have the Santa Cruz County Fire Recovery. Um, and if you click on that link, it will take you to um, where you can access these maps where it talks about debris removal, debris mud flows, and it has the map so that you can really drill down to your specific address so that you can have a plan uh, for how you're going to evacuate if notified, as well as whether or not you're at an elevated risk. And I would urge everyone uh, to do so, so that uh, you're not ca caught unaware. Um, during the Thomas fire in Ventura, uh, there was uh, some pretty catastrophic consequences when they had debris flows in Montecito. And our goal is uh, to prevent that loss of life. Uh, we're not going to be able to prevent uh, the mud flows themselves. There's nothing we can do about that other than having an increased awareness of the potential and having an increased awareness for what would trigger uh, those uh, potential uh, debris flows. Um, so that's what I have for you today. I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Again, I would urge everyone to take this seriously, uh, be prepared, go to the county website and see if you're in the area that could potentially be impacted by this. Thanks for that presentation, Jason. Uh, are there any questions from council members at this time? Uh, Vice Mayor Myers. Thanks, um, Chief, for that update. Um, my question, I guess, is for you and maybe also um, Mr. Dettel, our Public Works Director. Um, I'm just curious how these conditions relate to the FEMA, sort of the FEMA certified flood, you know, flood project we have and now I think we're now the, the we, we now own that that facility in a sense and that you know uh, mark what so I guess if if, a, if, if we get rain we, we end up with you know this event kind of basically moving downstream through the city um, are we what are, what are our um, how does the flood control project um, perform in terms of, you know, any damages or um, if there is localized or even major funding, flooding. I'm just kind of curious about how we prepare specifically to, you know, our flood prone area in the downtown. If you could just speak a little bit about that just because sure. of the materials in the. Sure, that's a great question. Um, you know, we've done our, our standard uh, vegetation management and we've actually gone in and ripped the um, section of um, the bed of the river between the Highway 1 bridge and the Water Street bridge an extra two feet to hopefully mobilize any material that if we get some high flows, we'll push that area through. Since that area of the river uh, flight control project is the area with the most potential for flooding. Um, so we wanna keep movement of material through that area to keep our highest capacity. The, the area Jason mentioned is the debris against the Highway 1 bridge. That's really the, um, the unknown um, issue for us, and that's one that we're very carefully paying attention to because if that does dam up the water, uh, potentially puts the bridge at risk, but it also potentially break, could break the river out and go around the channel in that area. And so um, we're going to be monitoring any debris that gets up on that bridge. Uh, and we have been working with Caltrans to alert them so that they can mobilize equipment and uh, take that material out. Um, so that's our biggest issue. Um, we are, we do uh, have now control of the flood control channel and we have maintenance of O&M manual, which we are uh, completing and participating in the, the actual maintenance. If any damage and we get any flooding due to this debris flow, it's a new, FEMA event, um, and we would go back and get reimbursement, seek reimbursement for that, uh, just like we're doing for the fire. So it would be a separate event, um, and then we would have to pursue it like another disaster. And just one follow-up on that, Mark. Um, well, two, I guess two questions. One is um, I know that um, some of the insurance um, pieces, along, you know, for, for people who live along the channel, um, are we now that we are sort of, you know, the owner of the channel, um, where are we at with people's flood, flood insurance types of concerns, et cetera? Okay. 
Okay, so yeah, no, that, that's, a good, that's also a good question. Um, we're currently working on the FEMA certification of the channel. Um, the Corps of Engineers build the flood control projects, but they do not certify the flood control projects. Uh, you have to go to the, a different federal agency, FEMA, to do that. Um, we're currently in a, um, a discounted uh, flood insurance zone because the project was t uh, technically under construction. Um, it has been turned over, so we have three years uh, to get that certification to then uh, either keep our discount or even uh, reduce flood insurance rates even more because the, the project will be um, certified by FEMA and and then that will uh, reduce people's flood insurance rates. If it's not certified, um, that after three years, that discount could go away, and that's our biggest concern. That could be almost a, a million and a half dollars citywide on impacts on flood insurance increases. So we're definitely, this is a priority for us. Okay, thank you. And um, do you get the impression in your conversations with Caltrans that for example, they would, uh, you know, put a crane on the bridge or, you know, I know that we've had to do that on the Water Street Bridge before with taking material off and actually physically taking things out as they're actually coming down the river. I mean, is that the kind of response that you're hoping for from them in that they will actually be there to kind of protect the structure and actually move material away from the structure? Yeah, that's the best access for that, uh, removing material from that bridge. They've done that. Um, actually, in 2017, they did that. Um, but, yeah, we put them on alert. Uh, they're not able to um, stage equipment uh, nearby, but we have been in uh, communications, and they will activate and react because um, that's their structure. They want to maintain it. So yeah. um, the, the issue is if they wait too long and – the structure, the material builds up too high, then they put their employees at risk to get that material off of there. So they have to stay on it um, as it starts to accumulate. Okay, thank you. Yep. Councilmember Matthews, and then Councilmember Golder. Questions kind of for Rosemary, and it's regarding the improvements that we made to the um, the infrastructure for the the intake right there up at Graham Hill around Sycamore Grove. And I was wondering if any of that project has been delayed um, as a result of these fires and like potential, you know, flooding or or debris flow coming down the river, or if that's still on track moving forward. Um, thanks for that question, uh, Councilmember Golder. The the Pipeline project, the Under the River Pipeline project, is was delayed a little bit, um, but the, the tunneling under the river now has been completed, uh, and so we are hoping to get the pipe in place and then start refilling and having them be finished by the time, by the end of the year, basically. I mean, we're still getting into what could potentially be some rainy season period, but fundamentally, the, that that plan is moving forward, and uh, we're we're finished with the tunneling, and should be in the you know demobilization here in the next few weeks. Great, thank you. Okay, Are you ready for me? Uh, yeah, just about. I was just going to say thanks to Jason for that update okay. and for all the work that you're doing with the county and you know, knowing that we have employees that live in these areas and work in these areas that are going to be impacted. It's really um, important to have this information. So very much appreciate all the information that was provided today. Oh, Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, Councilor Matthews. Yeah, I, I did remember. I, I emailed uh, Justin to you and to um, Bonnie Bush. Um, we just received a um, newsletter from Supervisor Coonerty. There have, the county is having some debris flow town halls, and I just sent you screenshots. So um, maybe that's something we want to help publicize as well. Coming up, I think, in a couple of days. So, yeah, Jason, I'm sure you know about that. So it's just one more thing to make available to, to people for more detailed information. And maybe if the um city manager can include that in the 
city manager's message for the week that could be helpful to get that message out to employees. Yeah. Yep. Great. All right. Uh, let's continue on with our presentations. And that, so at this point, are we going to, I think we're handing it over to our water director, Rosemary Menard. So, um, all right, there we go. Uh, so what I wanted to do today was to really just give you an update on the, uh, on the status of the work that we've been doing for the post-fire recovery planning. So basically brief overview, talking about what our goal is, the challenges, and the actions we're taking to make sure that we can continuously achieve the goal. Uh, so the goal is not a very surprising thing. It's basically safe, reliable supply of drinking water 24-7, 365. And with the pandemic uh, issues we've had over the last you know, eight or nine months, we know for sure that it's you know, not more important now than ever. So that is really an important goal for us. And in the circumstances that we find ourselves, it's not uh, without its challenges, and Jason started to talk some about some of the what some of those challenges are. Again, just a, a little bit of an orientation. The San Lorenzo is obviously the source of the major part of our uh, water supply, both stored water in Loch Lomond Reservoir and flowing sources, and then we do get water from the North Coast sources. The hatched area that you see over here is karst uh, geology, which is, uh, and this, these areas, some of these areas, particularly in the upper area, were burned, and so we do have some concerns about potential uh, long-term impacts from burn situations on that karst geology and how that might uh, eventually show itself in uh, in some of the water quality issues up in that area, and maybe quantity too. Uh, and you just saw this sort of fire uh, perimeter map. Uh, a lot of the most significant problems were further up into the northern watersheds. Wydell Creek is one, Scott Creek here, had a, quite a bit of uh, a more severe burned areas, hotter areas. And I do think that if you overlay those, uh, those debris flow maps, you would see a number of places where there's more uh, concerns up in these areas, as well as you know moving in into the San Lorenzo, which is everything kind of on this side of the, the divide, the hydrographic divide. And clearly this is a, a, our key area for us. Um, so one of our key concerns is polluted runoff from fire damaged areas. Uh, it's the source, the San Lorenzo source of major water supply for us and was less impacted than other parts of the burn area, but the potential from polluted runoff of the area is real and not insignificant. I'm gonna try to make this go smaller. Um, and I wanna show you some of the things we're concerned about. The, these kind of situations where you get burned out vehicles and you can see that literally, you know, you've got melted, and if you've looked at your car, what's in your car recently, you'll see it's all kinds of plastics and various kinds of man-made materials that are made up of all kinds of chemicals. You see areas where, you know, uh, homes have burned with the materials that are inside homes, and you see these, you know, comp uh, base, you know, big, uh, collections of ash that have come down, maybe from the burn itself or from some of the deposition of ash that occurred during various parts of the fire based on wind. Uh, and these things uh, have made us uh, identify uh, circles or these are properties where we know that there are um, debris that needs to be taken away. It's potentially toxic. And we have identified those areas, particularly in our watershed uh, and in some of our other, you know, important sort of areas like over here is, again, this karst geology where these are priority areas that we have identified and communicated to the county and to the Cal OES people who are working in the next phase of the debris removal. So when they talk about debris removal, and Jason did mention this uh, in his brief presentation, they're talking about moving these vehicles out of the way, uh, actually removing the buildup of accumulated ash so that that ash doesn't 
flow, you know, get mobilized during a rainstorm and flow into a receiving stream and end up in somebody's water supply, uh, like those of us who live in, in Santa Cruz. So this is a huge priority for us, and we've been working very actively with the county during the phase one investigations, as well as in preparation for the phase two work that's starting shortly. I did wanna provide a couple of additional links, as Jason mentioned, um, there are a, quite a bit of work going on at the county level. There's a, a fact sheet here, and there's uh, information about how to get signed up for debris removal off of a burned out property. So uh, these are really important for properties that have been affected by the fire to you know, get engaged in making sure that the debris that, they, that might have accumulated on their property is properly uh, removed and remediated so that it doesn't uh, result in pollution into local water supplies. Another area for us is the, basically the debris flow, and we've talked a little bit about this already, so I'm not gonna go into great detail here, but these are the same kind of similar maps that you saw, a little bit more uh, gradation of some of the, you know, the um, probabilities that there would be a debris flow with a quarter of an inch in 15 minutes. Now that's a pretty good rainstorm, but not certainly not, especially in the higher elevations of our area, not without uh, precedent. So I think there are some pretty strong possibilities that we will be seeing debris flows uh, that will affect uh, certainly the San Lorenzo River and certainly some of these other areas and the rece receiving streams over here as well as any population areas that exist. So this is a, it's a big concern for the reasons that we've been talking about. Um, so now I want to sort of shift over to talking about fire response action planning. And there are three key elements to ensuring safe water supply. And, and so our, area, our, our focus has been on those elements. And one of them is understanding what's going on with water quality and how that water quality data might change. Another one looks at treatment processes and trying to really uh, look at what, what we might be facing in terms of changed water quality and then taking steps to get ready for whatever might be coming. And the last one is really about infrastructure reliability, which of course is always the case. But if you've got a great treatment process, but you can't get water to it or you can't get water away from it because you have a infrastructure problem, then you don't have a reliable water supply. Um, so in terms of water quality, uh, the key treatment process parameters can change as a result of runoff or debris flows from the burned areas. And depending on the degree of change, treatment processes can be adjusted or a potentially impaired source can be taken out of service and alternate so sources or supplies can be brought online. So this is the kind of the data really has to help us to understand, can we treat this water? And uh, if we can't, then we need to be prepared to turn the, that source out and uh, bring something else online to make sure we have an adequate supply. Um, so in terms of water quality data con collection, what we've done is we've added sampling locations, make sure we have relevant data from fire impacted areas, We've added water quality parameters to sample four, including uh, some of the really more troubling things that are some of the pollutants that, that come from, you know, some of these burned uh, man-made uh, items, uh, dioxins, furins, furins, uh, and one that's, I love this word, so I had to put it in here because it's like a really big word, tetrachloro. <laughs> dibenzodioxane. If that doesn't sound bad to you, then I don't know what would. <laughs> it sounds bad to me. And then we've increased sampling frequency, including event sampling to ensure that water quality changes aren't missed. So that's the strategy with respect to water quality data collection. We've also uh, implemented, I don't have it written here, but implemented some sediment uh, sampling, some soil sampling to try to really understand what's accumulating in the soils that we might see uh, coming into the system. From a treatment process perspective, water with higher sediment, nutrients, or organic carbon loading is more challenging to treat. Uh, the water treatment process we have at Graham Hill is adaptable to changing water quality, but really only up to a point, and beyond that, the only choice is to let the more impaired water bypass the facility and switch to Loch Lomond as a source of supply. 
So that's a, I mean, it's great that Block Loman wasn't impacted by uh, the fire. And uh, it's good to know that we have a good source of supply there. But we also have a major uh, construction project going on in, uh, at the dam and in Loch Lomond right now. Dredging is going on. I think you've seen some pictures in the weekly report. And so, you know, it's a little bit of a juggling act to make sure that Loch Lomond, is assuring that it's going to be available when we need it. Um, and it certainly is high on our priority to manage that construction project to ensure that it would be available. Um, additional actions on related to water treatment have focused on improving our ability to deal with significantly greater production of solids when treating high, higher turbidity water, uh, working to minimize the potential of forming higher levels of disinfection byproducts and wa water with higher loads of organic carbon, and optimizing every aspect of the treatment process we can to make sure that it's working as best we can. Um, additional actions related to critical infrastructure, switching, you know, I mean, the reality of our situation is to switch sources from the San Lorenzo River to Loch Lomond, no creek pipeline has to be available and functional. We've had a lot of historic history of breaks on that line, um, and, and that's a concern that we wouldn't have access because the pipeline would be out of service. And in addition, because pump station, Tate Wells, Belt's groundwater resources also must be available and functional. And we know that we have an, an issue going on at Belt's water treatment plant right now that has that we're working on, but it's, it's a major, you know, again, a juggling act to keep everything in, uh, in operation. Um, the steps we've been taking and we're planning, inspecting and addressing all the culverts and drainage dishes that could impact system um, facilities, organizing ongoing inspections once rain begins. Uh, this is a drainage ditches that, that get filled up or you know, a lot of debris comes in, for example, can do the exact same thing to a pipeline that we're talking about, uh, having concerns about, about the Highway 1 bridge. That, that material can build up, it gets a lot of momentum behind it, and it takes a pipeline out. So managing the drainage ditches and culverts in our system and the, some of our remote area pipelines is really an important um, activity. We've, uh, we've worked with the Soquel Creek Water District to make sure that O'Neill Ranch uh, intertie is in place so that we can get water from them if we need to. Um, we've ensured that the Tate Wells, which are across the river from the Coast Pump Station, can be operated when the San Lorenzo River intake is offline. We did that in 2017. It was a godsend, and it was really an effective thing to be able to get some water into the system there, even though we couldn't get the river. Uh, organized issues to address the Belts Water Treatment Plant issue. So we've, we've got a team out there working on uh, taking care of one of the filters that's not been working well. Um, ordered and received a good inventory of spare parts for use in transmission pipeline repairs for Newell Creek and North Coast Pipeline. So having the right stuff on hand or most of the right stuff on hand is really important. And then finally, we've located and opened a purchase order with a backup welder in case our usual magic man welder isn't available when we need him. So making sure that we have that capability is really important. Um, the financial impacts of what we've been doing, the source water quality and sediment um, sampling is $150,000. It could be that if we don't have an issue that we can scale that back down the road, but we've funded it up front to make sure that we do have the um, capability of keeping going if we're seeing uh, impacts on water quality that we need to continue monitoring. We've uh, established a, a make, working to get an aeration system in the wash water tank. This helps us to volatilize organic carbon disinfection byproduct issues. And it's about 100,000, and so we're trying to get that in place to help us minimize the effects of um, any higher uh, organic carbon levels in our system from creating disinfection byproducts uh, that get distributed out to our customers. And then um, we're looking at the additional soil uh, solids handling capacity, and we don't know the financial impact of that, but we're still evaluating that. Um, and the bad news that FEMA reimbursement for these costs is unlikely at this point. So we're looking at 
at least a quarter of a million, probably, you know, more like uh, $350,000 or so that would be absorbed into uh, probably emergency uh, fund costs at this point. Um, and with that, I can take your questions. All right, thank you, Rosemary, for that, that great presentation on all the work that you all are doing. Um, are there any questions from council members? Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, um, thank you, Rosemary, for that report. Um, pretty sobering. Um, I was just curious about whether or not we should do any outreach with regards to sort of reminding people to have their sort of, you know, emergency kit ready with, you know, some water. Um, you know, especially water. I mean, do you see any need for just kind of that general kind of winter preparedness kind of thing, or feel like the system's going to be functional to to serve? Well, I would say two things. One is, uh, you know, preparation is always a good idea. So I think that that's a wise thing to do as we go into any kind of winter situation. I guess what I would say with respect to the um, to the system operation. You know, the, the water treatment operators and the people who work in production, the maintenance staff, they do a fabulous job. They, they, they pull the rabbit out of the hat every single time. And, and I know that they will, you know, give it their all to make sure that we're in, a, in the best position we can be to uh, produce and deliver water. One of the things that we do when we get into these kinds of situations is we keep our distribution storage full so that we have a little bit of a, a cushion there to draw down on distribution storage. It gives us usually a day or maybe two days of, you know, a little bit of grace if we're not producing the full production. Like we have a pipeline break, uh, you know, we can we can get emergency contractors in or our staff in, depending on what it is, and can get it repaired often in a you know 24, 36, 72 hour kind of time frame. Um, so the distribution storage is a little bit of a buffer, and the staff are really keeping that topped up. So uh, you know, if, if it gets bad, we will definitely be uh, letting people know and giving people a heads up and we'll have to write it out when it happens. Yeah, thank you. All right, are there <clears throat> any other questions from council members? Okay, seeing none, um, well, I just wanna thank you again, Rosemary, and your staff for everything that you all are doing to try to ensure that we have you know, clean, safe drinking water. I know that you all are working really hard, you know, under normal circumstances, and now with the impacts of the fire, I'm sure that um, you all are doing yeah. the best you can. So we appreciate it. So just one thing I forgot to say, we are going to be posting up on the website uh, probably by the end of the week uh, uh, information about the water quality issues in particular, the additional monitoring we're doing, the the um, you know the steps we're taking. So we're we're trying to get that information out in the event that people have questions. But if people do have questions, they should definitely call us. Okay, thank you, uh, Councilmember Matthews. It is really reassuring to know the amount of um, anticipation, <laughs> trying to envision everything that comes to go wrong prepare for it and um, that I think is reassuring to us and certainly to the public so to the extent that you can share some amount of this um, it, it increases the comfort level about what my yeah. thank you Councilmember Golder I guess I just have one final thank you and comment to both um, the public works the fire department and um, water department and all of the careful preparations they did mm -hmm. during the fire when we were like vastly understaffed and they were out there um, protecting all of these assets that we have, um, you know, and that was just, it was so amazing to see when we got to go tour the, um, the damage and I just can't thank everybody that participated in that enough and thank you for your leadership on that. Thank you. All right, I'll turn it back over to the city manager to see if there's any other comments. Uh, no, no, that, that's, that's all we have uh, prepared for you today. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the next item on our agenda is uh,
the council meeting calendar, so I'd like to ask the clerk uh, to provide any updates to the calendar. There are no updates. Okay. Uh, next item is council memberships in city groups and outside agencies, and so this is an opportunity for council members to report out on any actions at external boards, committees, joint power authority meetings, um, and so I'd like to see if there's any council members who wanted to report out on items um, since the last time we had a report. Uh, council Member Matthews. Very quick one. The um, Metro Transit, as I'm sure you all know, has um, uh, seen a real drop in ridership, and they have been working, we've reported on this previously, really diligent um, uh, efforts to improve, um, to protect safety of both the drivers and the customers. They did uh, some polling to see what does it take to get people back on the public transit. Um, obviously, the cut in student riders is the big thing, but their regular riders said the main thing they wanted was to be reassured of the safety. So that's been a big push in terms of the marketing. You maybe have seen the, the posters on the sides of the buses. So um, it's not just marketing, it's real, but um, that seen as the first step in uh, helping to rebuild the ridership. Um, and also, they, I think um, probably we got notice that the um, um, bus passes for uh, downtown workers, uh, that has been renegotiated successfully with Metro. So that's, that's a good path of uh, progress and continuing that. With the Downtown Management Corporation, um, the property assessment group that funds the hospitality program, um, Zach Davis um, turned out on the board, so Ian McRae, or Poulos, was added to the board as one of the business representatives. And um, uh, they are in the process, um, the hospitality process is in the process of transitioning to a national uh, company that runs similar programs called Block by Block. And so um, that transition is happening right now. Um, um, and that, that's going well. And then finally, with Visit Santa Cruz, I think, um, I hope you all get the Visit Santa Cruz uh, newsletter that comes out. They are trying to work very conscientiously with um, the county health department, the state health directive, um, to um, send the message of travel safely. And um, they're engaging the industry very actively in that. Um, and of course, that's, that's part of the, um, the challenge between um, opening up and being safe. But I think the, our local uh, visit Santa Cruz County is being extremely conscientious as is the state organization in trying to adhere those guidelines. Thank you very much for that update. Uh, Council Member Golder. Um, I am just reporting that we met um, as a public safety committee and we went over the independent police auditor's um, report and I'm not exactly sure what is um, available or allowed to report out about specifics so maybe somebody else can help me that's on the call. Um, but we talked about, Martine, maybe you can. Yeah, sure. So the, uh, the, the committee will prepare a, a written report that the, then, then will be uh, presented to the city council. So that, that's forthcoming. Thank you. Yeah, so it was a closed session. So thank you. Martine, can I, can I ask a quick follow-up question? Is that going to come to us at the next meeting, or when is that expected to come to council? Uh, typically, as I recall, and I think maybe if Laura's on, he, she can help me with this, uh, we just do a written report that's distributed to the city council. It's not an, an agenda item. Uh, it's just been a, a kind of an, a report of the committee does, of uh, the cases are reviewed and an overview. So it's more informational in nature. Laura, I think you're, you're muted. Thank you, sorry about that. Um, just confirming what Martine said, that is usually what we do. Okay, thank you. Council Member Gold, did you have any other comment, any other report outs? Okay, 
Uh, Council Member Watkins. Um, I just will read, I was, I'm also on the Public Safety Committee and I appreciate Council Member Goldberg sharing what she can and we can in regards to our meeting. Um, and as was mentioned, there will be more information forthcoming to the full council. Uh, the, I have just sort of two additional report outs. One is that um, the farmer's market is open. It's got limited hours. And, uh, you know, if you can and you do regularly go to the farmer's market, please do wear your mask. And they're um, experiencing a, a, a small group of individuals who don't want to wear your ma wear their mask. So please practice public safety uh, protocol while uh, getting your refreshed produce and other local items. Um, and then the other is that we met as a, a city and city schools committee and just really want to share our appreciation for the council and the committee and the uh, ongoing collaboration we have with our city schools to support one another and share and leverage resources. And one exciting development was that we anticipate approximately 150000 in the children's fund. And right now those dollars are actually being used to help some of our city employees with um, scholarships for childcare and just really want to applaud our parks and rec department and those who are really just mobilizing right now to support uh, youth that are trying to navigate virtual learning and what that means for city employees and um, really a great model to uh, look at expansion as needed for those who are working and needing childcare and really exciting that we have this resource to support um, families right now. So that was, a, that was something I'd also like to share. And that's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Brown. Thank you. Uh, so I'll just report on one of the commissions I'm on. Uh, the RTC is right now um, has, has put up online uh, ongoing public open house on for milestone three of the transit corridor alternatives analysis. Um, and this is for uh, uses of the uh, future uses of the rail line. And so they are inviting uh, public comments through November 27th. Um, uh, and um, there will be a couple of opportunities to hear from and talk with the transit corridor analysis, uh, alternatives analysis team, which are, is made up of members of the commission. Um, and those will, there will be live chat on Thursday, this Thursday, the 12th, from 12 to 1.30, and when, next Wednesday, November 18th, from 6 to 7.30 p.m., you can find out uh, more about how to access those uh, through the sccrtc.org website. And uh, please weigh in on uh, the analysis that's being done about uh, how to best use our, our rail corridor, rail trail corridor. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, I had a, a couple. Um, last week there was a subgroup of the Climate Action Task Force that met to discuss uh, outreach planning for the 2030 Climate Action Plan, and so this was really trying to identify and discuss priorities and objectives for the community outreach plan. Um, at the last LAFCO meeting, uh, one of the major things that happened is that we voted to approve the consolidation of Central and the Aptos La Selva Fire Protection Districts. So that's been something that's been ongoing and is a pretty big deal. And then um, finally, just to give a brief update on the um, homeless two by two, um, we have been meeting uh, pretty frequently recently discussing uh, one of the big discussions that we've been having has really been around the Benchlands and the camp that's there. Um, just to give some background, um, this, the camp that was, that's been managed by the county, um, back in July there were about 98 residents that were in that encampment and over the, over the past few months we've seen 37 exits from that program. And it's been for a variety of different reasons. Some uh, took the homeward bound um, vouchers, some went into substance abuse treatment. Uh, we had some people who went on to other shelters. Um, then some others left willingly um, without kind of indicating why they were leaving. Um, and then there were some people who had to be ejected. But um, currently the population in that camp um, is roughly around 61 people and at the moment I'm sure that many of you have heard but there has been a decision to try to shift and move um, create more space up at the uh, armory 
Um, and so we're hoping to move some of the people that are currently in that uh, the managed encampment up to the armory, and, but we're also exploring other options as well in the city. So those are some updates from the almost two by two committee, and we're going to receive a presentation this afternoon on or around, well, with some flexibility, but later in the afternoon um, from the, um, well, largely related to the county's three-year um, homeless plan. So I'm sure there'll be many options to ask more questions at that time. And those are all the updates that I have. And I don't know if, uh, Vice Mayor Myers, if there's anything that I maybe missed from the updates from the homeless two by two meetings. Yeah, I, I think I'll just add a little bit on that. Um, and I, um, Councilmember Watkins covered the uh, school school meeting, so that was great. Um, the other, I guess, the other thing just for the public is that the county will be presenting um, the three-year strategic plan that's developed at, I think it's 5 p.m. now today at, in, in, in front of city council, we hope. Um, it'll be a short presentation. There was a full presentation today at the Board of Supervisors, which of course I'm sure will be on tape. Um, this is the county's effort to sort of um, restructure and revamp the, the homeless sort of service uh, approach for the county. It's um, a lot of work in progress they've been working on over the last two years. Uh, the staff, despite all the fires and um, COVID and all the other uh, things that they had to deal with this summer, um, diligently worked to get this report out. They are doing a uh, broad presentation of the materials. They're gonna be visiting each city council in the next two weeks to present the materials. As I said, they presented the materials this morning at the Board of Supervisors meeting. They'll also be doing some out public outreach um, and I believe some um, sort of town hall type of things. Um, and the information will be available on the county website. And uh, I would just uh, encourage any anyone in the public who wants to understand and see the changes and the directions that some of the um, homeless services will be taking in the next couple of years, um, this would be a great way to check in and, and understand where things are moving. Uh, the county has also hired a new homeless director um, and that uh, individual will be starting uh, here in Santa Cruz County, I believe in, I think it's December 1st. So a lot of really interesting things going on with the county uh, with regards to some of their um, focus on revamping and looking at uh, best management practices for designing um, homeless services for Santa Cruz County. And so please take a look and also council members, please take a look in those uh, at their materials on the county website. I think it's um, an important issue as we all know and um, glad to see their work has um, concluded in this report that we'll hear about later today. And then I did have um, one more quick announcement. Um, the Resilient Coast Virtual Workshop is gonna be held on November 17th. And if people are interested and want to register, they can uh, go to cityofsantacruz.com slash resilient coast. Okay, so that, I think if there's no further questions or comments from council member, we'll conclude that item. And so um, we'll move on to our consent agenda. So these are items numbers 10 through 24 on our agenda. And so if there's members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call in using the numbers on your screen if you'd like to comment on items numbers 10 through 24. Um, please remember that after you've called in to, to press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and listen for the cue saying that you've been unmuted. Um, once you've been unmuted, you'll be given two minutes to speak. And um, with that, um, all items on our consent agenda will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for discussion. And so with that, I'd like to open it up to see if there's any council members who would like to pull or had questions on items on our agenda. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers. I just have a comment on item 16, and I just have questions on item 18 on some of the um, budget overruns. But I don't feel the need to pull the pull the item. I just have questions for staff. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Matthews. Yes, as I communicated with you, um, I do have um, 
minor edit for um, the action, the minutes of number tw number 12, our study session, our special meeting on October 29th. And um, they're, they're really kind of minor, just fleshing out some of the concluding council comments. I, I sent them to the mayor. I'm happy to present them. I don't think it needs to be pulled. It, it was really trying to just um, fill out the, the thoughtful comments that people made at the very end. So however you want to handle that. Maybe, um, maybe let's, let's, yeah, if we can just show them. Yeah. So this, this is the very end of the minute for that meeting, um, the interim recovery plan. And um, you can just see, I just amplified the bullet points a little bit, being honest about the challenges, confidence in the future rebuilding together, engaging business groups and sectors, labor, contractors, and workforce development, reaching out to civic organizations, community groups, and nonprofit partners, outreach to youth, stressing commitment to economic recovery and job creation, celebrating successes and sharing examples of survival and recovery, emphasizing a holistic collaborative approach. I tried to just capture the, the sense of the group comments there. So I would just suggest those as a, a, an edit to the meeting. Um, maybe I'll ask the city attorney, what would be the best way to incorporate these? Would, would it be best to pull the item and then, or should we just move the consent item with um, the inclusion of these comments into the, into, um, the minutes? I think it's fine to take action on the consent calendar with these incorporated into the minutes. Member Brown. Yeah, I just, I too want to make a comment on item 16 and also on item 17, just really briefly. And it sounds like 18, um, some of the, it, there are questions, so I'll just wait to hear what those are. Okay. I, thanks. Great. And then it sounds like we might, have, I have questions on item number 18, and it sounds like we might have. The same question, so maybe what we'll do, um, let's go ahead and start with item number 16, and I'll go to uh, Vice Mayor Myers for your, your comments on item number 16, and then Council Member Brown. Um, my comment is just that uh, I just was uh, excited to see the application, the grant application. This item is a grant application to the Ocean Protection Council to support our resilient coast um, pro program that has been under development for the last two years um, through our climate uh, manager, Tiffany Weiss, Weiss West. Um, I'm excited to see that we're working with um, Point Blue Conservation, um, excellent organization here in the state of California that does really innovative um, climate resiliency and adaptation um, restoration work. Um, and so just wanted to just um, point, kind of point out this great work. Um, I think it's super important work that we do as a community uh, in recognizing, especially with the year that we've had with both COVID and the um, fires that uh, climate type issues are here to stay. And I'm just excited to see Ms. Weiss-West moving, moving this project forward. I've been lucky to be on the technical advisory committee and I'm just really pleased to see that she's uh, continuing just uh, work on getting these kinds of projects and programs up and running for the city of Santa Cruz. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Council Member Brown, you also had uh, comments on item number 16. Yeah, I would just echo those comments and want to thank um, Dr. Wise West for all of your tireless efforts. Um, and no, I think, you know, I, I just want to highlight that I, I feel like this is not only, a, you know, an opportunity to bolster our efforts around the Resilient Coast Program and our climate action, uh, broader climate ac action efforts, but also really a stride towards um, using uh, an environmental justice lens, really, uh, in how we look at and address issues facing our, our coastal uh, neighborhoods, um, and really uh, looking at um, focusing on engaging the um, beach flats and lower ocean communities that will, are likely to be hit hardest by um, uh, sea level rise. So um, I, I'm really glad to see this happening, and I thank you for all of you. Um, 
I'll just say ditto to those comments by my, my colleagues. And then with that, let's move on to um, Council Member Brown. You had some comments on item number 17. Yeah, thank you. Um, again, this is, I want, just want to highlight um, this item is uh, regarding uh, sending a letter to the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, um, related to their proposal to change the flight path into San Francisco uh, International Airport. And um, we have been involved in this uh, roundtable for a long time, and Councilmember Matthews has been hanging in there with that effort, and I've been outspoken as well on um, my concerns and opposition to the change. Um, uh, so I'm just really glad to see this um, element also being uh, uh, highlighted here and, and um, acknowledged. And I, I just think that um, I want to appreciate the mayor, uh, Mayor Cummings, for uh, maintaining that communication and you know collaboration with the Amamutsun Tribal Band and Val, Valentin Lopez. Um, I think this is just a really great example of how kind of keeping those channels of communication open uh, with our community partners uh, really, really is important. And, um, you know, uh, uh, just, you know, an ability to respond to those concerns to the best of our ability from, you know, the, the powers that we have. So thank you um, for moving that ahead. Council Member Matthews. Oh, you're muted, by the way. Um, mentioning briefly, we are no longer paying into the um, roundtable effort that's part of our budget cut, but um, nor is the county, but we are still uh, collaborating actively with the county's tracking of this. And um, this action also includes writing a letter not only to the FAA, but also to our federal representative, um, making sure that um, he's speaking up for us as well. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, I just wanted to um, also recognize that actually um, Supervisor Ryan Cooterney's office did reach out to the city mm -hmm. regarding this, right. and so I just want to recognize his leadership. Uh, he contacted Council Members Matthews and I and the mayor, and so I do want to recognize that actually his his action really was um, uh, important in letting us know about uh, this this necessary communication. Yep, I was. I was going to mention that as well. So, just like to recognize and thank their office for reaching out to us and for us all being able to work hard on this effort to hopefully keep what could be a noisy flight pattern from going over the city of Santa Cruz. Okay, so with that, um, let's move on to item number 18, and I'll go ahead and let's start with Vice Mayor Myers, and then Councilmember Brown, and then myself. Yeah, I just had a question uh, for staff regarding the um, the overruns, um, and I'm not sure maybe Mr. Kandati would 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 have specifics regarding the attorney overrun. And then I had a question for the uh, for Chief Hydrick whether or not the overtime um, that was noted in the 200 I can't remember offhand over 200,000. Um, are any of those uh, costs, um, Chief Hydrick, uh, are they available for reimbursement from any of the FEMA funds, or is this, you know, I know there's some kind of payback type of situation where our, our, our staff are responding to other fires, so I'm just wondering if that's the situation. Yeah, yeah it's actually a twofold thing. Uh, one, we've reduced the number of bodies that we have on staff as far as part of the budget reductions, and we still have, <clears throat> excuse me, a minimum staffing requirement, and we've had some injuries and illnesses. Um, so part of, part of it is that. The other part has been the statewide OES response, similar to what we saw here with the CZU fires, where we had people from New Jersey. Um, we've been heavily involved in the state, and there's a lag time from when we extend that money, um, submit for reimbursement, capture the reimbursement, and then also on the financial end, reconcile the coding that was done so that they can transfer those funds from um, the operations into the uh, OES reimbursement. So it, it's a twofold thing. But significant chunk of that, if not all of it, um, for that amount will be reimbursed uh, through the state um, plus an administrative fee. Thank you. 
Okay, great, thank you. And um, Mr. Kandati, I just, um, I, I would imagine COVID probably has, um, is related to some of the overrun, but with just the budget budget cuts that we've been doing, this, I'm just curious if you could comment on the overrun and uh, yeah. a little detail regarding them. Um, so so for the public, there's an overrun of about 400,000 in the attorney's office, city attorney's office. Yeah, I'm happy to comment on that. Uh, yes. Um, First of all, as you know, um, the fire truck is about to go by and you probably won't be able to hear me, but just <laughs> bear with me a second. Um, yes, back in 2017, uh, we worked with the finance department to start breaking down our accounting for time by department. And, and the purpose was to provide uh, information on, on this very topic. And, and unlike some of the other departments, we were not able to, say, assign a certain cost to the city on a given month because we have to respond to the legal uh, services that the city asks for. And so it's hard for us to, to gauge what, you know, to what extent the budget is going to be accurate in terms of the actual legal services that you receive. This year, um, the, the highest single category of legal services was uh, assigned to the city council. The other big uh, expenses were uh, COVID-19, absolutely. Uh, work with the city manager's office and the city clerk. Um, uh, interestingly, the water department, because the water department has been in the process of implementing very aggressive capital improvements program and our office has devoted an unusual, you know, in terms of what's typical in a year, uh, an unusual uh, level of legal resources have been devoted to the water department. And we have that all breaking down, broken down by cost um, that I could share. Thank you, Tony. Um, I was just curious, uh, maybe for our finance director or city manager, with regards to the COVID-19 costs, um, and I would imagine all the resolutions, emergency, re I mean, is there any cost recovery that's available at all for any of those types of activities? I'll just quickly start and then uh, Kim uh, can uh, add to this. But we are keeping track of all of our COVID-related expenses. Uh, we have uh, specific forms for that um, so that we can attempt to get reimbursed for as much as we can. So I think, I think we will uh, attempt to do that. I don't know if you, Kim, you wanna add more? Yes, we, uh, we have been working on a FEMA claim for COVID. So it's, it's been a massive project, copying all the invoices and getting all the timesheets and the, the 214 forms that track what people did. So, but we are working on it. Thank you. Yeah, I just think it's important for the public with the, the recent budget cuts that we've had to do to, to understand sort of some of the recovery uh, capabilities we have with some of the funds. And those are all my questions. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, staff. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so if there's no further questions or comments, I'm gonna go ahead and open it up to public comment. So if there's any members of the public who would like to speak to us on this item, uh, please use the information on your screen to call in if you haven't already. Once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when you've been recognized, you'll be given two minutes to speak on items numbers 10 through 24 on our agenda. Yeah, hi, this is Garrett Phillip. On number 17, the FAA balances literally hundreds of complaints concerning hundreds of thousands of people about flight path noise to arrive at a compromised plan to maximize the general good of all. If not in my backyard complaints were analyzed objectively, jets flying at 10,000 to 20,000 feet as they now are over Capitola have far less validity than ones from cities near the airport that fly at much lower altitudes with noisier aircraft maneuvers. From the west side, I can't hear the jets that fly over Capitola at all, and compared to leaf blowers, gas-powered landscape tools, wood chippers, emergency response sirens, low-flying small planes, 
you know, lots of stuff uh, as an issue. Objectively, it's far at the bottom of the noise list. The Coast Dairy's National Monument is federal land is being developed for public recreational use by all people. The Amamutsen seem to think the outside world should not be allowed to exist or be evidence in even the faintest way so they can have occasional secret, totally quiet ceremonies on this federal land, which was already dedicated to public mutual recreational enjoyment. May I suggest earplugs? The FAA can accept inputs from anyone in the flight plan evaluation process. Why the mayor has apparently been appointed secretary for the Amarutsen as the go-to letter writer and perpetual cheerleader, multi-centuries uh, ago historical reminder-in-chief that we live on the unceded land, blah, blah, is unclear. Don't they have the email? I also see no need for the FAA to consult them if they made their own views known by their own correspondence just like everybody else does. You must realize that when the mayor writes a letter, it is coming from him and should represent all the citizens of Santa Cruz. I'd guess that 65,000 citizens on balance would choose to have the flight path over Davenport and the coast areas rather than Santa Cruz if that were the choice, rather than protect occasional secret quiet meetings of the Alamutsa instead. The FEA's goal is to reduce the hundreds of complaints, and all of those complaints are then balanced by them. The Amamutsen are free to personally communicate without the mayor's apparent single-minded special interest endorsement. I could guess council opposition to this might be negligible because of mistaken sense that costs them nothing to go along and generally don't want jets to fly over Santa Cruz, but no such a letter is solely advocating privilege to a special interest of a small number of people where actually a more even, I'd say, honest representational one should exist. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Um, are there any other members of the public who would like to comment on items that are on our consent agenda? If so, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you'll be given two minutes. Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back to council for action and deliberation. Council Member Matthews. Thanks. I will go ahead and move the consent agenda items 10 to 24, incorporating the minor edits uh, submitted to the city clerk for number 12. Okay, I'll go ahead and second the consent. Um, are there any further questions or comments from council members? Okay, seeing none, I'll turn it over to the clerk to call the roll call vote. Council Member Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkin? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Um, I, got a, I have a question uh, regarding the schedule. So um, we're, we're a bit uh, ahead of schedule, and I want to just um, get a sense from the city attorney and maybe from my colleagues as well. So we have a time certain item at 1.30, uh, which is the Hans Christian Anderson presentation. And, um, and maybe the city manager can also comment on this, but I'm wondering if we might want to hear, um, we can take a break till noon and then if we may want to shift the um, items numbers 26 and 27, which I don't think there's a, we've received a lot of comment on, and, um, and then here the item 25 after the presentation that we're supposed to have um, at 1.30. I think there's gonna be a, a lot more discussion about item number 25 and just wanna ensure that mm -hmm. we're not gonna disrupt that item um, for the presentation and then have to come back because we do have time certain at 1.30. And so I'm just wondering. No problem with that from a legal perspective. Okay. No, that should be a problem. No. Okay. And so I'm just wondering if my what my colleagues are sensing or feeling, if they have any comments on that change. Yeah. Sounds, yeah. sounds good. Okay. Council Member like Matthews. Could you just go over it again? And I assume somewhere in there there's a, a quick lunch break. Yeah, so we could take a break um, right now, maybe, and reconvene around. 12.15 if we want to take a little bit of a longer break, and then we would hear items numbers 26, 27, and then we would have a, uh, a hard stop at 1.30 to do the presentation on uh, Hans Christian Anderson and Sister Levante, and then we'd come back to item number 25 after those presentations. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So a little bit of a longer break right now. Yeah. 
Okay. So why don't we go ahead and we'll take a break and reconvene. Take about 20 minutes and reconvene okay. around uh, 12:15. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's just let's go ahead and get started. Um, we are going to make a little shift just so the public and staff are aware. We're going to shift things around a little bit because we have a hard stop at 1.30. And so we're going to move um, item number 25 until after our 1.30 presentation. And let's go ahead and get started with item number 26, which is uh, urban forestry and wildland urban interface poly policy. And for that, I'll turn it over to Travis Beck, superintendent of parks. Travis, I think you're muted. Thank you. Is this better? Yes. All right. Uh, so, hello, Mayor Cummings, Vice Mayor Myers, uh, members of the council. I'm joined here today by our fire chief, Jason Hyduke, um, Parks and Recreation Director, Tony Elliott, and uh, Division Chief and Fire Marshal, Rob Odie and our urban forester, Leslie Keedy, may uh, be available for questions uh, at the end of this item. So uh, our whole team has worked together to uh, develop a um, new update to the urban forest and wildland urban interface policy. And uh, with that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to our uh, fire staff to begin the presentation. And uh, Bonnie, if you can cue that up for us, that would be wonderful. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, Mayor Cummings, uh, City Council, Jason Hyduke, Fire Chief. And today we're gonna talk about our urban forest and wildland urban interface uh, policy updates. This has been something that we've been working on for a number of years now, and I think the events of this summer really just highlighted the importance of doing proactive uh, vegetation management uh, versus just reactive uh, suppression response, which we will continue to do, but we really want to uh, view this in a holistic manner and give our entire community uh, the best chance possible of suffering a catastrophic uh, wildland event. Bon, if you can advance to the next slide. So uh, similar to uh, what I showed you uh, before as far as the footprint of the CZU fire, the area shaded in red uh, is that footprint. Um, and this is taken from the CAL FIRE damage assessment map. And each one of those houses represents a, a home that was damaged or a structure that was damaged. And as you can see that um, this is pretty widespread. Um, this crossed two counties. Uh, luckily it did not come into the city proper. However, it came very close to it. Um, and the goal of our vegetation management and updating the heritage tree ordinance is really to try and prevent this type of a catastrophic consequence. We obviously can't prevent every fire from starting. This was a naturally occurring fire uh, due to a fairly impressive lightning storm that came through. Um, but our goal with this is not to uh, clear cut. We're not trying to um, you know, remove all vegetation. But later on in this presentation, we'll, we'll show you what some of the consequences are of doing some proactive vegetation management and what the impacts can be. Uh, next slide. So these are just some uh, definitions and uh, you're gonna hear WUI or wildland urban interface and urban forest. Um, and so urban forest is the, the sum of the woody and associated vegetation uh, that comprises houses, streets, roads, uh, commercial areas such as malls. Uh, it includes the street trees and residential trees um, and vacant properties within the zone. And really what this is, this could be considered our downtown area. This would be along Pacific Avenue. This would be in the Seabright neighborhood. Um, this would be the urban forest where we have a shaded canopy along our, our sidewalks. Um, but really they're not connected to what we consider to be our wildland urban interface. And that's that area where uh, you start seeing a clear delineation between where neighborhoods are, structures are, and then a large interconnected uh, continuous uh, wildland, um, wh whether it's a forest or brush or grass. 
and it's generally not maintained to the same criteria or specifications. It is, by definition, a wildland area. And so um, what we want to do is um, talk about some of the steps that we can take within these areas that give the best chance of the wildland surviving a fire, as well as preventing those impacts so that we don't lose um, a thousand structures where people live um, and all the memories that are associated with that. Next slide. So this is a map of the city of Santa Cruz and what you're looking at, um, the shaded gray areas um, are, if you look down toward the wharf, that would be our urban forest. The areas that are highlighted inside of green, uh, the, the outer edge, if you go to uh, the north and uh, to, to the uh, east and west, um, those are our boundaries outside of city limits. But this is really where we have a large continuous fuel source or wildland area that abuts up against our neighborhoods, like in La Viega, in Poganip, Moore Creek. And so for the city of Santa Cruz, this is what we consider to be our wildland urban interface. And this is where we have a large fuel source of wildland space that butts right up against neighborhoods or commercial buildings. The blue squares are uh, individual tiles that have greater detail, but this is the overview map. Um, and so when we're talking about our wildland urban interface, this is the specific area that we're talking about um, for uh, the changes in the heritage tree and also the vegetation management that we need to do in response to catastrophic wildfires as well as changes to the adopted fire code. Next slide. So um, I'm gonna turn this uh, over to uh, uh, Rob Odie and also to uh, Travis Beck. Unfortunately, with the time change for this presentation, Leslie Keedy, who is our urban forester, is not available right now. However, she is available uh, for any questions that you may have um, uh, following this up. So I'm gonna turn this section over to uh, Rob Odie to uh, talk about the Santa Cruz fire code changes, and then uh, the next two slides, uh, Travis uh, will, will speak to from a Parks and Rec uh, perspective. Hello, Council, thank you for your time. Um, yeah, just some historical background on the fire code. Um, typically, uh, the uh, California fire code um, is changed and adopted uh, by municipalities or jurisdictions every three years. This last code cycle, uh, the city, the council adopted the 2019 fire code changes. And with that, we also adopted uh, what we call chapter 49, which pertains specifically to that wildland urban interface. Um, specifically in this very short chapter, it addresses two things, one of which being uh, building materials that uh, homes or structures in these wooly areas, uh, what sort of materials they can use, whether it's new construction or a remodel, and then uh, specifically pertaining to our conversation today, it talks about vegetation management and uh, defensible space in these areas. And with that adoption in 2019, it obviously had a trickle down into our municipal code, chapter 1905.100. Uh, and what it specifically um, addresses is vegetation management and it sort of mirrors some of the language uh, that is uh, contained within chapter 49 of the fire code. Um, specifically in our muni code, it discusses having a defensible space around structures up to uh, 30 feet. And again, this includes uh, branches or trees, uh, overhanging decks, uh, chimneys, uh, the structure itself, as well as spacing um, trees, depending on slope um, adjacent to the structure so that we don't have the spread from the, from the ground of a fire up into the trees, and what we, we call that ladder fuels, um, where the, basically the fire climbs that ladder. So what we're trying to achieve with this adoption is um, those homes within the, the wildland urban interface to um, pay attention to those ladder fuels and the foliage around their homes um, and what changes they can make, um, whether it's, again, just trimming things up um, or um, as they decide to plant things, keeping in mind spacing um, and then proximity to the home. Uh, next slide. So an important, thanks, uh, Rob. An important aspect of our urban tree policy is the heritage tree protection, which is uh, in the Santa Cruz Municipal Code Chapter 9.56, which basically protects uh, trees that are 14 inches in diameter or larger or have special status from alteration or removal unless specific criteria have been met. And those criteria are spelled out in 
uh, a separate city council resolution, and uh, it includes a number of factors. Most uh, relevant today is that trees may be removed when they meet the findings of the urban forest and wildland interface policy statement. So that's the uh, statement that we're here to discuss today. So this uh, statement really deals with the areas of the urban forest that are also within this WUI, the Wildland Urban Interface. And it's intended to help us have good coordination among our policy goals um, in that overlapping area. And this uh, statement that we are working on was last updated in 1992. So with the uh, changes in the California Fire Code and those uh, becoming part of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code, uh, it's high time for us to reconsider the Wildland and Urban Interface Policy Statement. Next slide, please. Um, so um, again, like uh, Travis mentioned, we, we made some updates and changes to this policy. Um, specifically, uh, the, well, some of the first things that you'll notice as you review the red line copy is we changed some of the, uh, the terminology. The old uh, document referred to Wildland Interface whereas in the Muni Code and in uh, the California Fire Code, it's actually referenced specifically as Wildland Urban Interface, so we made those changes, as well as adding specific references to the Fire Code and to the, um, our new updated uh, Municipal Code as it pertains to vegetation. Um, next slide. So those changes, again, to the Municipal Code, the update when we adopted Chapter 49 of the California Fire Code, uh, like I talked about, it, it speaks to the distance that we want to maintain a defensible space around a home. So as you can see, a fire break shall be made by removing or clearing away of a distance not less than 30 feet on every side of the building, uh, the structure or property line, whichever is near. And this, what we want to do is remove all the flammable vegetation, whether it's shrubbery, uh, dead or disease growth, um, that become combustible. Um, in addition, fire protection zone or fire break may be made by removing all brush, flammable vegetation, or combustible growth that is located within 100 feet. So for those uh, that have property lines that extend beyond that 30 feet, the code and the, the fire code and the municipal code uh, speak to um, those properties that we want to, again, address spacing, ladder fuels, um, and then again, controlling the um, combustible growth on the ground. Um, it's important to note that this does not apply to single specimens of trees or other vegetation that is well pruned, maintained uh, as to effectively manage fuels and not form a means of rapidly transmitting fire from uh, other nearby vegetation to any building or structure. So again, um, we're not trying to target anything specifically, any species. We're just trying to make sure that we take out a link in that chain, so to speak, so that fire does not progress from the ground to a shrub, to a tree, and then to a structure. Um, next slide. Um, here's a sort of a uh, visual representation of those zones. Um, this can be found in the National Fire Protection Association website or, or um, CAL FIRE. They're all sort of very similar. Um, the zeros that you see are the uh, zero to five feet. That's that zone where they recommend that um, you have essentially non-combustible material around the home. They actually recommend not using bark or, um, you know, sort of combustible ground cover, but something similar to like gravel. Um, then from the, zone, from the zero zone, you have the one, and the one is that five to 30 feet, and that's what we speak to specifically in the municipal code, and that's again, living trees up, <clears throat> taking out anything diseased or dead that can be uh, highly combustible, and of course, transmit to a deck or uh, the residence structure itself. And then beyond that, you have zone two, which is that 30 to 100 feet. So if you actually happen to have property that extends beyond, again, you want to be mindful of what you plant, how close you plant them uh, as it pertains to, again, proximity to the home, the slope of your property, and so forth. Um, so that's what we, when we talk about defensible space, again, this is a visual representation of, of what that uh, is. Next slide. And in the theme of defensible space, um, this is a photo um, last year of a, a cleanup that occurred in the Prospect Heights neighborhood. Um, been working with a variety of different neighborhood groups to create what we call FireWise neighborhood groups. Um, these are groups comprised of an area within a wildland urban interface that uh, we try and educate and motivate to uh, 
sort of take the reins, if you will, on cleaning up their property and then sort of motivating um, those in the neighborhood to do the same. So what you see here is I was able to provide um, a yard waste dumpster to these folks and the woman in the blue mask, uh, Abby Young, has been um, a very motivated and um, you know capable uh, assistant in, in this uh, effort. And um, she's helped in organizing other groups as well. But what they're doing is basically following a lot of the recommendations that we find in the California Fire Code and, of course, in our municipal code. So they've been a great partner in keeping their uh, respective neighborhoods safe. Next slide. All right. So um, when we talk about vegetation management, sometimes just looking at a picture uh, doesn't give you a good good example. And, and I've met with groups when uh, they hear vegetation management that we want to clear cut everything. Uh, so I want to show with you uh, some of the examples of what we've done uh, within the city, and then also sh uh, talk about some of the impacts that we experienced with the CZU fire. So the picture that you're looking at right now is uh, part of our vegetation management work that we've been doing in Poganep, and this is along the spring trail. And this is the before picture. And if you go to the next slide, this is a little bit further back on the road, but it's looking at that same set of trees, and they're still there. The difference being is that we've limbed them up. So any fire on the ground won't readily transmit up into the crown, um, and hopefully that fire will uh, burn at less intensity, and so it's less damaging to the trees themselves and to the environment as a whole. So when we're talking about vegetation management, um, we're not looking at removing trees unless we absolutely have to. What we really want to do is maintain those trees in a way that they're still there, they're still present, we like living here, um, but we also want to provide a greater degree of fire safety for everyone. And if you come to the next slide here, this is a picture uh, on Empire Grade, and this is a shaded fuel break project that was done uh, by CAL FIRE uh, over the last few years. And this is uh, directly across from the, crest, um, uh, the Christmas tree farm up on Empire Grade. And uh, the, this is taken about three weeks after the CZU fire. Um, and if you look at this, you saw the forest. Um, but the difference being is that they've limbed up and lollipop those trees. So you have solid trunks. You have a canopy that doesn't extend all the way down to the ground. And um, if you look at this picture, you can see, uh, if you can make out some of the burn marks on the bottom. But if you notice that the upper canopy is still green, and that's because when the fire came through here, because they'd removed uh, the amount of fuel that was actually available to burn, and just as importantly, the arrangement of that fuel, there was much less of an impact. And um, that's important for the trees and the environment, and also decreases the potential for um, debris flows and runoff because there wasn't just that intensity of the fire that um, destroyed everything. If we go to the next slide. And again, this is um, same area, a little bit different perspective. And really, um, what's important to note, note here is that fire burned through here. This was part with, well within the footprint of the CZU fire. And if you look at the, the canopy, you can see the bottom edge has some browning of the leaves, but the majority of that canopy and that tree is still intact. And so it's living, and it's not going to take as long to recover. If we go to the next slide, this is also taken on Empire Grade, and this was in an area where there was no uh, vegetation management. There was no shaded fuel break. And uh, if you look at the trees, there is no canopy. Um, you have uh, trees that were almost completely consumed, uh, both from the ground all the way to the top. And this is an area that's gonna take much longer to recover, and it's at a higher risk for um, debris flow. Um, but the other thing with this, that this picture doesn't show completely is the intensity of the fire here was much greater, uh, which poses a greater risk to um, houses in the area, and it poses a greater risk for people trying to evacuate this area, and it poses a much greater risk to uh, firefighters uh, for suppression efforts. And so shaded fuel breaks, they mitigate a lot of the concerns that we have, and so that's why we want to uh, address that within um, our city ordinance. Um, and I believe a number of the city council uh, members, we took a tour of this, and as if you're driving up past UCSC, you can see areas where we have shaded fuel breaks where no fire reached. Um, and then you get into areas like this where no vegetation management happened, and you can really see the difference um, and the fire intensity and the impact. And so within our wildland urban interface areas here within the city, our goal is to do vegetation management so that we still have vegetation and that we're also really minimizing the risk for uh, a fire event occurring. Um, 
And so if we go to the last slide here, um, we took this to the Parks and Rec Commission um, and they voted six to zero to approve uh, this recommendation. And there was a number of people on there that had questions initially about what vegetation management meant and what protections were in place for the environment. And we took tours of De La Viega, of Poganep, of our levy system, of vegetation management, shaded fuel breaks that we've done. And uh, I believe that they support it both for uh, the impacts for fire, but also for the impacts that happen for those areas when we do vegetation management. Um, again, we're not looking to remove uh, wholesale all trees, all brush, um, but we are looking at being able to um, you know, react in a prudent manner for protecting our community and protecting our wildland uh, as a whole. It's one of the reasons why we live in Santa Cruz. Um, and that concludes um, our presentation. I just got a, a text message from uh, Leslie Keedy. She is available uh, as well as everyone else on this call to answer any questions that you may have regarding this. Great. Thank you all for all the hard work you've done on this and for this presentation. I think that these changes seem like a really great way to manage our forest in a way that helps us preserve our ecosystems and our biodiversity and also allows for you know, low intensity fires that are actually can have benefits to our ecosystem given that where we live is actually a fire adapted ecosystem as well. So thank you all for your hard work. And then I'll just see are there any council members who have questions um, for this, on this item? Councilmember Matthews. Yeah, I'm just wondering to what extent, I mean, obviously you have limited resources to devote to this. So um, how are you prioritizing? Uh, is it neighborhood interest in being part of it? Is it the species like eucalyptus or comforts that are very flammable as opposed to others? Just a quick answer on that. Yeah, so we obviously don't have the staffing, um, you know, within the city. We've got 24,000 structures yeah. or so within the city of Santa Cruz, and we have our identified wildland urban interface areas. And so really this is a set of standards um, that people can maintain on their private property. We can provide that technical expertise. Mm -hmm. We obviously are complaint-driven, incident-driven, and uh, within our open spaces, we've engaged in doing proactive vegetation management. Um, you know, what I said at the Parks and Rec Commission is that we didn't arrive here overnight as far as yeah. where we are for our fire danger. And we're not going to exit this overnight. This is going to be a slow, steady process of telling people uh, how to build houses, how to maintain the houses, and then obviously responding um, as needed with the resources we have within those areas. Um, but this is, this is the beginning of setting our community up for success going forward versus not doing anything. Yeah, just a quick follow-up if I could. It was really interesting. I mean, this, this has been definitely uh, an evolution of this policy for sure. And I noticed the language in the third paragraph changes from human intrusion with vegetation to human intermingling. <laughs> That's a conceptual change. And then um, just a typo on the, on the second page, I think you changed wildland interface to WUI consistently. I just see one place where it wasn't changed, and that's probably just a misstep. So uh, it's, it's right before you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's just okay. Yeah. Yep, Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, I just wanted to um, thank you all for working on this policy update, very important. And um, Rob, I know when I took my tour up with you up into the burn areas, um, you commented a lot on um, you know, the work that you had done to get to really do this readiness work with, with homeowners. And I appreciate your work and the fire council, fire state council's work with getting our neighborhoods ready. Um, I was just curious, um, whether or not there was any, if it's typical or atypical for any focused um, policy on um, certain uh, non-natives, especially like French brooms. So when I, the way I'm reading the policy is that people could take that out under the policy. Um, is there any need to kind of sort of point towards people towards certain types of vegetation that actually you know can help um, by taking out can help uh, kind of alleviate the spread of some of the fires or is that just too complicated for us to kind of 
um, you know, put into a policy. So in other words, I guess my question is, you know, we used to do these big um, French room polls up in the valley. You know, we, you know, work for, for days and days on getting rid of French room. So I'm just curious, um, I see that species here and there. Uh, and there's not a lot of it in our, in our urban forest areas, but I'm just curious if there's any need in the policy to point people towards certain kinds of, um, you know, vegetation that has the propensity to, you know, burn hotter or, or cause issues with regards to fire? Um, I, I think um, Councilmember Myers, I can answer that a little bit and then maybe OD or uh, Kini can uh, jump in. So one thing that's really important to remember is that um, the reason why we don't want to focus on a single species is, and I'll take eucalyptus as an example, even if we removed every eucalyptus tree from the city of Santa Cruz, completely, which would be a you know daunting undertaking. We would still have a, a wildland risk. Um, it wouldn't remove that risk. And so the CZU fire um, really kind of highlights that, um, you know, redwoods are fire adapted. They, they generally don't support fire. And so it, it's more about the weather conditions that are driving that event, the amount of fuel that's actually present, and then the arrangement of it. And so, you know, obviously for a lot of reasons other than fire, looking at non-native species would be something that we could do. But the purpose of this was really to put, um, you know, our, our foot in the door to how we're gonna change going forward. And, and I'd be more than happy to work on looking at single species, but I would really defer to people who are, um, you know, like Leslie Keedy, who have a you know, wealth of knowledge about, you know, what that would entail. Um, but I really wanna highlight the fact that a single species in and of itself is not just the single answer. It is how they're arranged and how much is present. And then weather conditions are the major driver for most of these events. Thanks for those comments. I think, yeah, I think sometimes some neighborhoods can get really fixated. The, the De La Viega neighborhood, obviously, <laughs> fixated on the on the eucalyptus, the Arroyo Seco Canyon, you know, neighbors, folks like that. So it's, I think it's just helpful for people to understand it's a system sort of based approach and uh, not getting too fixated on treating one species of, over the other. Um, I think, and then I just um, wanted to compliment um, the work you guys have done. I've seen pretty much all of it in our um, open space areas, um, just through hiking in, in our parks. Um, I, I just think the work was really well done and um, very respectful of the environmental conditions. And so thanks for doing all that work. Um, very noticeable, so thanks. Thank you. Okay, if there's no other questions at this point in time, uh, we can go ahead and open it up to public comment. So if there are any members of the public who would like to speak to us on item number 26, which is our urban forestry and wildland urban interface policy update, now's the time to call in using the numbers on your screen. Once you've called in, you'll wanna press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And uh, once you've been called upon, you'll be given two minutes to comment on this item. No members of the public who'd like to speak to us on this item, I'll bring it back to council for action and deliberation. So if there's a council member who'd be willing to move the item, I'm happy to second it. Council member Matthews. And Cynthia, you're muted. Happy to move the item um, and especially appreciate all the work that went into this. I'll second that. Um, so if there's no further comments on this item from council members, I'll turn it to our city clerk to call the roll call vote. Thank you, Mayor. Council member Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? <clears throat> Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. And thank you all again for all your hard work and let us know if there's anything we can do moving forward to help. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's move on. We've got about, again, we have a hard stop at 1.30, so um, hopefully we can get through this item 
um, and then we'll have uh, time certain in a presentation at 1.30. Uh, the next item is uh, the resolution promoting medical and scientific collaborations between the city of Santa Cruz and Cuba to address the COVID-19 pandemic. So if there are members of the public who would like to speak to council on this item, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. Um, we'll have a brief um, discussion and uh, then we'll open it up to public comment and bring it back to council for action deliberation. So I guess I'll just start us off. This was an item that came before us back in early October and uh, some council members had expressed some interest in wanting to get more information. The item was supposed to come back to us at the previous meeting in October, but um, kind of flipped uh, under the radar. And so we're bringing this back as part of council direction. And so um, I'll maybe turn it over to some of my colleagues uh, or council member Brown, if you have any other things you wanna add or for any of the council members who um, requested that this come back, if you have anything to, to say, um, maybe now would be a good time. So council member Brown, I'll turn it over to you first. Thanks. Um I don't have, uh, you know, a big uh, set of comments to introduce the item. I know everybody has read it. It's come before us uh, previously. And um, I wanted to thank the, uh, the um, Saving Lives uh, effort for bringing this to us. And I believe we had some communication from their members in support of this. Um, the ordinance is the same uh, ordinance that was presented uh, back in early October, um, and I'm happy to discuss with um, members of the council um, any additional outstanding concerns or um, refinements that you are interested in making. My understanding is that the um, folks from the Saving Lives campaign have also reached out to the rest of the council and offered to be available to answer questions. And so hopefully um, that has helped uh, help resolve concerns that have been expressed. Um, you know, I just see this as, um, while largely symbolic, um, you know, one more uh, way of affirming the uh, you know the city of Santa Cruz support for um, you know it, engaging more uh, deeply and directly with uh, with Cuba and its medical professionals who have shown have demonstrated in many parts of the world um, over the years to have played a really positive and productive role in um, you know in public health and and healthcare uh, issues. So I'll just leave it there. And uh, I know that there were folks who were. Um, wanting to call in, I don't know if the t I did alert them, but I don't know if the time changed if they are able to do so. Um, but I'll, I'll just leave it there and um, see what uh, other folks have to say. Thanks. Okay. Are there any questions or comments from council members at this moment in time? Okay. Hearing none, I'll go ahead and open it up to public comment. So if there are any members of the public who would like to speak to us on this item, <clears throat> now is the time to call in using the numbers on your screen. Once you've called into the meeting, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when you've been called upon, you'll be given two minutes to speak. Uh, yeah, hi, this is Garrett again. Uh, while there is anecdotal evidence of Cuba's interferon alpha 2b drug showing some effectiveness against several viruses, I was unable to find any peer-reviewed studies of this drug against COVID-19 or see any such citations in your resolution calling for a great many changes in foreign policy with a communist country because of the existence of this drug. I'm afraid Newsweek doesn't count. Their drug is regarded as neither a cure nor a vaccine, but one of a number of treatments by existing drugs out there. The fact that a communist country, China, is using it for treatment recently means little because our healthcare system in the USA hopefully does not take directives from communist countries and neither should you. Urges uh, that the US and the president to suspend US economic and travel sanctions against Cuba blah, blah, is so far outside your pay grade, well actual purpose as a city council member I can hardly describe. 
Maybe a balanced budget is a higher priority. Since the announcement yesterday of a potential 90% effectiveness of two American-made fast-track vaccines by Moderna and Pfizer, this resolution couldn't be more ill-timed. Uh, they may be approved for mass production in as little as a month. Uh, Novavax is close behind. I see no evidence, citations of much of anything here, and the fact in a pandemic other countries are searching for answers is not convincing. While I suspect the FDA, CDC, as well as Buddy Buddy, who types like Fauci don't always seem to serve the interests of the American people as well as I'd like, there is a monster worldwide effort to invent both vaccines and cures for COVID, note again Cuba's old drug is neither, which will be available soon without a change in national foreign policy. I always wonder why a resolution you might send to Congress instead explaining that their corrupt and immoral deficit spending, special interests, credit bubble, money printing is bankrupting the country, destroying our monetary system, jet fooling continually higher wealth inequality, and basically devaluing life itself might be on the agenda someday, but then I reaffirm the odds of that are like pigs flying, and this is what we get instead by the council comrades on a regular basis. Mick Jagger had it wrong to say the U.S. is A, everywhere else is B. Some places are C, D, and F, and Cuba is one of those. Uh, thanks. Bye. Okay, if there's any other members of the public who'd like to speak to us on this item, now is the time. Um, once you've called in, please press star 9 on your phone to raise your hand, and you will have two minutes to speak. Seeing no other members of the public who'd like to speak to us on this item, I'm going to close public comment and I'll bring it back to Council for action and deliberation and any further discussion. Councilmember Watkins. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you for um, the extra time to kind of get to kind of get into this, and I appreciate those who reached out with further information. I was able to review some of that. I also, one of the things that I wanted to do is to um, sort of understand our, what we would be asking of our, our county health partners, and I, although I didn't have a chance to speak to them directly, um, I did speak to a couple folks at the county, and I don't know if they felt comfortable um, being able to explore directly with Cuba, but I think if we want to shift some of the language in the resolution that we maybe share potential for them to also reach out to our federal representatives um, offering interest of support, that might be the more appropriate ask um, as opposed to uh, direct exploration of a collaboration with Cuba, which is asked in the resolution specifically. I don't know others' thoughts on that. Uh, Council Member Brown, I see your hands up, and I don't know if that's in response or if you wanted to comment on. Uh, so I, yeah, I was just going to make the motion, but I, um, you know, in terms of a response to that, yeah, I, I understand the concern there, and you know, that is something that um, we talked about and and did think through in crafting this ordinance. Um, you know, the the intention here is not to tell the county they need to do something. It is to uh, provide encouragement to um, explore collaboration. Um, you know, it, perhaps um, to the extent, adding in to the extent feasible um, or something like that would um, try to get at some of your concern, uh, Council Member Watkins. And that's fine with me. I mean, the you know, the, clearly we're not gonna, the city of Santa Cruz is not gonna direct uh, you know, other jurisdictions, you know, actions. But um, I, I do think that um, just, you know, including the idea that um, we encourage our, our health partners and that one of the big ones is the county of Santa Cruz uh, to, um, to, you know, be open to these kinds of collaborations. Um, that's really what the intention is. So um, I'm, I'm okay with uh, some revisions to the language. Um, you know, to the extent feasible is kind of the simplest way to get there, but if you have other suggestions, I'm happy to um, hear those as well. Councilmember Matthews. A couple of quick things. Uh, Councilmember Brown has uh, several times referred to an ordinance, but this is a resolution, just clarification. Um, and um, I understand the um, sympathies behind this. Um, uh, I can certainly, I know there are close relationships with Cuba in several sectors in our community and a lot of 
affinity uh, across sectors. Um, but my own feeling is that this uh, resolution is, is a serious overreach um, and um, makes assumptions about uh, medical preferences that I don't feel equipped to make. So um, uh, having said that, uh, if there's a motion and a second um, for the resolution as proposed, I won't be supporting it, although I am definitely sympathetic with the broader interest in lifting um, uh, harmful uh, restrictions on Cuba. Is there any further <clears throat> discussion or is any member of the council willing to make a motion on the item before us? I think Council Member Brown, you mentioned wanting to move the item, so. Yeah, I'll go ahead and just make a motion here uh, to um, adopt. Thank you for, I, I just have ordinance in my head because we, we're looking at other ordinances. Um, adopt a resolution promoting medical and scientific collaboration between the um, uh, city of Santa Cruz, excuse me, sorry. Um, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna amend the number one language. So um, adopt a resolution, one, encouraging the Santa Cruz County Health Services Agency to uh, explore collaborations with Cuba uh, to jointly face the COVID-19 pandemic um, to the extent possible and then leaving the, the other uh, parts of the recommendation in place as uh, written in the resolution. I'll go ahead and second the motion. I just wanna have some clarification. So in number one, I encourage the Santa Cruz County Health Services Agency to explore collaborations with Cuba to jointly face the, Cuban, the COVID-19 pandemic to the extent possible. And then does that eliminate the rest of that number one or um, um, or does that language say where it says including initiating knowledge transfers? About Cuba. Um, yeah, that's fine. It, you know, the resolution language stays the same. So um, yeah, that's fine. I, I, I just feel like it, you know, the caveat of, you know, including to the extent possible sort of gets at uh, the concern that Council Member Watkins raised and in terms of uh, the other concerns that Council Member Matthews has raised, um, you know, I don't feel comfortable, uh, you know, just stripping this down. The, you know, the, a lot of thought has gone into this. It's been, um, you know, uh, promoted by uh, national and uh, local groups in a variety of communities. It's been adopted in some, and. Um, so I don't see this as heavy handed so much as, um, you know, kind of educational and illustrative of the kind of innovation that is possible. So I would just leave it there um, and then it leaves the, uh, uh, the, the other uh, components in place. Yeah, are there any further, does any council member have any other things to share? Are there any further discussion? Okay, hearing none, uh, Council Member Watkins. I, um, I appreciate the edit to number one, and I'm wondering if the interest is to get their support of this that we possibly have um, sort of notification that we're interested in this way to have um, sort of this exploration for solutions and treatment but I think um, it just, and I apologize if it, I don't mean to sound um, not su like supportive of the interest behind it, but it, it seems unlikely that they could collaborate even to the extent possible with Cuba. But I wonder if behind that is essentially saying, you know, we um, hope that they could look as a jurisdiction at, at potentially uh, wanting to move uh, a similar type of resolution in support of expanded relations between our country and Cuba for, for medical treatment. Um, just to be, you know, I, I mean, open to what I think is, I am hearing is behind this, but I don't, um, it just sort of feels really unrealistic, even to the extent possible would be collaborating with Cuba, even if it's just a sim symbolic resolution. Uh, so, um, Sorry, I'm, I didn't raise my hand. I, I, no one else is 
going to jump in here. Uh, so yeah, in response to that, I, I you know I'm. I understand the concern. I understand the appearance of heavy handedness. Um, that's not the intention with which this was written. Um, and if uh, making that change, um, so um, it would be uh, a revision, uh, more of a revision of uh, item number one in the recommendation. Um, so adopting a resolution. Um, encouraging the county of santa cruz um i guess it would i would prefer if we're going to do it that way to move that down to number four and move two and three and four up um so um putting the the communication with the county as number four instead of number one and you know encouraging uh the santa cruz county and it's health services agencies, or I guess it would be the Board of Supervisors. So encouraging the um, Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors to um, explore a similar uh, resolution. Yeah, would that, that sounds sort of like a friendly amendment. That makes more sense to me. Yeah, that, sure. Okay. Yeah, I just was trying to keep, keep it simple, but I totally understand the concern. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I just want to check to see if the clerk was able to capture that. I think I was able to capture it. Um, so my understanding is that um, we're going to move number one in the resolution down to number four, and it's going to say, or read, and correct me if I'm wrong, that um, for encouraging Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors to um, pursue similar resolutions? Explore similar resolution of support. So the, the uh, corresponding change in the resolution would be on, let's see, um, it's towards the bottom of page two, the first, now therefore be it resolved. And, and that would just, that part would be um, eliminated, that, that first um, paragraph, and um, we would start with now therefore be it resolved that the Santa Cruz City Council supports the lifting of restrictions on the Cuban COVID-19 treatment, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the final be it further resolved would include that same language regarding um, the city council or um, encouraging the county, Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors to pursue or explore a similar resolution. A similar resolution, okay. Okay, if there's no further uh, questions or comments from council members, well, I should ask first, are there any further questions or comments from council members? Okay. Hearing none, I'll call on the, um, the city clerk to call the roll call vote. Um, there's a motion passed by council member Brown seconded by Mayor Cummings um, to adopt um, the resolution promoting medical and scientific collaborations between um, the city of Santa Cruz and Cuba to address the COVID-19 pandemic with friendly amendments made by Council Member Watkins uh, to shift the um, initial portion of the resolution to uh, the lower part of the resolution and change the language so that it reads that it's encouraging the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors to explore similar resolutions of support. And with that, I'll call on the clerk to do the roll call vote. Councilmember Byers? Aye. Matthews? No. Brown? Aye. Holder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? No. Mayor Cummings? Aye. So that passes with council members Byers, Watkins, Golder, Brown, and Mayor Cummings voting in support, and council members Matthews and Vice Mayor Myers voting opposed. Councilmember Matthews? 
I would like to note for the record, I support the lifting of economic and travel sanctions against Cuba. I think in terms of dealing with COVID, we need our full attention devoted to rebuilding the CDC, the NIH, and rejoining the World Health Organization. Okay. All right, so given that we have a time is certain item of 1.30, I think it will be best if we just take a break until 1.30 and then we'll come back with the presentation of the Hans Christian Andersen Award and the 40th anniversary of the Sestri Levante relationship with the city of Santa Cruz. Once council members are back, if you can turn on uh, your video screens, we'll go ahead and move on to our presentation. So I think we're just missing one council member at the moment. Um, once Councilmember Matthews joins us, we'll go ahead and get started. All right, it looks like we have everyone, so we're going to go ahead and move on to our um, presentation that we have today, which is in celebration of the Hans Christian Andersen Award and the 40th anniversary of the Santa Cruz and Sestri Levante Sisterhood. So we are very pleased uh, to have this special presentation of the Santa Cruz Sister Cities Committee and celebrate the 40th anniversary of our special relationship with Sestri Levante in honor, and honor the participants of the Hans Christian Andersen Writing Contest. We're also honored um, uh, to welcome our, oh, I just, my script, I'm sorry about that. Um, but we are also honored and welcome Valentina Gill, Mayor of Sestri Levante, and Luca Ciotoli, one of Sestri's council members. And so I want to thank you both for joining us today. And so we're going to start um, with the Hans Christian Andersen Award Writing Contest. This is a wonderful writing co competition for children, teens, and adults sponsored by Sister Cities Committee. And I'm pleased to introduce Michelle Peregrin, who is the chair of the Sister Cities Committee, along with Isabella Tuckner Tunser, chair of the subcommittee of our Sister Cities, Sestri Levante, Riva Trigoso. Thank you, Mayor Cummings. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Peregrin. I'm delighted to be here with you this afternoon. I thought I'd start by just giving a little bit of background. Our Santa Cruz Sister City Hans Christian, Christian Essay Competition is presented as part of the Hans Christian Anderson Fables Bay Competition held in our beautiful sister city of Sestri Levante. Hans Christian Anderson lived for a short time there and is considered a favorite son. This is the 53rd year of the Sestri competition and is part of a larger celebration of childhood and youth. The competition is open to writers in four age categories, three to five years, six to 10 years, 11 to 16 years, and over 17 years. The essays can be about any subject that must be an original folk or fairy tale. A committee of readers determines first through third place winners in each age group, and those winning entries are submitted to the Sestri competition. And so without further ado, I would like to invite Mayor Cummings to join me in presenting the awards. All right, so it gives me great pleasure today to acknowledge the creative and talented writers and winners of the Santa Cruz Sister Cities Committee's Hans Christian Andersen Writing Contest. Each of the council members had the privilege of reading your work, and we're so proud of your efforts and wish you the best of luck in the Sestri competition. And our winners today uh, are, and I'll turn that back over to Michelle to announce our winners. Yes, thank you. Since we couldn't have an in-person ceremony today, we'll be showing the pictures of the participants, their certificates that they received this summer. The first, second, and third places also received downtown dollars as their prize. So if you could just please hold your applause until we announce all the winners at the end. 
So let's start with ages six to 10. The winners are in third place, Daphne Robertson for Darkness and Light. We have her photo. For second, we have California Contreras for the spell that changed her life. And in first place, Joelle Gerbrandt for the soccer fable. And I'm just gonna pause for a moment because I think there might be a delay on my end. I'm gonna wait for the screen to catch up. And for ages 11 to 16, the winners are In third place, we have Zori Wardrop Frain for the Magical Journal. In second place, we have Orion Papas for the Farmer. We actually had a tie for second place. And so our other second place winner was Ranja MacArthur for the Princess Gold. And then in first place, we had Marley Aldrich for a trip through the attic. And in the division for adults, ages 17 and up, the winners are in third place, Sylvia Patience for Princess Prue and the Dragon. In second place, Joan Prebelich for Five Sacred Stones. And in first place, Nancy Lenz for A Single Wish. So I'd like to thank all of the, our participants and would like to ask that our council members and invited guests and members of the audience please join us in a round of applause for all these talented writers. Thanks to all the participants of our Sister Cities Committee. We're lucky to have such an active community and such a talented group of young writers in our community. And now let's start the second part of our celebration with all of the members of the Sestri Levante Committee, David Tarazas, Enda Brennan, Jason McCluskey, Leo Jed, Anita Hill, and Erica Solberg, and our very special guests, Valentina Gio and Luca Ciotoli and Joe Gio who started our relationship with Cesare Levante 40 years ago when he was mayor of the city of Santa Cruz. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Isabel Tunzer uh, to continue us in our um, celebrations today. Thank you, Mayor Cummings, and uh, thank you, Chair Peregrine. It's my great honor to be here at Café Iveta with all our subcommittee members and uh, Joe Gio, and also in the middle of the exhibit that we, uh, we put up on March 6th. It was part of the first Friday, as David Terrace has mentioned, the longest first Friday in the history of Santa Cruz since the exhibit is going to stay until the end of December. So uh, here we are. Um, we have uh, Joe Gio here, who is going to talk to us about the early relationship between our two cities. And he's the one who formally established that link. And then we'll have Mayor Valentina and Council Member um, Luca tell us about their experience. Thank you, Joe Gio. Buongiorno, sono, sono qui. Um, yes, uh, one of the things I'm supposed to talk about is what, um, how all this got going. And uh, we had a person who was uh, involved at the university and was doing a project, and he thought he came up with the idea of having a, a sister city relationship, something you call twin cities there, um, with where so many of the fishing families here in Santa Cruz came from originally, Riva Togoso. 
And uh, from that, uh, we, we began uh, having, trying to make connections with them. But no one really uh, researched things very well. And we tried to make connect, uh, talking to, to Riva Trigosa. Well, there is no such entity as Riva Trigosa. Because we, I find, we find out later that you have a different governmental system than we do. We have uh, something called a county which takes in a general area, then within those county are certain cities. But there in Italy, uh, and a lot of, because of Napoleon, uh, you have where one city end, or ends, the next one starts. And so, therefore, Riva Tragosa ends up being part of Sistri Levante. Uh, and uh, we didn't discover that till much later. And so ultimately we uh, had talked to them and the problem was we weren't getting any response even from Sistri Levante. And there was no understanding why that had occurred. And so the thing was to send the mayor, I was actually just done being mayor, El Sindico, uh, to Sistri to f see what's going on. And uh, that's how I ended up going there. And it was sort of interesting, it was a trip meant to be. Because while I'm waiting for the, uh, to get on the plane in San Francisco, I hear uh, there's a, a young lady and a couple of older people talking Italian. And so I said, well, I'm going to, I'm going to see, I'm going to practice to see if I, I can talk and they understand me. Um, they did, and uh, then we talked a little bit more, and the, the others were relatives of this young lady, and they were concerned that she wouldn't be able to get through the airport in New York to continue the flight to Milan. And they said, well, if you can get her to the airport, we'd appreciate that. And, but, and then we talked some more, but where is she going but to Sistri Levante? which is, you know, a, a coincidence beyond any imaginable. And if it wasn't for that, I don't know where I'd be, because all I had was a ticket to fly into Milan and then nine days later to fly out of Rome. And what was going to happen in between there was very fluid. And when I, um, a lot of things that she did, I would never have understood. I would have been that stuck at the airport doing who knows what. Um, and uh, for example, we get there and we, she tells me certain things to do in the lawn, the airport, I forget which one it is, but it's way out in the boonies somewhere. Uh, and we get, um, you say, oh, that's our train over there. So, oh, it's moving, it's leaving. And she said, that's why I'm trying to, you know, I said, we don't have any tickets. She said, don't worry about it, just call, call me. And we run after the train that's going down the railroad track, throw our luggage on and jump on with no tickets, no problem. <laughs> She's very relaxed about it. Uh, and uh, see, I would never know if you had done that because then somebody will come around later and you can buy a ticket from that person. Uh, so things like that happened all the way along. And it was, it was quite an experience that uh, uh, for me, and then we get to, we get on the train and we get to, uh, I guess we're running out of time here. Uh, but anyway, it goes on and on and, and there is police waiting for me. And not no, I had no idea, they, I, they, had, they only knew I would be, how they knew I was on that particular flight or anything else, I have no idea. And they say, come with us, is that the syndical? And they say, yes, and they, the police, I don't know where, who, where, <laughs> where I'm going, or who if they really are police or what. And so at any rate, they bring me to the mayor. And uh, they have things pretty well set up. And it, it was from there on, everything got straightened out and we were able to get things going again. So that's a quick summary of how I got involved in this. Thank you. All right, Matt. <laughs> Hi, so I'm hoping to have uh, Valentina Gio and uh, Luca Ciotoli online. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, 
good afternoon to everyone. And uh, I would uh, like to thank you for uh, your inviting to the meeting of the City Council. And uh, I really want to, take, to, to thank the Mayor and all the, the City Council members. And uh, I'm uh, very happy. I'm honored uh, to be in some way with you to celebrate the 14th anniversary of our, of our twinning. Uh, I still remember again our meeting four years ago in Sestre Levante and the beautiful experience uh, you made me live when I came in Santa Cruz. Um, and uh, this is how the twinning are meant to be in my vision. Uh, it's a way to strengthen our bonds and uh, start starting from our common uh, past and uh, sharing uh, experiences, projects, goals, um, to, to look together to the future. Um, since uh, our last meeting, uh, a couple of uh, great uh, projects uh, have been started, also with the help of uh, Luca Ciotoli, uh, our councillor, young councillor in the municipality of uh, Sestre Levante. Uh, and uh, I, really, I really hope that uh, they will be able to go on when um, the COVID pandemic uh, will end. We hope, we hope soon. In particular, uh, I'm really happy about uh, the project that involves our students from uh, high school. I, I think that uh, it, it, it is a way to discover our past, our common past, uh, to keeping the memory alive, and um, also a great way from uh, our young people to live a real, a real life experience uh, in another country living uh, the everyday life of the students um, uh, and uh, a cultural and historic and a human enrichment. Uh, we, all, we, are, uh, we are facing all a very difficult moment now in which uh, all our beliefs uh, are blurring and uh, we feel like uh, we don't have any certainties to put trust on. So, so I think it's a very important to remember who we are and uh, all the things that really count for us as individuals and for the community. And I can say it less that our twinning is uh, so much more than a simple uh, read up deed. It talks about roots, it talks about a common past to bring us, that brings us together. It talks about uh, courage and uh, about hope. And uh, I really think that uh, hope is a feeling we don't have to lose. We have to keep strong and hopeful for us and for who is not able to be start strong and hopeful. And so uh, with this meeting, but every day, we are all one cl close to one and uh, I, I hope that we want to keep this closeness alive. Uh, stay safe and healthy. Happy anniversary to us. Thank you so much, Mayor Valentina. We really appreciate uh, and we hope to see you soon in person in Santa Cruz or in Sestri, but we really hope to uh, see you soon. Same for you, Luca. Uh, you're always welcome here. And uh, I think, Justine, you're very welcome. I think, Justine, you have a proclamation. I do, and I just want to Thank you all again for being here today and want to thank everyone who's helped with the Sister Cities program and who helped establish this relationship. And before I read the proclamation, I'll just say that as a, as a teenager, I had the chance to study abroad and to leave uh, the U.S. for the first time, and it was probably one of the most important and impactful things that happened in my life. And I think the more that we're able to have these cultural exchange programs and find that we have more in common than we do have in differences 
practices, but it helps us create a better and stronger world. So I hope that we, um, 40 years from now, will be celebrating this moment again and into the future. And so with that, I'll read um, some of the lines of the proclamation that I have today. And so, whereas the city of Santa Cruz and the greater Santa Cruz County region has had strong cultural influences from Italy and Italian immigrants who came from Italy to make the Monterey Bay area their home, and whereas the Italian immigrants who originally hailed from Riva Trigoso made their homes in Santa Cruz at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century, and in the beginning, most of the community spoke an archaic Italian dialect called Zenese or Rivi, Rivani. And whereas over the years, these same immigrant families from Riva Trigoso prospered and became some of Santa Cruz's first families, investing their time, hard work, and values into their adopted hometown, always retaining and respecting their ancestral heritage. And whereas in 1990, under the leadership of then Mayor Joe Gio, whose family hailed from the Ligurian village of Riva Trigoso, located within the commune of Sestri Levanti, Italy, Santa Cruz initiated its sister city relationship with Sestri Levanti, Italy. And whereas in March 2020, in honor of the 40th anniversary of the beginning of our sister city's relationship, Historic photographs were exhibited to renew interest in Santa Cruz Sister Cities program and to revive Sister Cities events between Sestri Levanti, Italy, and Santa Cruz with special thanks to Carpe Diem Photography at Sestri Levanti, Roberto Montanari, Jeffrey Dunn, Rotary Club of Santa Cruz, Cafe Veta, and the Blanco family. Santa Cruz Sister Cities Committee, Cecily Levanti Subcommittee, Paul and Emily Rangel, Ariel Rolf, Luca Ciotoli, Vice President, Consiglio Comunal di Sestri Levanti, and David and Monica Terrazas. Now, therefore, I, Justin Cummings, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim November 10, 2020, as Sestri Cruz Day in the City of Santa Cruz and encourage all citizens to join me in celebrating the 40th anniversary of Santa Cruz sister city relationship with Sestri Levanti, Italy, and our extended family of relatives and recognizing the positive contributions that Italian immigrant families have made in our city as well in our nation's history. Thank you. And with that, uh, I'd like to open up if there's any council members who would like to say anything, and Isabel, if there's any final statements you'd like to make as well. Well, I would like to invite all of you to come and see the exhibit. It's going to be here until the end of December, so feel free to come. It will be great for you uh, to, to have um, a view of uh, the two cities as they were in the early 1800s. 1900s. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Golder and then Councilmember Matthews. I just want to say thank you to everybody who organized this. As a former member of the Sestri Levante Subcommittee on the Sister Cities, I appreciate all the work that you did to keep this relationship alive and keep the, um, the writing contest going. And thank you to um, the members in Italy who kept the contest writing contest going, even though you had to move to, I think, a virtual format. Um, due to COVID, and I, I also want to say go check out the exhibit at Cafe Vida. Like I went when it opened on um, in back in March, and the pictures are really, really cool. So um, thank you to everybody, and um, yeah, uh, grazie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Councilmember Matthews. Well, thank you to the whole Sister Cities program. I've been a great fan for many, many years, and um, uh, thanks for putting this program together for the anniversary. Um, Joe, if you're still online, it was great to hear of the genesis of this relationship, and um, I'm sure, Valentina, you guys are related somehow. <laughs> um, um, and Valentina, I remember meeting you when you were here for the city's 150th anniversary, and that was it was wonderful to make the connection at that time. Um, 
I was glad to hear that the exhibit is still up. I'm, I'm assuming it's during the regular hours at Cafe Iveta. I'm, I was going to go and then everything closed down, so <laughs> um, we'll definitely be by to see that. And um, the proclamation was wonderful. Thank you to the mayor. And um, this just seems particularly well-timed, the discussion about our roots when we're considering the work plan this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Vice Mayor Myers and then Council Member Byers. Yes, I just, uh, I just wanted to um, say thank you and um, really nice to meet um, Luca and um, Valentina and just really amazing to be able to connect with you across, across the world um, and via Zoom. Uh, it's a really important relationship we have with Fiesta Levante, and um, I hope we continue for many, many decades to come. And uh, just want to say thank you, and also to the mayor and the sister cities committee, and of course to all the locals um, who helped with the exhibit. I've seen the exhibit as well; it's wonderful. And so, congratulations, and uh, thanks very much. Councilmember Byers. Oh, you're, Catherine, you're muted. Uh, I'm thinking here we are online and not in person. Really reminded me of a wonderful presentation, Hans Christian and so that gosh, it might have been, I don't know, 20 years ago, whatever. I didn't do, get a time to do my homework to pin this date down. But one of the 10-year-olds read his story and, and there wasn't a dry eye at the council desk. Everybody was... It was just beautiful, and I, I still remember, and I remember the kid. Uh, it was a very special moment, and uh, congratulations to all of you. Councilmember Watkins. I'll keep my comments brief, but I too just wanted to express my appreciation of the um, for our twinsies in Sestri uh, Levante, and I remember meeting you, Luca, when you came and presented mm -hmm. uh, before us when uh, David Tarasas was our mayor. And just want to also thank you for your words of unity and uh, really recognition of how much we have in common. And uh, these are the types of opportunities through these relationships internationally that we get to celebrate our common human existence. And um, we are looking forward to many more years moving forward. And thank you for, for taking the time to be here with us today, even though it's virtually. Grazie. <laughs> Sorry, Councilmember Brown, I was muted. Uh, thank you. I will just very quickly echo um, the uh, appreciation and enthusiasm for this program for maintaining the connection for all of these years. It was great to hear the story uh, from Joe Gio, and it's great to see your faces across uh, the distance. And I think now that more than ever, it's just so important that we um, maintain these kinds of relationships and, um, you know, be in, the, in, the, in an era where there's a lot of uh, talk of, you know, kind of in, in looking inward and um, becoming, uh, you know, withdrawing from the international community, let's just say, um, I, I believe that um, efforts like these are just are so important and um, just appreciate you all and um, thank you for being here. All right. Well, that about, about wraps up our program, unless there's any other comments. Um, want to just to thank you, everybody, uh, a lot of uh, good vibes, and as uh, everyone, uh, everyone said, uh, um, our bond is really important, and uh, even if we are so far, far away, I can, our projects uh, can feel uh, us uh, really close. So, grazie mille a tutti, and uh, I want just to say, Hello to my friends of Sister Cities Committee and uh, have a nice day to everybody. Thank you. All right, thank you.
And with that, um, I, I'll just close by thanking everyone again for being here. Uh, thank you to um, uh, Mayor Gio um, and, and Luca Giotoli. And I would like to very much thank uh, all the people who helped put on this celebration today. And with that, um, hope that we can continue working together moving forward to continuing this relationship. So thank you all. Thank you. All right, so with that, we're going to shift to um, item number 25 on our agenda, which uh, was postponed from earlier in the day. And so this item is um, item number 25 on our agenda. Uh, this is a public hearing for 418, 428, 440, 504, 508 Front Street, application number CP18-0153, assessors, parcel numbers 005-151-22-30-31-39 and-50. That's a mouthful. Um, so I'll invite up our presenters. Samantha Hashert, Principal Planner, and Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Um, we're excited to present this project to you today. It is a really a, a catalyst project for the redevelopment of the east side of Front Street in the block between Soquel and uh, Laurel Streets. And um, for decades, the buildings on the stretch have turned their back on the river. And um, this project is the first of hopefully many that will remedy that situation um, and uh, have uh, development that, that really celebrates the river. This project proposes two new uh, pedestrian paseos that um, will have active uses that draw people towards the river, and then it will backfill the levee that um, allows for new public space adjacent to the river where people will be able to um, enjoy outdoor dining or active uses and really put more eyes on that stretch of the river so that um, it's a more inviting place and so that there's uh, more opportunity for people to enjoy uh, the great amenity that we have um, right here in our downtown but that is underutilized. Um, before I turn it over to Samantha um, for a detailed presentation, I wanted to call the council's attention. Just over an hour ago, we did get a letter from the Coastal Commission on this project um, that has been sent to you all. Um, Sam will go through uh, some of the, um, uh, the points in there in more detail, but I will say that um, you know, the, the Coastal Commission is um, expressing some concerns about views. And so I just wanted to um, quickly, and, and I, I will also say, um, I don't know that they expressly indicated views, but they expressed concerns about the height. And presumably that is directly related to uh, views. Um, and Samantha did have a chance to talk with them um, in the last hour, so she may have some more information. But I wanted to quickly just share my screen here to point out some of the views that you can see. You know, there are a number of comparably uh, of comparable height buildings in our downtown. This is 1010 Pacific, and I, would, I should say this is um, this is the just under the Laurel Street. Uh, uh, or next to the Laurel Street Bridge. So this is the other side of the river. This is the east side of the river. The project would be located um, somewhere in this, uh, actually, uh, if this is 1010, so it would actually be right over here. Um, and you can see comparable height buildings. We've also got um, additional height down here with the Palomar building. And you can see some similar views from this uh, perspective here. So it would be in this section through here and um, just some additional views here um, of that, that same stretch. Here's, here's one from the same side of the river you can see. Um, you know, one thing that I wanna clearly point out is, you know, from a pedestrian perspective, 
you do not experience additional height at those heights. Um, you know, on the other side of the river, you may be able to notice, you know, the, I believe they're asking for seven feet uh, and some change, maybe eight feet in additional height above what would be allowed um, by our downtown plan through the density bonus allowances, um, which have been incorporated into the LCP. Um, deviations from numeric standards have been incorporated into the LCP. And so um, as long as those do not um, deviate from, uh, as long as they do not um, adversely affect coastal resources. And while the Coastal Commission letter did not specify which coastal resources explicitly they're concerned with, they have to presume height, uh, the height that they've called out is talking about views. This shows you that, you know, as a pedestrian, you're, you're really experiencing, you know, the first 20 feet of a building. You're not experiencing the, um, the uh, uppermost stretches of that building. And then these others um, really go to show that there are additional, uh, there are other buildings in the same vicinity of similar heights. And so, yes, the building would be placed closer, but, you know, there is not a view that's impacted by placing a, a building right here of the same height as this. It's, it's, you know, beyond this building, there's essentially just barely a, a treetop that can be seen. So I wanted to call out some of those things and, and Sam may have some other things. You know, we, we again, we just got this letter um, about an hour and a half ago. And so um, it's uh, late breaking news um, for the council consideration. And, and with that, I will turn it over to Sam for her presentation. Thanks Lee. I'm just gonna um, jump into this presentation so I can walk you through the project. Um, please let me know if you have any trouble seeing the screen. Can everyone see that? Yep, looks good. Okay, great. Um, so like we said, this is the um, front riverfront mixed use project. Um, it's a seven story development consisting of three buildings with ground floor and river facing commercial and 175 upper floor residential units. This uh, project requires approval of all the permits listed here. Um, and it was heard by the Historic Preservation Commission on August 5th of this year, and it was heard by the Planning Commission on September 3rd of this year. And both of those bodies recommended approval of the project to the City Council with some modifications to the conditions that I'll go over at the end. This is the project site shown here. Um, Lee was describing it from the pedestrian view. Here's the aerial view. Um, it's between Front Street and the river, and um, it currently consists of five parcels that they're planning to combine and um, create the project site. This slide is intended to show you the additional height zones within the downtown area. So this property is located within additional height zone B. Uh, that additional height zone allows for buildings up to 70 feet subject to specific criteria. Across Front Street is an additional height zone that allows for buildings up to 85 feet, subject to specific criteria. And then further um, west of Pacific Avenue, uh, another additional height zone allows for up to 75 feet. So this project is 175 residential condos. According to the applicant, they are likely to be rented. They consist of 53 studios, 89 one bedrooms, and 33 two bedrooms. They also have 11,500 square feet of commercial space, both, both facing the River Walk and Front Street. And the project includes the creation of two publicly accessible landscaped areas between Front Street and the River Walk. So these passageways will effectively create um, these outdoor gathering areas and courtyards, and they'll bridge the gap between the public and private realms. Um, so these will also provide these long desired connections between the downtown core, Front Street, and the Riverwalk. Um, the building is seven stories. It's six stories above ground floor commercial at Front Street, and then the Riverwalk where the elevation is different, it is five stories above uh, commercial. Um, the total height is 77 feet, nine inches. Um, it's higher if you measure it to the top of the mechanical equipment, but the ordinance allows for that to exceed the height. So the total height is 77 feet, nine inches. Um, there's no disturbance on the river side of the levee or within the river channel. Uh, the pedestrian passageways 
uh, as you can see from this picture, they break up the building mass. So it looks like three separate buildings instead of one, and the architect has provided um, this unique but compatible architectural style between the three buildings. Uh, the buildings, the, all three of these buildings are connected by a basement and ground level parking. And this development complies with all of the standards of the downtown plan, with the exception of some of the site standards that they're requesting as incentive concessions um, and waivers, which I'll describe in a moment. Um, and then there's also one standard that they're requesting as a design variation, which the downtown plan allows with a recommendation of approval from the planning director and approval by the city council. So that standard that they're requesting as a design variation has to do with the location of the self pedestrian passageway. The downtown plan requires that these publicly accessible connections are located within 50 feet of the front street intersections at the end of Cathcart, Maple, and Elm Streets. So uh, Maple Street is actually further south, so that's not a part of this project. But um, and the, and the north pedestrian passageway is located at the end of Cathcart, so that's in line with the plan. But the south pedestrian passageway, um, it technically should be located within 50 feet of the future extension of Elm Street. So Elm Street is shown here in red. Um, at this point, it's unknown um, how or where Elm Street would be extended, but if we assume that it's gonna be extended straight through that property, then the South Pedestrian Passageway would be located about 80 to 100 feet from um, the extension rather than the 50 feet required by the downtown plan. And we did discuss relocation of the passageway with the applicant, and if it was relocated south, um, it would result in a much larger center building, a much wider center building, and the relocation of the driveway to the garage uh, that would be, need to be relocated north, and um, that would place it right in the middle of a row of commercial spaces. So for these reasons, and for the reason that the extension of Elm Street is not known at this time, um, we are supporting the design variation. It's been supported by the planning director, and we're recommending that the city council also approve the variation. So this is that view that, uh, Lee was just showing you from at the Laurel Street Bridge, but with a rendering of the project. Um, this is in, as I mentioned, additional height zone B. So it allows for buildings to exceed the base height of 55 feet, up to 70 feet, and five floors above ground floor commercial. So that's six stories total. Um, and not subject to specific design criteria in the downtown plan. Now this project is eligible for a density bonus, and the way we figure that is that there's no range, there's no density range in the um, central business district or the regional visitor commercial districts, but the development standards that are provided in the downtown plan, uh, they regulate the size of the building and the number of units that can be constructed within. So um, the applicant developed plans that are consistent with these standards, including the height permitted in the additional height zone, and they establish the base number of units of um, a base number of 133 units that could be constructed without any incentives, concessions, or waivers to the standards. This project was deemed complete prior to the. Um, adoption of the current ordinance, so it falls under the prior requirement of 15% inclusionary housing. Um, so the applicant is providing 15% or 20 units at the low income level, that's 80% AMI. Um, but like I said, the project is eligible for a density bonus, so um, they are providing 11% of those 133 units, that's 15 units at the very low income level, 50% AMI, and then they're also providing the remaining five units that are required to meet the inclusionary requirements at 80% AMI. Um, and then with that density bonus, they're also requesting in incentives and concessions and waivers. Um, so when we brought this project to the Planning Commission, they raised the question of if the required inclusionary units can also be counted um, as the affordable units for the purposes of the density bonus. Um, 
And so we consulted with our legal counsel and they provided us with case law that um, I think we've discussed with other projects and that's also described in detail in the staff reports. Um, it's the Latino Fumitos case against the County of Napa. And it established that a developer is required to provide a certain percentage of affordable units within a project to increase the density and that the required inclusionary units count towards this percentage. Um, so we provided that information to the Planning Commission, um, but the majority of the Planning Commission voted to recommend to the City Council that um, we require both the 20 inclusionary units and additional affordable units for the density bonus on top of that. And the basis for that was um, listed here. Um, one, that providing additional affordable units is consistent with the Coastal Act policy requiring public access. Um, also that the city's inclusionary requirements were adopted by a vote of the people and have been in effect since 1980. Um, and that the Housing Accountability Act allows for the city to adopt an objective standard that would maximize the city's ability to meet its very low income housing needs. So I just wanna quickly address each of these points that were made by the Planning Commission um, as support for stacking the units. Um, we reviewed the Coastal Act and the um, sections that address public access are primarily related to recreational opportunities, um, providing recreational opportunities for all people and that development shall not interfere with the right of access. Um, so there's, there's no mention in the code about public access for private housing development, um, nor does the Coastal Act regulate um, affordable housing. The second point is um, regarding Measure O, the project is consistent with Measure O. It includes the required inclusionary units. And um, although Measure O was approved by a vote of the people, it's also required to comply with state law. Um, and the Latinos Unidos decision applies to both Measure O and our inclusionary ordinance. Um, the third point here is related to um, the Housing Accountability Act. The Housing Accountability Act requires local agencies to approve housing developments that comply with objective, quantifiable, and written development standards. So we can't adopt a development standard that's in conflict with state law, um, whether or not it was adopted by the city council or a vote of the people. Um, so we have obtained additional legal counsel on the matter. We're confident that the city must consider the inclusionary units in the required number of affordable units for a density bonus project. Um, and so we would continue to support that the proposed number of affordable units, um, the, the number that's proposed by the applicant does make the project eligible for a density bonus. I'm just gonna quickly go through some of the incentive concessions and waivers that they're requesting. Um, one of the incentive concessions is to allow for a 20% reduction in a yard setback at the pedestrian passageway. So this is a requirement that a 10 foot step back is, is provided above 35 feet in height. So as you can see, the, the elevators encroach slightly into that step back. Um, and that is a standard that is um, allowed um, with the density bonus. So that is allowed pursuant to density bonus law. Um, and then the second uh, request is for waivers from the 10 foot step back requirements above 50 feet at the front street frontage and the riverfront frontages. And also to allow for a building height greater than 70 feet. Um, the height, uh, just to clarify, the additional height zone B allows for buildings to be 70 feet and six stories within the additional height zone. So it's subject to specific criteria which they meet. The applicant is requesting the use of a state density bonus to achieve the additional, additional seven feet, nine inches and the additional story. Um, and they have provided us with these diagrams um, that demonstrate that the effects of the setbacks on the development um, would preclude construction of the project. The project includes the demolition of three buildings at the project site. Um, 504, seen at the left side of the screen, that was evaluated by a historic consultant and it was determined to not have any um, characteristics um, that were significant. And so that one is not considered to be um, eligible for listing. Um, however, 418 and 428 Front Street 
um, were evaluated and were determined to be historically significant and eligible for listing. So demolition of these historic buildings is a significant impact pursuant to the California Environmental Equality Act or CEQA. Um, so with this proposal, we prepared an environmental impact report for the project. Most of the impacts the project impacts that we found were analyzed previously in the EIRs that were adopted for the general plan and the downtown plan. Um, but the demolition of the historic buildings required few, uh, further analysis. Um, we ev evaluated three alternatives uh, to reduce the impacts to less than significant. The first is partial preservation of the structures. Um, that includes deconstruction of the facades, storage of the materials off site, reconstruction um, and reconstruction on the new building facade. They would have to be relocated because they can, the current locations conflicted with other features on the building. The historian had concerns about this alternative. They indicated that the buildings would lose their representation as whole buildings if we only preserve their facade. And the effect of a seven story building constructed around the facade would not be consistent with the Secretary of the Interior standards for historic preservation. The other alternative we looked at was the relocation of the buildings off site. So that would entail deconstructing and reconstructing off site in a location of similar quality. So um, a parcel that's adjacent to the river and located on Front Street. Um, the concerns that were raised associated with this um, alternative is that the structural engineer was unsure if the buildings could physically be moved based on the size and the materials that they're um, made of, and there was no offsite parcel available um, for such relocation that had the same historic context between Front Street and the river. Um, and then the applicant indicated that for both of the two alternatives that I just described, um, it, neither of those alternatives would be economically feasible to meet and also construct the project. We also looked at the no project alternative. That's an alternative that's required by CEQA. Um, obviously that one resulted in no impact to the buildings, but it also wouldn't allow for construction of the project. And the project meets several long-standing long goals and policies of the city. The Historic Preservation Commission agreed that uh, while partial preservation would not be consistent with the Secretary of the Interior standards, they were concerned with the loss of the, of the buildings and um, they voted to recommend that the building facades of the historic buildings are portrayed on the front facade of the new building. Um, and they recommended this measure in addition to the recommended mitigation measure for photo documentation and an interpretive display. And the Planning Commission agreed with that. Um, the applicant had time during the Historic Preservation Commission meeting and the Planning Commission meeting to revise the plans to see what these uh, buildings would look like on the front facade. Um, they pulled out elements of the buildings to replicate on these new buildings. So for 418, um, they pulled out the stepped cornice, Art Deco design, and some of the window and door designs. And then on 428, they pulled out the um, horizontal lines, the window designs, and this curved awning at the side. And so this one is a little hard to see, but um, at the top, I don't know if you can see my arrow here, but at the top you have this bottom floor. It used to be these round archways and then these square archways in the side. And then the bottom um, is the rendering of is the new building for 28 and then on the left side is 418. I don't know if you can see that with all the Zoom information on there. Um, so both of the pedestrian passageways that are proposed have stairs that would lead pedestrians to the river walk level. To accommodate bikes, they're proposing a bike rail along the stair rail. And so these are two pictures that I could find that um, showed what these things would look like. Um, it allows for bikers to push their bikes up a set of stairs. And then in the event that this is not feasible, there's also elevator access proposed um, to the river walk in the south building. Um, and then there's also two level access points to the river walk at the Laurel Street Bridge and the Soquel Avenue Bridge, which are fairly, you know, fairly close proximity. Um, there's also an existing bike ramp that would remain that's on a property further south. I think at the old Sherwin Williams building, there will still be a bike ramp there as well. 
Um, the addition of stairs is supported by the downtown plan and that states that passageways shall be predominantly pedestrian in nature. And it's also consistent with the San Lorenzo Urban, Urban River Plan that encourages pedestrian and bike, it says and or bike connections to the river walk. Um, we support the design of the staircases in that we feel like it's a more inviting pedestrian feature than a sort of switchback bike ramp. Um, and we also support the stairs because um, of the two level access points at the bridges that are in close proximity to the project site. So I'm not gonna go through these one by one. I just wanted to show you the number of policies that this project would you know, directly implement. These are a list of the policies from the San Lorenzo Urban River Plan, um, and then from the general plan, LCP, and then from the downtown plan as well. Um, so you had uh, two hearing bodies, the Historic Preservation Commission and the Planning Commission. They all voted to um, have the City Council certify the EIR, adopt the findings, the Mitigation Monitoring Reporting Program, and the Statement of Overriding Considerations as well as approval of the project. Um, and they each included some conditions for you to consider um, the HPC um, recommends the partial preservation of the historic buildings. The applicant has revised the plans to include this in their project, so that is now part of the um, proposed design. And the Planning Commission recommended conditions of approval to ensure that the murals are completed as a part of the project. Um, and then also conditions of approval to require the inclusionary units in addition to the affordable density bonus units. Um, I had included two conditions of approval related to the mural to ensure that it was included as a part of the project and completed. Um, I wanted to propose a clarification to that condition as to who would be involved in that decision-making process. So this would be um, a new condition that would modify condition number 32 and it reads, prior to building permit issuance, the applicant shall work with the city to select a mural artist and design concept for both the north and south ends of the development as shown on the plans. A panel consisting of one member of the Arts Commission, one member of the Downtown Association, and the Economic Development Director shall work in coordination with the applicant to select the artist and design. Um, and then again, a second mural that requires, a second mural, a second condition that requires the mural to be completed uh, prior to the issuance of occupancy permits. Um, this one clarifies that that would be the satisfaction of the Economic Development Director. Um, I also had one other modification here. This is a condition number 76 that uh, previously required that the public pedestrian passageways remain open during the daytime and during business hours. Um, that was intended to just address the passageways being made physically open to the public. Um, so uh, in order to address the possibility for them to maintain that area, it is private property to maintain that area um, for any nuisance factors, we would like to include the statement providing, however, that nothing herein shall be interpreted to preclude the property from ordering the removal of individuals enga engaging in illegal conduct or creating a nuisance. Um, I also had one additional condition that I wanted to add that wasn't in my slideshow. Um, that is to require that the applicant um, provide city fiber conduit. They're going to be opening up the sidewalk to widen it. And so the condition would read, um, plan submitted for building permit issuance shall show the installation of two two-inch schedule 40 conduits along the entire frontage of the property line to property line and two utility boxes at each end of the conduits in the public right-of-way um, sidewalk in parentheses as directed by the Public Works Engineering Department. Um, so you have received all public correspondence associated with the project um, and you just now received comments from the Coastal Commission. Um, as we mentioned, we were not, um, we weren't given the opportunity to speak with them on these issues in advance, um, but um, in skimming through them, you might have noticed that there are many inaccuracies in the numbers that they've provided. Um, and um, 
Uh, in speaking with Coastal Commission staff, uh, they were concerned that there were not enough public benefits provided as a part of the project, um, that the public benefits that were being proposed are um, inherent in any project that is proposed in the downtown, that those are required by the downtown plan. Um, we feel like the project is providing a myriad of public benefits, including public access between downtown and the river, the expansion and enhancement of the river walk, um, providing housing in a transit um, priority area. Um, and so I'm, uh, Lee and I are available to answer any questions, specific questions about the coastal comments that you might have. Um, but. Uh, right now, the staff recommendation to the City Council is adoption of the resolution certifying the EIR, adoption of the resolution adopting findings of fact, mitigation monitoring and reporting program, and the statement of overriding considerations, and adoption of the resolution approving the project with the design amendments proposed by the applicant to meet the recommendations of the Historic Preservation Commission and the Planning Commission based on the findings and um, corrected conditions of approval that I've just presented. And that concludes the presentation. Sorry, I meant to start my video there. <laughs> it's okay. Thank you for that presentation. And um, so it looks like there's a lot to discuss right now. So um, I'll open it up to uh, council member Byers uh, if you have or to actually all my council members, if they have any questions, uh, starting with council member Byers. Could you possibly get us a, uh, no, it is possible, uh, the Coastal Commission's letter? Could we have it in front of us? Um, it was sent to the clerk. Let me, uh, okay. could the clerk confirm that that went to the council members? Yeah, we, okay, we received it, it, I think, know. during our last item. Yeah. We received it? How? Oh. It was sent to your email. So unless you're checking your email during the council meeting, you probably haven't seen it yet. Okay, I'll check. Thanks, thanks a lot. That, I will have questions, but right now I just want to concentrate on that. Thanks. Okay, Vice Mayor Myers. You're, you're muted. Uh, Mayor, I was wondering, since we just received this um, letter, it looks like it's about four pages long. Is there any way we could just um, take five minutes to be able to read through the letter? It, I can't, I, I, I just feel like it's, it's due diligence to read a four page letter from the Coastal Commission before getting into a lot of conversation about the project at this point. Could we either adjourn for 10 minutes and take a read through it and then come back on or how would, how, what's the best way to do it? I'm just sure. Why don't we take a break and um, we'll come, we'll reconvene at 2.45. So to give everyone an opportunity just to look over the letter. Thank you very much. Uh, Bonnie, I did not get the letter. Would you send me another copy? I'm just checking my email. Absolutely don't have it. Mm -hmm. I'll send it right Thanks. now. Yeah, thank you. So we're a little over time. I'm just wondering if there are any council members who might need um, additional time reading this over. But if everybody can turn their video back on to let us know you're here, uh, we can determine the best way to move forward. Vice Mayor Myers. Uh, I personally need some additional time. I mean, this is a really, really, um, it's a very uh, complex letter. Uh, I, I don't know if our planning director can walk us through this, but I mean, this to receive this, you know, just moments before this hearing is, um, it's just difficult to take all this in. I mean, this is a letter very clearly um, negating um, some of the findings that we are meant to approve today. And I, I just, I need more time. I mean, I'm only on page three of a nine page letter. So it, it's just a very, very complex letter. It's very disappointing that we received this letter so late after the um, after the publishing of the agenda on Thursday. 
Um, but this is a very complex letter. I, I don't know what our attorney feels. Uh, I don't know if Mr. Condotti has even had a chance to look at it. I'd be curious to hear from the city attorney and maybe the planning director to understand a little more about the implications of this letter at this point. And one, one thing maybe that I'll, before that too, I think to take into consideration, if there's a desire to have more time to go over this and speak with other folks, I think, and city attorney, if you can maybe give me your opinion on this as well, but there could be an option to table the discussion and revisit this at a later point after council members have had time to review or to, you know, really have enough time to read the letter and, and kind of dive in. So, Are you, um, well, first of all, I've only um, just received the letter myself and I um, have read it through as, as well as the December 2019 letter, but I have not digested those comments. And um, I know the planning director's had a little bit more time to look at it and might have some comments. Um, I think what you might be suggesting is continuing the item, Mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's an option for the council. Um, and, and so um, I, I guess I would ask the planning director to comment on that as well, but that, that is an option. Sir, sure. um, first thing I'd say is, um, you know, upon receipt of this, I immediately sent a uh, email back expressing our extreme disappointment in the timing of this letter as well. Uh, we did receive uh, the letter from 2019, and um, Samantha is on the line here, and uh, we also have Stephanie Strilo um, uh, with us as well, as well as. Um, outside uh, attorney uh, Sabrina Teller, who also worked on the um, uh, environmental review documents. And um, I believe, and Sam can correct me if I'm wrong here, that we addressed all of the comments from the, all of the environmental related comments from the 2019 letter in the um, coastal, or excuse me, in the draft environmental impact report. And then um, we subsequently did not receive any um, any comments on the draft environmental impact report from the Coastal Commission. Um, we also didn't receive any comments at the HPC, the Planning Commission, or um, uh, at all until um, now. And so it is uh, quite disappointing to get these comments right now. Um, that said, um, I think that um, we do have responses to those, and, and frankly, many of the items in there, as I noted, are just inaccurate. Um, and uh, you know, the the citation to um, the 20% inclusionary, for example, you know, in many of our reports, we've specified that um, this project was deemed complete in advance of the um, uh, the 20% um, inclusionary requirement taking effect. Um, Sam, that's, uh, do you, you don't happen to have the date offhand, do you, when it was deemed complete? Um, I don't, but I can find that for you. But it was before February of, of this year? It was before, yes. It was, it was in 2018, I believe. Okay, so, you know, quite some time ago, SB 330 clearly states that we cannot retroactively apply standards. Once a project is deemed complete, the standards that are in place at that time are the standards that apply to the project. So, you know, there are a number of instances where that is identified. Um, Sam uh, called out some others to me as we were um, uh, evaluating this uh, quickly right before this meeting. For example, you know, it, it calls out, I believe, an 85 foot height and um, there are some appurtenances, um, mechanical equipment and so forth um, that goes to that height, except our, um, our code doesn't actually count those as part of the height. Those are additional um, uh, allowances that are part of the LCP. And so, so really the height is uh, um, roughly 78 feet or so and not the 85 feet that's called out. Um, and so really, I think there is, it's a matter of, um, of disagreement on some of the items. And um, some of those items are things like, um, you know, will this affect coastal, um, uh, coastal resources? 
frankly, I didn't see a, a, any evidence in that letter that specifies anything about um, any coastal resource that's gonna be affected as part of this. They, they specified some things about views, um, but did not elaborate on that. Um, in, in this latest letter. I didn't, I didn't uh, get a chance to reread the December uh, 2019 letter, but that um, should have been addressed through that environmental impact report. So um, anything you would like to add related to that, Sam, one, and then two, with respect to the continuance, I think um, if, if it pleases the council, um, you know, we haven't had an opportunity even to hear from the applicant on this matter. Um, you know, they got the, the uh, email at the same time. We saw it at about one o'clock. It came in at 12.30, we saw it at about one, sent it over at that point. So um, I think if it pleases the council, I would um, recommend at least hearing from the applicant and their thoughts on it as well, because we haven't had a chance to coordinate on the contents of it and hear their perspective. And, and then Sam um, or um, Stephanie or Sabrina, if there's anything that um, either of you would like to add, um, I think now would be a, a good time. If it pleases the mayor. Um, yeah, go ahead. I guess I would. I guess I would just add that um, a clarification that the um, the application was deemed complete in July of 2019, so um, prior to the adoption of the ordinance. Um, and also, um, I see Sabrina popped up, so I'll let her describe the um, the way that we described this in the uh, the response to our the Coastal Commission's comments regarding visual impacts. Um, so Sabrina, I'll hand it over to you. Yes, hi. Um, I I can just speak to the process that was followed, um, and uh, you know, of course, I reviewed the, the EIR. Um, we knew, based on the NOP comments that we received from the Coastal Commission, that they had uh, an interest in the visual analysis and the potential visual impacts. And based on their letter commenting on the NOP for the EIR. Um, we paid careful attention to that in the in the draft EIR, um, but as I was looking back through the final EIR, I think I, I noted that I don't think that they commented on the draft EIR. Um, and so, if they had concerns about the visual analysis, that would have been a good time to share them, and not an hour before uh, your schedule to make a decision on the project. That said, I've only been able to sort of skim the letter at this point. Um, I I don't have what I would say confident or fully formed opinions on um, the accuracy or the weight of those comments. And I think um, staff and, and, and I would probably feel better about <laughs> being able to address specific points uh, with a little bit more time to digest the letter in a more careful manner and come back to you with um, some specific responses to the letter rather than trying to respond on the fly and potentially miss something important. Councilmember Matthews and Councilmember Brown, and then I have a few comments and questions myself. Um, the planning director was being very uh, um, restrained in saying that this was um, whatever adjective he used, uh, um, inconvenient or upsetting to get this kind of a letter at this late date in the process. Um, and um, I would just say, in my opinion, this is unprofessional, it's offensive, it's obnoxious, it's insulting and disrespectful, and the serious tone of these comments um, is, is simply unprofessional. Um, I, um, I feel badly for our staff and the applicant, not to say there's not gonna be a discussion, I'm open for a discussion, but to have this thing delivered while the meeting's in progress, Big fat letter. I, I only got to page three myself in the allowable time. Um, if we do continue this, I would like it um, at least to be noted that our staff believes uh, that there are inaccurate statements um, as well as factual issues that need to be uh, explored. Um, I think we all know that once a letter like this gets sent out, it takes on a life of its own and a truth of its own, so the factual misstatements 
then become part of the narrative. So that's my one concern about just letting it stand. So I'm a little bit divided. I don't know if staff feels like they want to tackle some part of that, but I do agree to do a, um, a decent job on this. It probably will need to be continued, but it's, it's so unprofessional on the part of the Coastal Commission to deliver it at this point. Council Member Brown. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, um, I, I don't, I'm a little bit torn myself as uh, Council Member Matthews is about how to proceed. Um, but um, along with the uh, comments made by Director Butler about um, perhaps wanting to take the, be able to take the time for the developer to respond, for staff to respond, I would add the public as well. And I understand that there are concerns about um, perhaps some of the, the specific numbers and certainly the 20% inclusionary percentage being off. But regardless of those, the general concerns still stand. And I think they that we do need to take the time to digest that and, um, you know, and give an opportunity for everybody, you know, all of the stakeholders to, to respond. So my, I think I'm leaning towards my preference being that we continue this item uh, in order to give time for um, staff, the developer, uh, representatives and the public to uh, weigh in. And I don't know if there's a way to, um, it, given that this is now in the record, um, mm. to produce something that just very quickly suggests there are, you know, some corrections that need to be made so that can be included for the for public consumption as well. Okay. Uh, Council Member Golder. I agree with Council Member Matthews and that I think it's super insulting to send such a dense letter to us at this point in our meeting when we're trying to be focused on other agenda items and expect us to be able to digest, digest and consider the points that are being brought forward. And from my perspective, I think um, they had plenty of opportunity to present this information and I do not want to delay, um, but if other council members feel like they need more time, I'll be respectful of that. I think that the, we should continue with the process and, if, and listen to the public and have our discussion and move forward as planned, and that's my perspective. Council Member Byers. You know, I guess I am terribly disappointed as we all, we can be disappointed, we can be mad at them, we can be everything, but they have sent us a very detailed letter that needs really uh, going over by our professional staff and Tony. Uh, uh, this is a huge project and one everyone's been working on forever. So I don't think we can ignore this letter whatsoever. Uh, along with that, I, I guess it's a, a question for Tony. Tony, what's our obligation? To, we need, I mean, obviously people are watching and they're one, you know, what? And the, I'm sorry, Catherine, you kind of on. up there and I uh, didn't hear your comment. Okay, I guess I was making a comment, but I want to know how, we, we seem to, don't we have an obligation to share this letter now with the public so they have the whole picture? It is a public record, yes. And how do we, uh, well, maybe it's not up to you. Uh, how do we get I mean, that letter? It's not required that members of the public uh, have immediate access to documents that come in last minute. Um, I imagine that the city clerk will post the letter to the uh, okay. agenda item, which is typical for um, you know, late incoming correspondence. But um, I thought your question was whether or not you need to hear from the public today. No, no, I was, my question really had to do with uh, getting this document, you know, to the planning commission and the public who's weighing in on this, that's, yeah. that's all. Yeah. So, and yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that's a great point. It's unfortunate that the, yeah. that the commission chose to hold uh, off on commenting even uh, until after the planning commission met. I agree. I couldn't disagree at all. However, it is before us and we're looking at it. So I, I certainly, this is such an important project, so many benefits that I would hope we would just simply reschedule. Uh, 
a meeting. Okay. I would Tony, that, that brings up a question for me. Would this letter, given the level of potential impacts that it can have on the project, would this need to go back to the, co to the Planning Commission for any kind of? No. No? Okay. It does not, no. Okay. Councilmember Brown. I just wanted to add a quick uh, comment uh, in response to Councilmember Golder's point um, about uh, moving through this now. And I, I completely, I understand that because I'm like ready to go <laughs> too and I've read it all and it's, you know, it's, it's right at the front of my, my mind at the moment. Um, but um, we do have to remember that uh, the Coastal Commission is not just a, you know, a stakeholder commenter. They are an arbiter of uh, you know whether or not these developments can be moved forward, and um, if there is an appeal, they will have a say. And so, I believe it's important that we take it seriously, um, because if we move ahead now, it could end up delaying longer. In you know, in the end, so that's just a you know clarification. Yep. Councilmember Matthews and Vice Mayor Myers. Uh, my main concern at this point is the uh, legal risk if we um, ignore, if, if we don't fully explore the issues raised here, even though they may be incorrect, um, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Um, that, so maybe I would appreciate the uh, recommendations from Tony and Sabrina on that. Um, I mean, another thing would be let the public speak, close the public hearing, and then what we come back with is just clarification of the facts here and move forward rather than go through it all again. That's probably not desirable. But um, again, as I say, my um, my main concern is just uh, not rushing into an action where we have not fully considered any legitimate issues that may be raised here, quite apart from any off-base issues. So, um, well, just, just briefly, um, you know, this, this is one of the inherent um, risks in land use decision making is, is that someone could identify an issue that has merit and bury it in a letter that is mm -hmm. mostly empty rhetoric and, um, you know, we don't have sufficient time to analyze it. Uh, and, and flag it for uh, you know council consideration. So that, that's frustrating. Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, I guess um, I, I'm kind of reflecting on that on the risk calculation right now as well, um, and also just on the long term um, sort of kind of ramifications of um, the various things that are, you know, sort of in the wings uh, with regards to this area in the downtown plan and, um, I, you know, with our with our, our budget issues that we have, um, uh, it, this seems like a risky thing to continue to work towards today. Um, I'm wondering, um, the, if the, I don't know if the applicant or the applicant's representatives are available or wanting to potentially speak. Um, I don't want to put them on the spot, but I don't know if we could hear maybe from the applicant and kind of get a sense from them as, as obviously this, I don't know if they received this letter any earlier than we did, but I'm just curious if we could hear maybe from the applicant if that's appropriate, Mayor. Yeah, why don't we, um can finish with the council member comments and then we'll provide some time for the applicant. Um, and I'll just say before, I know because council member Watkins has a comment, but I would say that, um, you know, one of the things that I'm concerned with is that if we go into too much detail on this project in terms of deliberations and discussions, if this letter has some merit, it's going to it has the potential to completely negate any conversations that we have today. Yeah. So, you know, I think that um, we should just keep that in mind as we're moving forward with this. And again, you know, it's 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 unfortunate that it came to us at this time, but there are some things that pop out to me in this letter that I don't think are legitimate, and then there's other things that pop out in this letter that I. Think think are, you know, a big concern for me. So, 
you know, I, I don't think that it's um, something that we should just brush off. I think it's something we should really be taking extremely seriously because if there are some, um, if some of the concerns are legitimate, it's going to have major impacts on this, and those major impacts will need to be addressed before we're going to be able to move forward and have um, further discussion. So, um, Councilmember Watkins, Councilmember Byers, and Councilmember Matthews. I think, Mike, you know, I will just echo a lot of the comments that, are, that have already been made. I think just sort of following up on what you were saying, Mayor, I think having a clear understanding of our path forward or some of the legal considerations will be helpful in determining the best choice uh, to take today. And then um, what Vice Mayor Myers uh, mentioned in regards to the applicant, I don't know, Lee, if, if I, I believe I heard you say that he he is on the call and would, would want to address people. And if that's the case, I'd, like, I'd be open to hearing from him as well. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll provide that. I just saw uh, Mr. Lawler on our video feed, so I'll make sure that they have an opportunity to speak. Councilmember Byers and then Councilmember Matthews. I just wonder by our opening it up to other than the council members, we'll need to hear um, from the public on this and have a maybe it's a question for Certainly you'll have to hear from to the me. public before the council takes any action. You would not be required to hear from the public if we were going to be continued, but um, if you were That's what I, I, yeah. I guess that's what I was trying to understand. If we just set a date and continue it, but once we open up, we need to hear from the public. Okay. Well, I still think we, I guess I've got the floor for a minute, that we just spend our time needing a date ASAP to continue this item. Okay. Council Member Matthews. It may be also that we, I have no idea of the um, legal issues that may be contained in this, um, but it might be useful to have um, closed session discussion with um, Council um, Sabrina Keller as well, if some of you feel that would be useful. Um, I know we, we've had outside council um, giving us additional background and perspective in the past on major issues. So that's another, another possibility. That's a possibility. What I think I would probably recommend first, though, is um, we could certainly analyze it and communicate the analysis yeah, to right. council confidentially. Yeah. I had a, a question before um, we give the applicant time to speak, and it's kind of with regards to setting a new date for this to be heard. I think one of the concerns I have is that if it's determined that if we set a date today, um, but it's determined that some of the um, some of what's been the issues that have been brought up in this letter are legitimate and that will require changes to the project to be made that that could potentially, you know, it could take longer, take more time in order to address those issues um, than it would for the, whatever date we set. So, you know, if we set, if we set a date for a week or two from now and it takes, it's going to take them a couple months to make the appropriate adjustment, that doesn't seem appropriate. And so I'm wondering if, um, you know, if we choose to continue this, that we have um, either the mayor and vice mayor, or the, you know, if it takes longer than the next mayor, work with the planning director and the city attorney to determine um, the, you know, next feasible date for putting this on the agenda. So that, that to me seems like it's getting to this, you know, it addresses that we want to move forward with this, um, but we don't want to set a date specific just in case it's going to take longer for the applicant to, you know, address the concern if they're legit or, or not. So. The, the one caveat to that, uh, Mayor, is, is that if we continue it to a date certain, then we don't need to re-notice it. So I don't know if that was uh, Lee's comment that was going to be. That, that's exactly what I was going to say. Um, you know, given the, that we do a thousand foot noticing radius for this, it's got quite a few notices as well as the newspaper publishing. And so um, there's a fair amount of staff time as well as direct costs associated with the mailing and the publishing. And so I think our, our preference would be to um, continue to a date certain 
um, that would give us an opportunity to attempt to coordinate with the Coastal Commission. Um, I will be blunt here um, and say that I expect based on the uh, tone of this letter that there may be some issues in which we uh, agree to disagree on and um, they may just, uh, that it may ultimately be um, the, um, uh, up to the California Coastal Commission themselves. You know, I, I, for example, do not see that there is a visual impact um, associated with this, and we've uh, we've talked about that as part of the environmental impact report. And so, if if that's the um, case that the Coastal Commission is making, um, we would put it to the council to say, you know, do you believe there is a visual impact? And if you do not believe there is a visual impact, the Coastal Commission very well could call it up. Um, and, and, and likely would call it up. Uh, based on what I'm reading in this letter and the tone of that letter, I would expect they, that they do. Um, but I, I would um, request a date certain. I think it, it, it would be helpful to, um, to try and sit down with the Coastal Commission and if nothing else, um, have them revise the letter to address, to correct some of the inaccuracies and then um, really uh, pinpoint the issues where we're, we're not in agreement. And um, you know, if, if the Coastal Commission staff aren't in agreement with some of those things um, with the staff and then the, the council wants to um, approve the project that, um, that they believe is consistent with um, the LCP, and the Coastal Commission doesn't believe that's the case, then the Coastal Commission staff do not, then that would ultimately be presented to the Coastal Commission itself for their determination as to whether there is, for example, a, a, uh, an impact of visual resources. Um, and one question. I, I would just add one thing, if you don't mind. Um, if we do continue it to a date certain and we're not ready at that point, we do have the ability to write a report that says, hey, uh, we're gonna continue it again. Obviously, we don't like to do that with you know, the public seeing that it's agendized and so forth, but um, we are uh, cost conscious when it, when it comes to this, um, particularly given the, the large number of, um, of mailings. And then I guess, you know, I guess depending on the outcome of the circumstances, how long would you expect it to take to address, you know, to meet with the Coastal Commission, have the, you know, um, appropriate legal review, meet with the applicant, make a recommendation that could come back to council? Um, I would say that we could aim for that first meeting in December, which I believe is the, it's the 8th. Eight. Eight. Um, you know, we could aim for that. Um, I, I certainly think it would be challenging, very challenging to get it done um, before the meeting in two weeks. Um, and so if, if we continued it out for a month, that um, it would feasibly give us enough time to do that. Um, whether or not um, we can address all the issues, whether or not we can, would have to continue it again, I can't say because you know, there may be some things in the Coastal Commission's letter where after sitting down with them and, and talking through it, we say, you know what, if we make this change, the Coastal Commission would be okay. Or you know, there could be some negotiation where they say, all right, you know, um, staff would support it if you do this, but not that. And then you know, it goes to the applicant to say, um, you know, are you uh, amenable to making that change? And then, you know, would staff be making a recommendation um, that is inconsistent with what the applicant is proposing or inconsistent with what the Coastal Commission is proposing? You know, there are a, a number of different paths that it could go down, but hopefully we could do that within a month and not have to continue. It may be that we would have to continue again at that point. Okay, is it, I'm just looking at my schedule and kind of thinking about upcoming meetings. Um, do you think it might be possible, and I'm just putting this out there because I know oftentimes council members keep the keep their Tuesdays open, and so I'm wondering if we had a special meeting on December 1st, would that provide staff with enough time to kind of, you know, to have these discussions and come back with a recommendation, or do you, I mean, I'm just putting it out there. Because I know the ACE, I don't know what's coming up, but I know we try to keep that one a little bit lighter of a meeting, and last year I know that meeting went pretty late, so um, just wondering if we had a special meeting on the first, if that might you know, be a date and provide enough time for us to 
address concerns and, and bring this back to council? Potentially, I think that's uh, fairly tight timing. Um, by the time we organize a, a meeting with the Coastal Commission and then um, if there's any negotiation with them, um, you know, I think possibly, but I would say that's pushing it. Um, you know, if, if we were one week later, um, that, um, you know, the 15th of December, that would be, uh, you know, more feasible. I know that's, um, that's pushing later into the, um, and that would actually have a different council. So um, we don't know their availability. <laughs> Um, so lots of things to consider. Um, if you would like to do it on the first, you know, we will certainly uh, do our best to get everything um, squared away in that amount of time. Um, I, I just, I don't want to make promises that, oh yeah, we can do that because, you know, it's, it will be a negotiation, a three-party negotiation, you know, us, the applicant, and the Coastal Commission. Yeah, and I just, I just asked that because I was really, you know, trying to get a sense of that is not possible versus like, potentially we could do it, but if we need to continue it again, that might have to happen. So just tr trying to get a, a sense of what that timeline kind of looks like. So thank you. Uh, Council Member Matthews, then Council Member Watkins, and then Vice Mayor Myers. Well, this appears headed to continuous, and I do favor doing it to a date certain. Um, it sounds like staff would truly feel more comfortable with the December 8th they to have time to do your job on it. Um, I have no idea what you have planned for December 8th, um, what time you intended to start December 8th, uh, what might be moved from the agenda of the 8th to the 1st, you know, just uh, jimmying things around. Personally, I'd feel more comfortable continuing it to the 8th if that can be accommodated by other changes in schedule. We haven't, just to, in response to that, we haven't um, dis had much of a discussion about that meeting yet. So um, maybe in agenda review uh, next Tuesday, we can spend some time looking at the 8th and what's coming up on that agenda. And if, so that if we put this item on that agenda and we need to shift other things, then I think it's just something for people to keep in mind that we'll need to do. So I'm just, you know, speaking for myself, I'm happy to keep that December 1st open in case we need to move agenda items around, but, but wrap this one up. Okay. Uh, Council Member Watkins. I am, um, I would prefer the either the 8th or the 15th. The 1st is not a, it's not a good day for me with other conflicts, but this time I'd, I'd have to move some stuff around. And it sounds like it's also a little bit on the earlier side. So if we're trying to get a date certain, my vote would be for the later date. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers. You're muted. Um, I just kind of go back to just wondering if maybe we could hear from the applicant if it's appropriate just because we're scheduling things and I'm sure they probably have a whole team of folks who probably have some date things. That first also is a, a conflict for me. Okay, thanks, that's helpful. And I think this is actually a really good transition to um, invite the applicant to um, make any comments and to address the council. So you're currently muted. There you go. You know, for, for some reason, we still can't hear you. You have to press star six or something? I don't, I don't think so. His microphone's unmuted as a panelist, so. If he's on his phone, sometimes you have to um, press star six. Oh, try pressing maybe star six if you're calling in from your phone. Okay, I can't hear you. I'm wondering.
wonder if it might be worth trying to just call in again. I also don't know if there might be a mute button on your headset. If that's the case, I'm not sure. No. Mayor, I think that um, there are other applicants here. Are there other folks here who might be representing the applicant that Owen, maybe you can see if they want to speak? Maybe he could go out and come back in. Yeah, I was going to actually mention that you, you might be able to log out, log back in and try that. One thing that I would um, mention while we've got a little bit of downtime here is um, actually under SB 330, there's a limitation to the maximum number of hearings that um, we can have. So it is a maximum of five hearings. I think I'd like to get the applicant's concurrence that if we set this for a um, hearing and it's determined that we need to continue it for purposes of um, uh, completing that negotiation with the Coastal Commission, um, that the applicant would be amenable to having that additional hearing um, and um, so I, I, would, I would like to um, get the applicant's take on that. If they aren't okay with that, then I think we would have to say um, the approach that the mayor suggested of um, having a, uh, a re-notice hearing once we've determined that we're ready um, could be better. Um, but uh, that, that five hearing limitation uh, just came to mind and we've had the Historic Preservation Commission, the Planning Commission, this city council meeting. We also had um, a community meeting that was completed after it was, uh, after the project was deemed complete. So that's four, this is the fourth meeting. So the next one would be the fifth, which the uh, new SB 330 regulations say is the last meeting. So what, I guess my question for that is what is, what happens if it goes beyond five hearings? Uh, I think uh, if the applicant is amenable to that, then um, it's, it's a non-issue. Um, and I, I see Steve Atkinson is on the line there. He may want to, to weigh in on that, on the applicant's part. Steve, uh, Go ahead and we'll see if we can we can hear you. Hi, uh, Mayor Cummings and Council, uh, Steve Atkinson for the applicant. Um, we, uh, having conferred with my council, we will agree that if we can schedule this for the 8th and that if that has to be continued, that that continuance shall not count toward the maximum meetings. Do I have correctly, Lee, that that's what you were asking? That is exactly what I was asking, so thank you for that concurrence. Okay. Well, given, um, oh, and I'd just like to invite the applicants, if there's anything else you wanted to say about this project, this is an opportunity for you to address the council as well. But I know that we're gonna hear a lot more once this item comes back, so if the preference is to hear, if, is to have that opportunity, uh, just save the opportunity for the eighth. We're happy to do that as well. Well, uh, Mayor Cummings and Council, uh, Steve Atkinson for the applicant. It looks like uh, the applicant's left. Um, if you'd like oh, uh, to, hello? There's uh, so again, uh, Council, there was just a little echo of my past <laughs> remarks, so I'm not quite sure what happened there, uh, a creature of Zoom, I guess. I see that Owen Lawler is on, and Owen, would, would you like to say anything at this point? I'm going to see if I can unmute him as well. Oh, it looks like okay. you're unmuted. Can you hear me now? Now I can hear you, yes. Okay, 
So, yeah, we're fine with the AIDS. I, Steve Atkinson and uh, Aaron Fox, um, I, I don't think there's much more to add at this point. I think, like you said, we'll open this up for hearing. I don't want to um, belabor the point at this point. I think we, we need to review this letter carefully. I, I concur with Lee Butler's uh, uh, analysis uh, that uh, there's been a lot of work done here, um, and we need to um, – bring that along with the discussion of the commission. I'm getting an echo, so I can't tell whether you can hear me or not. We can hear you. I'm not sure if uh, maybe you have a device on that's turned up or maybe if other council members and people on the call can mute when they're not speaking, that'll help. If you wanted to continue, you're, you, it looks like you've muted yourself. But. I don't have anything more to add at this time, Mayor Cummings. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Council Member Golder. I don't want to belabor the point, but I just want to express my extreme frustration with who, um, whoever organized and sent this letter because I feel like it's so disrespectful for everybody that's here today, whether they're members of the council, members of city staff, members of the, the applicants, members of the public that came to listen, and they've re everybody's rearranged their schedule to be here today for this. And having known that this project has been coming forward for months or years, they had plenty of opportunity to put their comments in, in advance of this meeting. And I just want to say that I'm, I'm <laughs> always disappointed when I feel like people didn't do their homework and didn't get it in on time. And I feel like it's just a deliberate attempt to, you know, stop the project. And it's, it's, it's disappointing. Hey, Council Member Watkins. Um, in order to move this forward, and given that all we've heard, do you need a motion to um, postpone this item until December 8th? A motion to continue the item to December 8th. Okay, I'll go ahead and make that motion to continue the item until December 8th. City Council. I'll second that. Okay, so we have a motion by Council Member Watkins, seconded by Council Member Golder to continue uh, item number 25 on today's agenda to. December 8th. Is there any further questions or comments from council members? Okay. Hearing none, uh, we'll go ahead. I'll ask the clerk to call the roll call vote. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. So that passes unanimously. Um, and with that, uh, we have actually come to the end of our afternoon agenda. The next item that will be up is at 5, like, I guess we can, we can hear that item at 5 p.m., and that's going to be the presentation from the county on their three-year homeless strategies plan. And then after Mayor, that, I think they're actually expecting more towards four. Yeah. If, I, if I understand correctly, uh, I can I can clarify that. So we they're ready to start as soon as four. If you if you because uh, we weren't sure whether you would be able to uh, what time you would you would be able to start. So I think they're available to start at four if you'd like. Uh, but we did tell them that the the latest that they would start would be five, so that uh, and they would have an hour. So it's really up to, to you, uh, Mayor and Council. Um, we anticipated that it could be as soon as four or it could be five. So they're, they're prepared at four if you wanted to do, do it at four. If you want to wait till five, that's fine too. Okay. Um, and then it looks like we'll, well, I guess for Council consideration, um, I know when I spoke with, when we 
had our, I think it was the last two by two meeting we had with them, they mentioned they just need to be done by six. So we could take a half hour break and come back at four and have the presentation. Um, and then I think we'd likely have that. And then after that, we would do um, oral communications. If there's time for a break, we could take a break then and then start our evening meet meeting item at seven. Um, or we could have the item come before us at five and then um, again with the anticipation of being done by six going into um, oral communications likely then we'd have a half hour break and then start our evening item at seven so um, it'd be good to just hear some feedback from folks councilmember matthews um how long did they want i mean i i want a full report this is I have not been on the two by two committee and I am interested in hearing this. I know it's been a big deal, et cetera. So how long do you, how long do you anticipate it taking for a good presentation? The, uh, they're prepared to do, uh, they can actually do a, a comprehensive pro uh, presentation that's, uh, that they did with the board at, that was uh, 45 minutes. Or what we had actually planned for was a 30 minute presentation and a 30 minute uh, question and answer period. So we had, we had allocated an hour uh, based on what we expect the, the council to be able to accommodate. Uh, so it's sort of a, a medium, uh, essentially uh, comprehensive presentation that they've prepared. I'll just put out my two cents. It seems to make more sense to have them start at around four, go to five, or start at four thirty, go to, I mean, somewhere in that four o'clock and then have oral communications, that's at 5.30, 5.30 to 6, take an hour break and then come back at 7 for the, you know, the evening presentation. Okay, that sounds, I mean, I'm, I have no strong preference, so if we want to start at 4 to give ourselves enough time, I'm happy to do that. I'm just trying to, you know, get a sense from you all what, what the preference would be. So if, if we want to give more time for the presentation, we can um, just take a quick half hour break, we can come back at 4. But um, I want to hear from Councilmember Byers as well, because I see your hands raised. Well, I think, um, thank you, Mayor, that I'm not available from about four to five. But you can go ahead. I'm, I think I'll, I could just, uh, um, I don't want to interrupt that flow of schedule. That sounds good. But I do have an event at the university from four to five that I'm committed to. Okay. Given the feedback, um, it sounds like there's an interest to uh, have more time to ask questions with the county and to have you know long enough time to ask, to ask questions and to have a, a full presentation. So why don't we take a break until four o'clock? We'll reconvene. Um, I'm wondering if somebody, either the clerk or the city manager, if someone can reach out to the um, the county to let them know that we're available and ready at four, and then we can reconvene then for the conversation. Yeah, I can do that. Okay. Great. Well, I'll see you all back on the call at 4 p.m. She's going to be absent for the presentation, but uh, we're, we'll be ready to go ahead once all six council members are back. Justin, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thanks for letting I me know. Can't get, I can't get my video oh. to work. You should be able to now. Yeah, okay. All right. So, can bear with me for one moment. everyone for joining us and welcome back. Um, the next item on our agenda, um, our agenda was shifted around a bit, but it's item six actually on our agenda, 
which is uh, Santa Cruz County update on homeless strategies. And so with that, I'll turn it over to, uh, looks like we have Elisa Benson and Randy Morris from the county joining us today for this presentation. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay, it's funny, I've been on a lot. So I'm Elisa Benson, I'm Assistant County Administrative Officer here at the county and I've worked with many of you on the issue of homelessness in the past few years. I'm here today with Randy Morris, our new Human Services Department Director. Um, I, it's funny, I've done you know a lot of Zoom and team meetings, but I actually have not done that many formal presentations in this setting. So it's it's a little awkward. I'm, I'm hopefully it'll all be fine. Um, so um, thank you for letting us come and, and share uh, the new three-year Housing for a Healthy Santa Cruz strategic framework for addressing homelessness in Santa Cruz County. So um, this is really the, the final deliverable in an 18-month engagement um, process we've had with Focus Strategies uh, um, to perform an assessment of our response to homelessness in collaboration with a broad set of partners, including um, the city, city staff and, and, and city leaders, and with really the intention of designing an action-oriented, results-focused improvement plan. So my next step is going to be to try to share my screen so we can actually, you can see the, see the slides. Okay, can you guys see that okay? No. No, okay. Let's see. I'll try a different one. Oh, I know what I'm doing. How about okay. now? Great. Now we do, yeah, thanks. Okay, so um, this is just our cover slide. Uh, so in addition to having Randy here who will be co-presenting with me, we have uh, Kate Bristol who is one of our principal consultants from Focus Strategies who's really here to answer any technical questions. So, um, and I think, I, I'm hoping Randy's available as well, but we do have our lifeline calls in the wings in the event Randy and I aren't able to answer all, our, all your questions today. So with that, I'm going to get started. I mean, I can actually make this move. There we go. Okay, so quick uh, overview of what we're gonna cover today. We're gonna provide a little bit of background and context on how did we get here to this moment. Um, Randy and I will then tag team in terms of a summary of the framework. Um, we'll give a brief, um, brief overview of our, our next steps to finalize the plan and the first six month work plan, and then we'll be open to questions and discussion. So, why an updated framework? I think everyone is um, very, very aware that homelessness is a critical issue in our country, in our state, and, and especially here locally. You visit any, any, nearly any West Coast community and the impact of unaffordable housing, poverty, addiction, mental health challenges, loss of a home, to, just to name a few of the root causes of homelessness, um, really we see it all around us. And here in Santa Cruz County and in the city of Santa Cruz, there's really a disproportionate share of homeless um, relative to many other communities. And this graph actually indicates that where what we did some comparison with a variety of counties here in California and in terms of number of persons per 10,000 residents experiencing homelessness, we're nearly 80. And that's double the state average. We're not the absolute highest, but we have a much higher number. Um, and I think all, all of you are aware, and when you look at uh, large cities here in California who have numbers as high as ours or lower, um, we don't get the same amount of funding that many of our major cities uh, just across the state get to address this crisis. We also wanted to spend a few moments just to to ground ourselves in the, the, the reality, the faces of homelessness in our community. So what we have is a little bit of a snapshot. I'm sure many of you know this well um, from our last 2019 point in time count. And though we are, we're trending down over time, 
um, at about uh, just over 21, 2,167 individuals. Um, as you know, 78% of those folks are unsheltered. 40% of those folks um, reported this count of homelessness as their first count of their first experience with homelessness. And that's going to be important when we talk about the framework. Again, what we see here is about uh, about four, you know 403 individuals identified as chronically homeless. We had 151 who were veterans. We had 419 folks who were, were families, um, 102 families comprising 419 people. We had 51 children, unaccompanied children uh, that were counted. And then this is one that I think often gets a lot of attention. Uh, we had almost you know, 569 transition age youth. So nearly a quarter of our, of our homeless population were in that, that 18 to 25 range. So there are very different experiences of homelessness in our community. We have folks that have lived on the street for a very long time. And then as I mentioned, we have some folks, this is a very new and, and, and tragic experience for them. We have folks that are working. We have folks that are disabled. So it's a broad, uh, a broad there's, a, there's a broad experience of homelessness in our community. But it's really that disproportionality and the fact that we look around and we're just not seeing a change that drove, up, drove the county forward in engaging focus, stra focus strategies in doing this work. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the technical assistance that we started. So really it was when I first started working for the county in the, about the middle of 2018, when um, the CAO asked me to do a, an internal review of, of county departments and, and their work on homelessness. And that is sort of what I identified sort of led us to the recommendation that we needed outside technical expertise to really understand what was working and what was not working here. So in uh, February of 2019, the board allowed us to move forward to hire Focus Strategies, a nationally recognized firm that works solely, solely on issues of homelessness and, and the charge of that engagement was really to carry out an inclusive and a collaborative approach to assess our current performance, um, and then really come up with recommendations on system level performance measures and targets, how to improve our governance and decision making, and a detailed action plan to get there. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the parts um, here, the, the timeline that has brought us to today. That first phase of work was really uh, where we started our qualitative um, assessment and engagement. There were um, many, many, uh, I would call key informant interviews. We, they collected a bunch of information and data about how we were approaching this critical issue. And they came forward with our baseline assessment in September of 2019. And in there was that was four key early recommendations. And those things, um, really informed where we went um, in, in our, our subsequent phase. And the second phase that was really August through, gosh, March of this year, um, Focus really took our, our quantitative data, our HMIS, our Homeless Management Information System data, to do a deep dive into our system performance and, uh, and by provider, provider by provider projects to really look at what was working and what was not. That report uh, was, was finished up late in 2019 and then presented to the, to the board in early March. Concurrent with that, we had four different work groups going around those interim recommendations. One of those work groups was on outreach, one was on housing focused shelter and what was you know what was going on or not going on on in our shelters one was focused on diversion and prevention and one was focused on governance and so there were teams that came together cross sector teams city reps provider reps community reps that worked on those issues and so when we were just sort of wrapping up that initial work and coming forward in March to do what was gonna be the kickoff for the actual action planning, what happened? <laughs> we all started a global pandemic and, 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 and it changed everything we did. So you'll see in this slide, you know, we really 
it, we put a pause on that work. I mean, literally, we had sent out invitations for a two-day community convening around system design and action planning for the end of March, and obviously that was put on pause. But in that, in that experience, in that, in sort of the aftermath of shelter in place, stay at home orders going in, into effect, we actually did a lot together. And I wanna highlight that because it, our experience working together on COVID response as it relates to homelessness actually influenced our framework quite significantly. And I think everyone's well aware we work very actively with our city partners on standing up um, our COVID sheltering system, the six hotels that we have in operation currently, and as well as five different shelter in place programs. So we have never had more um, shelter than we have right now. But meanwhile, it's still an incredible problem. We just look around the community and we've got to do more. So that is going to, that has influenced the plan. So then also, as you guys can imagine, we had a little bit of a delay again in August when the county was basically dealing with the CZU lightning fire and that oh, it was an all hands on deck moment for our, our team. And so again, we were stalled from moving forward. So one of the things, um, so we did then move forward. We worked with our project advisory team to put together the proposed framework. And that's what we have before, we brought before the board today. And really we are starting with a, a community engagement conversation. And this is our first one after the board um, to get some feedback and understanding about where we go from here. So we're really in this phase three. We did the framework and action planning. We have a proposed plan to move us forward and we're in that, that community conversation. The intention is to go through a series of conversations and, and Randy will speak to that at the end of our presentation and then come back to the board in January with a, a first six month work plan to guide the plan's implementation and really just that final dot the I's, cross the T's on this proposed plan. So I am happy to pause to see if there's any questions. Keep going. Yeah, I think it might be good, unless there's any burning questions from council, maybe we can keep going and have questions saved for the end. Perfect. So I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about, before we get to the action plan, where we go from here, talk really briefly about what, what did the assessment identify about how we were doing things? And really, um, the quick review of the findings were, we, is, you know, we they started with our strengths, that we had key pieces. We had a coordinated entry, our smart path system. We had outreach teams. We had shelters providing basic safety and service, but not really um, focused on getting folks to housing. And so we had these things in place that weren't really functioning at scale. It also identified some considerable gaps. And those were that we did not have a, a really robust diversion strategy to really try and reconnect folks with housing before they even entered a shelter system. And that diversion is usually, it's a, it's a term for problem solving, just working to understand what are the barriers? What are holding people back from, from, from getting back to permanent housing? It also identified that our, again, our shelter was really addressing basic, basic safety, but not really supportive service to get people on a path to housing, case management, housing navigation, that that was not offered consistently across all shelters. And really the result of that was a low success rate in terms of actual permanent housing placement. We, did, we don't have really great outcomes. Another uh, identified uh, gap was our governance and decision-making was not transparent or results-focused. Our staffing capacity was pretty inadequate given the scale of the problem. And we really have limited use of data to drive decisions or improvement. It was this really honest assessment of our, of our, our current response and it stressed the need that we had to have a systematic, integrated, connected approach from the first contact with someone experiencing homelessness to hopefully a successful exit to, to housing. That we had a loose coordination of activities 
that worked for some people, but really not for all people. And we focus strategies, our, you know, our consultants, our team really put it out there for us that we needed to move to a systematic approach where we had a shared vision and shared objectives at all levels, that our resources and funding were aligned with those measurable outcomes, that programs were designed and focused on meeting those outcomes and evaluated on a regular basis, and that we used data. So we needed a clear structure uh, and process for governance and decision making so we would be accountable to results. And that really, if we could get there, each person would receive timely and consistent response that sets them on a pathway to housing. I wanna just say, um, in doing this work, all our partners, our community providers, our city jurisdiction, people were very, very honest and open about what was working and what was not. It was a pretty hard look in the mirror and everyone has just been along this process said, we know we need to do better. We have to do more. So that really brings us to the framework. So I'm gonna pass it to Randy. Okay, am I coming through okay? Can people hear me? Thumbs up, okay. <laughs> Um, so Elisa introduced me as the new, I, I think new, I guess if it lasts for a year, I'm still new, um, Randy Morris, um, the director of the Human Services Department. I started in February, which is about four weeks before everything changed. Uh, but I want to, as a way of introduction, let you know I worked for 25 years in Alameda County in the Human Services equivalent, and to the topic that I'm presenting on here, Probably somewhere around five years ago, I watched what I'm sure is uh, resonates with you all as city. Um, profound tensions just grow as the visibility of homelessness really blew up in the cities of Oakland and Berkeley and Hayward and just watched tremendous tension play out with my board in Alameda County where cities and counties were struggling with what's our role, what do we do? So I'm no stranger um, to these challenges when you have an issue that's bigger than you know a city or a county can handle. Um, I also just want to make sure the city knows this in case you're not as aware because we've been discussed in um, county um, world over and over. I want to thank Elisa who on the backs of her and two other people handled a problem that's being transferred to me which is going to be on the shoulders of about seven or eight people and we still don't have enough people. So I don't know how Elisa and her team did this but I understand way before at least that the county didn't do very much at all. So at least we started to step up and we're stepping up more as a county to be better partners to city. Um, if you don't know human service departments, we basically have three big shops and that's you know the foster care division, um, the kind of public welfare division like CalFresh and Medi-Cal and welfare to work programs and employment programs and then aging programs like adult protective services and IHSS. Um, but throughout California, counties are struggling with who should be the administrative hub of this new vexing public policy dilemma that no one can solve, and that's the growing homeless crisis. And uh, it is happening throughout California that often uh, planning departments or CAO offices are transferring them to direct service offices like health or human services. So this transfer is just happening. Next week it gets official. Alyssa passes me this very big baton, and that's why she and I are doing these co-presentations, and Elisa will still be very involved in a policy role in our CAO's office, but I have a new director who's gonna be reporting to me starting on Monday. That's why the transition happened. Um, I see Martine not on video, but we invited him to be part of the interview panel. We wanted to have city, hi Martine, um, city and community representatives to help us pick a good director to help kind of coordinate um, this work. Um, I want to say one thing about, say just a touch more about what Elisa said about what happened when COVID hit, which you know is literally five weeks after I got here. If you don't know, in California state statute, human service agencies in county in California are required to provide mass care and shelter during a disaster. You know, it used to be things like earthquakes and fires. But this pandemic caused all county human service departments to have some role in what California stepped up and said, we need to make sure COVID doesn't spread in our homeless community. So that's why the federal FEMA money and the state money started flowing into the county to my department. And we basically stood up a whole um, emergency operation, which um, Elisa mentioned, and that's been a dominant part of my um, first nine months here is sort of managing 
that operation in conjunction with all the work that Elise is speaking to. But I just want to, if you don't know this, I, I think it's important to share for two reasons. One is um, with money and urgency, we actually can do things pretty quickly as government. But not to end with the glass half empty, but put reality on the table. As Elisa said, it's still very disturbing that despite all the infusion of money and all the good work I'm going to explain to you, you probably more than anyone as a city see it has not solved the issue. So I'm going to say with humility all the great things that have happened in COVID, but recognize it still isn't enough because the encampment issue is just completely perplexing to everyone. So I want to find a balance to share. We actually, in a very short order, stood up um, a system that is touching all, a little over 1,000 people experiencing homeless every month, which is a lot. But again, to what you guys see in the encampments, it's still far short of what the whole total is. Um, and that translates to, we have these six um, hotels that we've been able to lease through this program called Project Room Key, which is a blend of federal FEMA money and state money, which allows counties to move it forward. And that's has about 200 highly vulnerable people who would otherwise be at high risk of contracting COVID um, in uh, their own hotel rooms. Um, we have been able to take about 15 existing shelters, and this is what Elisa's team did a lot of work on, and help create social distancing and bring services there and make them 24-7, meal security, um, staffing to kind of help support um, stability there. We expanded, and you guys know one of these two, the Santa Cruz Vets Hall, but also the Watson Vets Hall, which has about um, 110 people who were able to expand into those spaces. Um, we stood up a transition age youth site at the Seventh Day Adventist um, location that serves about 15 plus people. And then as your city knows all too well, um, we worked in partnership with you all and are still working with it to stand up the Benchlands encampment that served at its peak about 100 people. Um, and then on top of that, it doesn't get a lot of fanfare, but um, mostly our health office and more is touching about 300 homeless people a month who are in various encampments throughout the community in the context of COVID trying to stop the spread by doing things like um, we've stood up hygiene centers, porta potties, hand washing stations, bring water, Purell, food, tents, sleeping bags, and health does health wellness checks and ensures that people who have declining health are getting um, healthcare need, and as we can, trying to refer people to all those systems into the very clogged up housing system that we have. So I just wanted to take a minute, if you didn't know that all of that has happened, and that is impressive, but it is also disturbing that the issues are still as pronounced as they are despite that, and that is deeply on the back of federal and state money that we're very, very anxious when that federal and state money goes away how are we going to keep um, not lose ground, which we'll be talking about a little bit today. So um, I hope that preamble introduction, a little bit of context setting was helpful as I now pick up this baton from Elisa as she described. This three-year framework wasn't influenced by what happened over COVID in the last six, seven months. Um, and what is listed here is just kind of like describing the sort of backbone of what's in the framework. So. Um, vision and guiding pr principles, Elisa mentioned some of these, actionable, um, has to be countywide, has to be cross-jurisdiction, we'll talk about that, has to be data-driven, a lot of homeless systems are just sort of um, blowing with the wind without a good sense of what's happening and responding to anecdotal issues and crises without any real system, without any sense of what the data is and seeing if the needles are moving in the right direction or wrong, other than point in time count. And then um, an equity lens. Uh, we want to make sure that we're tracking demographics on all sorts to see if we have um, different groups disproportionately being affected positively and negatively and do something about it if so. Um, Elisa mentioned, so I don't need to repeat, this um, has a number of goals that are um, have uh, very targeted results and capacity to measure success, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, this is also rooted in a number of strategies and key objectives, which I'll turn this back to Elise in a few minutes, and she's going to go a little bit deeper on it, but you can read it in the actual plan itself, and I forget, Elise, if we've sent it over to them and if they're posted on your website, but if not, we'll get it to you so you can see this plan um, where a lot of details are in there. Um, the second to last is very significant, and that is that embedded in this three-year plan, which serves as a framework, is every six months to reset and reevaluate so that we have kind of very concrete actionable plans that help ground the work and detail the work and then come back every six months. The environment is very fluid. 
uh, fun happened with the pandemic and the recession and it was very fluid so we're going to have to make adjustments so we built in a six-month work plan process at, um, every six months um, and the last and i'll say a little bit about the end of my presentation is we have a number of assumptions that if those assumptions change that could impact um, kind of how we do and so we need to name them because you the city nor we the county can fix this alone so there are other parties that have a role in this particularly the feds and state um, and more. Um, and then we also have tried to quantify what some of the resource needs are so we can be more clear and transparent with the community and between county and city about the distance between what resources we have and what we need and then we can figure out how to bridge that gap. The next one, Elisa. So this is a quick visual of if you have to just break it down to sort of what's the main thing we're trying to do just to kind of say in three years have we hit our mark. Um, let me just put the elephant on the table. This, unlike some aspirational plans, doesn't say we're solving all of this in three years, but what it's trying to say is we're gonna make a significant dent. So we are hoping in three years, if we are able to achieve everything listed in here, that we will reduce the unsheltered homeless population by 50%. And just for those who aren't sure of the language, unsheltered and what that means in this world, if you look at the bottom left, that's um, basically everybody but those who are in a shelter. Um, people who are in encampments, outdoors, vehicles, um, not their own home. But then when you throw in people who are in actual shelters, that's not their home, but they actually have a roof over the head in the shelter system, that's where when you put all that together, we want to reduce overall homelessness by 30%. And there's a lot of detail behind that that are on the slides that follow in the report. So if you can go to the next, Elisa. Um, so to break it down a touch more, um, trying to look at two big goals. Um, so the first is we want to improve the effectiveness of every single program we run. We have a lot of details in this plan and they will be borne out in the six month plans and we'll be tracking the data to see if we are getting these, the reducing the length of stay. You all probably know all too well the reason why shelters don't have any openings pre-COVID is because people are stuck in there and they don't move and there's reasons behind that. Um, Rate of rehousing is something we need to track and do a better job teasing out why um, is the rate so low and what we can do to increase that rate. And same thing, when people are stuck in some degree of homelessness, why is it we can't get them into programs? So we're gonna be tracking that as goal number one. And then goal two, it is not the only solution to homelessness, but it is a major solution and a real conundrum for all of us. How can we expand um, the bed capacity we have? Shelter is not a solution to homelessness, but it's better than being on the streets if people don't want to be on the streets, some do. So we need to have expanded shelter capacity. We were able in COVID to uh, expand significantly and we don't want to lose it if at all possible. But really we need to focus on more um, housing slots. And we'll say more about that because that's the big part where we need cities and county and planning departments to be working on this very, very complicated issue that's very vexing in communities with not in my backyard, but until we crack this nut, we're only gonna get so far in this, this uh, plan. So next one, Elisa. So this is my precursor to just put a big, big frame on what I'll turn over to Elisa because her and her team and focus strategies and people before me get a lot of credit for really trying to figure out how to organize this very complex puzzle in a way that's somewhat digestible and organized. So it really falls into these four boxes. So the upper left box called Better Connect and Serve, that's basically saying for people who are at point in time in the moment experiencing homelessness in a shelter, on the streets, in encampment, what can we do to enhance and improve our outreach, our engagement and connection with people who are in the moment uh, homeless. The upper right box, well, we have to have an outlet. We have to increase our housing stock and our housing options. We have to have pathways to somewhere. Um, so that's the second. Um, the lower left is we kind of, sorry if this analogy is not appropriate, <laughs> but we have to stop the bleeding. Um, there are many, many jurisdictions that, including where I just came from in Alameda, where you can track and track and track and people who are currently homeless and you can get them into housing but if the flow into homelessness, if more people or as many people are becoming homeless, you're not moving the needle. And so there's a whole host of prevention strategies to try to help people who are currently housed, even if precariously on the brink of 
um, to help make sure they remain housed so they don't become one of the people in the point in time count. Um, and then the lower right corner, um, you know, Martine and uh, uh, Mayor and Vice Mayor who are on this two by two committee know a lot about this, but we have a lot of work to do in the first six months of this to improve the administration of this. This is the boring stuff that's not really interesting to probably public. But in order to have a complex like system like this run effectively, you have to have a structure that makes sense. When you get to city and county, you have to have better ways of determining how decisions get made. These are very, very trying issues that get people finger pointing really quickly. Um, and to do that, you have to put some time and energy into figuring out what the process is, understanding what each other's roles are, and get a better governance structure, some more transparency, get the relationships working better. And that's even within county. Um, you know, we have a lot of county departments who have roles, and we're not, um, uh, we finger point ourselves internally before you even get to county city. So there's a lot of work to do to get the administration right, have enough staff. I know you guys went through this. You just hired a dedicated um, homeless coordinator. You lost a person. I saw Martine's email. You're reorganizing. All of us are trying to figure out how to organize the administration of this because it's so challenging um, on all of us. So there's a whole host of work that might not be as interesting to the community, but it's very important if we're going to do our job right to have that foundation in place. All right, so now Lisa's going to drill down a little bit more. And what okay, does it really mean? so I will try to not go too far, but I do want to get into the highlights of each of these. And just, just, just before I jump into strategy one, so we have these four strategies. Across these four buckets, there are 14 sub-strategies. And underneath each of those sub-strategies are what we're calling objectives. There are 48 objectives in this plan. And that is actionable, specific work we want to achieve within the next three years. We're not, we're not going to dump all of that on you today, but I do think it's very important as we reflect on the 2015 all-in plan. Great plan, big plan. Um, but part of the challenge was prioritizing what to do and what specific steps needed to be taken when and by who. This is not just for the county. This, this lift is going to take all of us. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But so with that, I'm gonna to go to the first strategy. As Randy said, this is, really, this is really focused on people experiencing homelessness, whether they're in shelter or they're living on the street in encampments and outside. Um, it's also where we really have sharpened our focus on encampments and, and in terms of both that experience of being homeless, but also the impact on communities of, of, of encampments. Randy already talked about uh, one of the capacity goals around this part of the plan is um, increasing our permanent shelter capacity by 150 beds. And, and the target within the, the modeling, we did focus strategies, did a predictive modeling for us, was that we would do a hundred, increase 130 individual beds and um, 20 family beds. So if you, you know, about five family units. Um, and when I want to talk about that is that is not, a, that's assuming our COVID sheltering system demobilizes. Um, and that this is our increase long-term over time. It's, to me, it's two reasonably sized navigation centers. It's, you know, it's stuff we were talking about before COVID. How did we have a stable, full service shelter system where people came in and moved on? But so that's part of this. So then I'm just gonna go into some of the highlights in each of these buckets. I'm not gonna go into depth. But um, the first strategy, 1.1, uh, there's four objectives, and this is really around COVID learning. This is health and safety. We did a tremendous amount of work with our new programs and our existing programs to promote access to health, disease prevention, and security. And obviously, from a public health standpoint, we have to keep doing that for the health of our shelter residents, the staff, and the rest of the community. So this is that commitment there. The second piece in strategy 1.2 is, uh, and this is another COVID learning moment, this is really where we learned about the value of low barrier shelter. Um, many of the folks that have been participating in the COVID shelter system have not been connected to services before, which is kind of 
striking. So this is really where you're being trauma-informed. You are um, trying to create ways for people to stay in shelter and stay connected. Sometimes folks, folks have you know, addiction problems and how do you work with that within that environment? So this is really, again, about how do we keep people engaged so we can get them out on a path to, path to housing? Strategy 1.3, this is where we start getting back to those, those questions about our gaps. This is really about providing robust services in shelters so people actually leave shelters and move on to pathways to housing. So that is the case management, that is the housing navigation, that's the connection to benefits, essential services. We've had that in a limited amount in some of our existing shelters, but it is not a common feature of, of our shelter system, and we have to get there if we really want to get to those goals of reducing homelessness by 30% in three years. The last, the last strategy, 1.4, is really the strategy focusing on people living outside an encampment. And it has seven objectives. This is where we start talking about more outreach that is focused on housing and links people to essential services, that we train that staff in deeper conversations about housing. One of the critiques of our outreach to date is it's been very health focused, but not housing focused. And we need to do that. We need to bring crisis response services to the streets and help people that are living outside connect, get better and move forward. Further, we need to collect data about that. And then the last piece of this, there's two objectives that is really around working across jurisdictions and, and for us across county departments to develop a shared approach to managing encampments on public properties. So that is all stuff that is in this part of the strategy around people living outside. Key partners to making this happen. Providers, obviously, we need, we need them to have the service capacity and training to do this better model cities and county departments. So th those are gonna be the key folks that are involved in standing up this part of the framework. I'm now going to find the arrow here and talk about the next strategy. And, and Randy said it, you know, it's one thing to sort of meet people where they are, but if we really wanna address this, we need to look at our housing options and supply to reach our, our three-year target. Um, strategy 2.1 really focuses on um, extremely low income folks. I mean, that's the population we're talking about. And one of the key uh, supply issues we, that is a measurable goal we're talking about is 100 units of permanent supportive housing. We need to bring that housing, that specialty housing to our community to really uh, make a dent in, our, in, in, in the results we're looking for. We need to, uh, the county and, and partners need to utilize all state and federal resources to acquire and build units. And there is the concept in there and that first strategy around an interagency housing pipeline group to talk about permanent supportive housing and that, that extremely low income units um, so we can actually move people forward. Strategy 2.2, there are three objectives here. This is really about our, um, our rapid uh, rehousing rental assistance programs. Um, rapid rehousing programs are where you provide some level of sort of titrated rental assistance combined with case management and, and housing navigation from moving someone out of a shelter into housing and you, you stand with them supporting them for a period of time to help them stay housed and really address their, their barriers. Specific in this strategy is a goal of over three years adding an additional 350 units, shall I say, of rapid uh, re, uh, rehousing programs. So this it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a physical thing, it's a program thing that where you're accessing existing rental, rental the rental market. Today, just in contrast with that, that number, that 350 number, today we have about 118 units of rapid rehousing for families and 86 units of rapid rehousing for adults. So this is a sizable increase. 
And I will say, um, and some of you know this from the two by two committee, the CMC, our Homeless Action Partnership, as a, as a function of um, CARE Act funds recently was um, allocated, might get this wrong, about $9.8 million through HUD with the focus on rapid rehousing, this kind of program, and um, addressing uh, COVID-related shelter. So our, our proposal to the state for using those funds is about half of it needs to go to 200 units of rapid rehousing and that case management and navigation to really get people out of these shelters and in, into housing. And then about the other half of it is towards supporting those COVID shelters in the first uh, part of next year. As our funding, our FEMA funding with that is, is, is always a little bit shaky. And uh, the other CARE Act dollars that the county has been using currently, those have to be spent by the end of December. So that is something that's really important around supply is that rapid rehousing programming. The third strategy with three objectives is really working with landlords and property managers. Like we need to have a stronger tie to our renting community and figuring out those barriers that, that, that rightly stop folks from renting uh, to people who are homeless. And how do, we, how do we work through that and provide the right incentives and information to make that, that a reality? The last one is really around our coordinated entry system and some technical ways to improve that and make that work better. And one of the key things there is that we commit that as part of coordinated entry, we have a housing specialist that can have a conversation with that person, that whether they're, they've lost their housing or they're about to and they've reached out to help them reconnect, to try and figure out that strategy to keep them housed. And that should be part of that initial touch. Partners in this strategy are really, again, cities, counties, housing providers, developers, financing entities, and quite frankly, our community welcoming affordable and permanent supportive housing units. You, you can't address homelessness without addressing supply. That is strategy two. Strategy three is where we really come back on that issue of problem solving and prevention. At the beginning of this briefing, I talked a little bit about how 40% of our respondents in the 2019 uh, point in time count shared that this is their first experience of homelessness, 40%. So the question there, as Randy said, is how do we stem that tide? How do we stop people falling into homelessness? Another really important piece of data that our, that our work with Focus Strategies revealed for us is if you look at who's entering our shelter system right now, 60% of them are entering from a house situation. They're not entering from being out on the street. So what we need to do is not have that, we need to be having using our shelter assets for people who are living outside and have a different way to respond to people who are teetering on the edge of homelessness. And this is what that strategy starts focusing on. It really starts focusing on that, again, those conversations to stop people and, and help them with problem solving using flexible funding. You know, is it they need to reconnect with a family member in another part, another part of the community, another part of the state to get to secure housing? Is it that they need um, a little bit of help with rent and they can stay in their housing? They might need to buy a bed so they can stay with a friend. How do we do that so they don't fall into the system? And that's really this idea of intake specialists that are going to have those conversations right as soon as they reach out and touch the system. The second second uh, strategy here, strategy 3.2, is really focusing on within our providers and our safety net organizations, how do we screen for those triggering events that create homelessness and get ahead of them? When, if people are already participating in a variety of programs, how do we keep them housed? How do we, how do we get ahead of that, that, that precipitous drop and really make sure that we can limit people um, falling into homelessness? 
partners here are going to be community providers, volunteers, and county safety net programs really working together on prevention. And I think, as we all know, it's far more uh, cost effective to prevent homelessness than having to deal with it after the fact. All right, our fourth strategy, and as Randy said, this is you know not the, not the fun step, but you can't do this without a strong backbone, backbone administration. Um, there are, I think, when I added this up, there are 17 objectives in this particular strategy area. The first one, and we had a, a, a bunch of fits and starts at really looking at governance, but is we have to design a new governance and decision-making model that aligns all of us around the same objectives and prioritization of funds. Second one here is authentically involve, get the viewpoint of people experiencing homelessness in designing our programs. Talk to our clients. I, some of you know I, one of the things I work on here is um, continuous improvement. And we always talk about voice of customer, understanding what is the experience of the person you're trying to help. What do they see? What do they need? And so that is part of this, is how do we, how do we understand, one, the variety in the experience of a homeless. We have working people, we have vets, we have folks that have been living outside for a long time. They all need different things. We have South County, we have North County, different things. How do we honor that diversity of experience? The next item is, is really about this new division. And, and Randy's spoken a little bit about it, um, that that administrative structure to lead and coordinate this work that is gonna involve all of us. It's not the county alone, but you need to have a backbone that's driving this forward that is adequately resourced, um, that this idea of the six-month work plan sticks, that it keeps us accountable. And within that, one of the intentions is that it, um, it, it really articulates what are the costs of these various interventions. So we are, we're not just sort of talking about it without understanding what, what do we need to buy and why and, and how we're going to move forward. So the work plan piece of this is really critical. The last element here is really being data informed. Um, we are... We've learned a lot in the last 18 months. We have a couple folks that are much more... Um, sophisticated in how they use data are some of our providing partners, but many people do not. And while people have participated in HMIS, our, our data system, they've done it just because they had to, but not as a way to actually promote improvement and, and really evaluate what's going on. So that's going to be a key component of this. And quite frankly, one of the reasons why the county in, in figuring out where we wanted to home our efforts was sitting it with uh, our human services department they have a very strong data analytics team. They've been doing this across our other programs for a long time. So the core competencies around using data, both in for internal operational improvement, but also to communicate externally is there. We're not recreating the wheel. We're applying it to a new problem. And I guess I just want to stress there, in that use of data, it's not just it's not just for insiders, but it's got to be available to the public. We need to be clear on what we're doing and why. So that is, and my phone's ringing, that is the quick summary of the framework. I'm going to pass it back to Randy. All right. If this was an in-person meeting, I think I'd say, is this the time we stand up and we go through an icebreaker exercise and shake out? And we're almost there. Hang in there. We're, we're, we're rounding the corner to the end here. Um, so these are what I said at the beginning, some assumptions. Um, it, you know, this is a little bit of a way of introduction of me to you, having worked in county government with cities, with advocates, with community providers. I, I just feel like I spend so much of my time trying to hone in on what is the role of each jurisdiction. You know, what can the county do and hold myself accountable to what the county can do? What can you guys do, hold yourselves accountable? This issue of homelessness is a symptom of at least three decades of a complex puzzle of causes <laughs> that include federal and state policy and actions that neither city nor county have any control over, but we sure are suffering from the decades of sort of decisions that get made. And I think if we're really honest with each other, in a community like Santa Cruz, where you have a huge unincorporated footprint, city and county shares in choices that are not in themselves bad, 
over a decade, there is not a lot of affordable housing that has been lifted up in this community, and that's a contributing factor. It's not a blame, but it just is what it is. So we have to put assumptions out because we county and you as partners in city, there are limits to what we can do, but we can at least track and name and be transparent and honest with the community what it is we're tracking and naming, and then let's focus our energies on what's in our control where collaboration works, and then where we really got to hunker down and uh, lobby at the state and the feds to fix issues that they've caused. So it's a complex puzzle with no simple solution, which makes it very, very hard to know where to point a finger. Because everybody has a blame, everybody has a role in the solution. So first, we've got a massive set of crises, and Santa Cruz and a few other communities in um, California have the fires on top of the pandemic and the recession that has followed. So we don't know what impact it will have on the housing market. It's a, it's a, it's like a tidal wave. <laughs> the earthquake hit. You know, I'm, you know, a few hours ahead, there's going to be the tidal wave. But we don't know what it's going to be. So there's an assumption that it's not going to have a major impact. We don't know. Um, state and federal resources lately have been flowing enough where we've been getting some resources to do some things pre-pandemic, during pandemic. We don't have control over what the state and feds decide. It's like those are major factors. And just so you know, like my department, before you get to homelessness, 90% of my funding is federal and state. So my ability to run my programs, you know, the county board of supervisors can say what they want, but when 90% of your funding is outside, homelessness is arguably kind of that complex. We have a lot of money right now from FEMA and the state. We can't control that, but we can lobby. Um, the division that um, I'm going to be lifting up starting next week with a new director, we will be pretty transparent with the county, and if we get into any cross-jurisdictional resource sharing, you know, that would be a discussion decision. We don't know what resources we need. We're just going to launch this plan. We're going to talk it through. We're going to do what we can to be responsive. Um, but if we don't have enough internal infrastructure to do what we want, I just have to be honest with the board about that and with everybody. But we're on a good start and better than what Elisa was managing with just her and mighty two people, which I don't know how she did that. Um, this next phrase, partners prioritize funding, that's a little bit of a um, euphemism for <laughs> A lot of times, you know, housing programs and planning departments have funding come in city or county, and they have choices to make. And I really truly say this as a benign statement. Sometimes those choices are made. They don't go to crack the issue of homelessness. They don't go to extremely low-income, vulnerable populations. They go other places, and that is what it is. But we, a human service department, can't control um, how planning decisions get made, and those are very complicated. They involve planning commissions, they involve you know public feedback, but we have to see how other partners prioritize funding, and if they don't get targeted towards creating more housing stock for extremely low income, we're gonna have limits to how far we can move the needle. And we'll, we'll say that in a benign, transparent way. Um, same thing below, housing developers and service providers. Um, there's limits to what government can do. We need partners to help do stuff, and what capacity does our community have to do this work is um, something we need to track and talk about. Um, and then to kind of end, and this is where it really gets to the rubber hits the roll with um, city and county. Um, you know, I'm talking to a number of elected officials, um, uh, city colleagues. This is a complicated world you guys have in dealing with things like siting. This is a mess of a challenge that whether you're county or city, you have to work with. And we will do our best to be good partners, have open conversations. But in the end of the day, if neither city nor county nor anybody can find a place to, even if we have money, to stand some things up, we're a little stuck. So I think that's going to be, have to be an open conversation during these three years and walk it through and figure out where and what way can we work through these very difficult issues. And it's going to involve elected. Um, and then the last is a little bit of the um, motherhood and apple pie comment, which is um, I truly believe I've been in the safety net um, five years nonprofit and graduate school and 25 years government. Every year that passes, I just keep focusing on what's in your control is how we work together. What's not in your control is all these other factors like fed and state. But I'm going to say the inverse of that is when we're pointing fingers, it's, my experience has been it's a lot of time and energy trying to prove who's right and who's wrong to the neglect of actually figuring out how to work together on something. And that is in our control. We can't change a divided Congress. We can't 
tell the governor of California what to do, but we can figure out how to work together and row in the same direction. And I hope that over these next six months and year to follow this history of the county doing nothing forever, and now we're stepped up in the last few years, that we just keep moving in this direction of stepping up and keep uh, earning your trust. And conversely, that we can be honest with you where we feel like as city, we would like you to consider a different way to work with us. Let's just do that. It's in our control. So, Elise, I forget if this we have the pretty little boat on the longer slides. If you can go to the next. Let me see. I'm trying. I'm doing. I don't know. Do we have? We don't have the boat. Uh, well, if we go to the board archive this morning, we just distilled this because we were given half an hour less with you guys. But there was a picture of a rowboat and. Uh, some comments about, come on, let's all get in the boat together. So imagine a really fun picture that inspires you to call to action. Um, okay, so the closing here, I believe, Elisa, this is our closing, is just to tell you where we are. The purpose of this, just to summarize, piggyback on Elisa's intro, this is really like the unveiling of this 18 months of work. Focus Strategy is sort of on the wings here. If you have questions for their technical work, they've worked in multiple jurisdictions throughout the country and have been really good guide um, for us. Um, but, you know, this was our opportunity to present um, and unveil this plan and open it up to the public after this work to date. We did the board this morning. Um, we're doing, we're working with you now, City of Watsonville tonight, the other two cities days ahead. Um, and then really for the next two months, we really want to get some feedback. And, though, and there's going to be a couple ways to do that. Some people in the city and some of your vendors and partners are on some of these, you know, third bullet, some of these virtual meetings that we're going to be having with partners and stakeholders. We're going to go out and be talking to people with lived experience, social distance and safe, but we're also going to be putting an online survey that's going to be open to the community. And I don't know if we send that to you, uh, Mayor Cummings or Martine, but we'll get to you when that hyperlink goes live so that you can send that around to your constituents or yourselves. And we're going to be collecting all this information over the next um, couple of months, organize that. And then in early 21, um, we're going to be coming back to the board and hopefully if you don't kick us out, <laughs> all four city councils, and ask you to do two things. I think the easier one, if you don't mind me throwing an opinion out there, is to actually adopt this three-year plan, which will be done. We'll put some graphics in it. It'll be more aesthetically pleasing, and it will be like adopted by the four city jurisdictions. I think the reason why that's conceptually easier is this is just a very good framework that involves your partnership in helping us develop this. Where I think the rubber is going to hit the road, and that's going to be the second part of what we do over the next few months, is the six-month plan. Because the six-month plans are the test. <laughs> we are going to outline what we want to do. We want to get people's feedback about where we should focus. But the real challenge is then who is going to work with us and be willing to sign up and say, I'll do that thing. <laughs> and so we're actually going to be asking partners, including cities. And you'll have ample time to look at it. We'll talk to you about it. And we would, it would be a great, um, great if the first six-month plan had a nice balance of sort of city partners and county government and other stakeholders each taking a piece of kind of how we're going to break down doing work over the first six months of this three-year process. So that's what we're going to work on over the next few months very openly, and we'll bring that first six-month plan back to your council. And for anything where the city's committing to, you'll hopefully have plenty of time to look at and say, yeah, I can do that. And that way you can adopt it as well, and then we'll all hold ourselves accountable for the six, first six months to keep rowing in the right direction and, and really start to hopefully move the needle in the right direction or more in the right direction. Elise, I believe that closes us out, but I am losing. Oh, oh my God, there's a boat. Sorry, there's a boat. There's a boat. Okay, so now are y'all inspired? So uh, success requires collaboration. On the left is a quick summary of what we're gonna work on and the right is we really need everybody to do it. And there's the picture of the boat. They would all jump in together. Let's keep rowing in the right direction. There, discussion, questions. And I think if you remove your um, the share, we can also- I can do that, yes. Yeah. I just want to start by one, thanking you all on that presentation, but two, really thanking you all for all the hard work that you've done to pull this together, especially when you had to stand up all the homeless services for COVID and, you know, get that staffed up. And then in addition to that, all the response that you all had to do for the fires as well and getting the evacuees sheltered and finding shelter for them. So, I mean, I, can, I can't imagine how much, um, how big of a lift this has been. And Randy, for this being your first five months, kind of walking right into it when it's all happening. Um, it's really impressive, everything that you all have been able to do. So thank you so much. And um, I know this is something that, you know, all the council members are really 
uh, concerned about and our you know, members of our community really care about. So I think it's a great opportunity to you know, continue having conversations of how we can work together. Um, I'll turn it over to uh, Council Member Golder and then Vice Mayor Myers for questions or other comments. I first also want to echo uh, Mayor Cummings' comments and say how pleased I am. This was probably like the most exciting thing I've heard all month, and um, I'm really impressed with all of the work that went into it, everyone that had a hand in it, and will in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my one question, when you were talking about increasing that housing, the um, very, very, the very low, um, was that for the city or for the county? And then with that, my only question is, okay, so then let's say someone, an individual or family gets in there, um, if there's no turnover, I mean, obviously we want them to stay housed, then like that's only, you know, 300 and something individuals or families. Does that make sense? Yeah, so um, it, it is countywide, mm -hmm. so it's, it's, and it's putting, expanding our rapid rehousing programming countywide. Um, and, and, and this is where actually it starts, I want to, when we talk about the modeling, it's, I almost want to say, Kate, help me out here. Um, part of the thing with the rapid rehousing is the concept is you provide rental assistance and support for a limited amount of time. And then they get to a place where they can sustain themselves. Now, there's still, that's, as I mentioned, that's not, not new housing units. It's basically new supports for helping people get into housing units. You did sort of, sort of by way of your question, we don't have in this plan um, a target around new housing units. That's something that I just, I will draw out there that it's not, that's not there. It's something that, you know, might, if we get feedback on that, that's something we may want to discuss, or that may be something that the community, the new governance structure wants to highlight moving forward. Um, I, I will say, you know, I think, the city of Santa Cruz has worked very, very actively to um, do more affordable housing. Not all jurisdictions are as successful as you guys. So um, that's, that's another piece of the pie that we're gonna have to start uh, honestly dealing with. Then the other follow-up question is, I think one obstacle for individuals can be their credit and part of like the criminal justice system uh, the ticketing, you know, affecting an individual's credit. Is there um, any collaboration with the courts um, to try and figure out how to overcome some of this and repair an individual's credit so that they can get to a place where they have more financial independence? So I would say that I don't think that the framework does not get into that level of detail, but when we talk about barriers, that is exactly the kinds of stuff that we think that housing navigation and that care management needs to look at. What is that specific thing that's holding someone back? It may be you have someone who is working, you know, whether they're criminally due or criminally injustice involved or not, but they have bad credit history. So how do we bring the resources together? And this is where I do think it's really important for us to again honor that it takes a village to address some of those things if that's the barrier that person has how do we work to make sure we can close it renee i'd like to i don't know if it's that informal i've told santa cruz is informal let's just say council member gold or whatever the right way to identify you um i just want to say a touch more um, from my experience in the safety net working with vulnerable low-income um, populations for many, many years. In a moment like this, where we don't even have the bodies to get out there and work with people to dig down into like an exact issue like you're bringing up, one of the things I hope we can work on is, sometimes you can find out that you can just help someone navigate a complicated system and they can undo that and remove that barrier. Other times, and this is really leading to my main point, you find out there's a systemic issue based on state law or federal law, and what you have to do when you have communities all over California running this exact same issue and you have good data, you can be, have a very thoughtful piece of legislation that says if you want to help help you know, solve this riddle of homelessness, we need to do this. And sometimes that's part of what we do, but right now it's really hard to get organized because we're just responding to crisis and we're, don't, we have anecdotes. So I'd like to think part of getting this organized better is we can be very targeted, including uh, trying to get legislative sponsors for systemic fixes that we can't fix at a local level. 
Thank you very much. I had a follow-up question that kind of ties into Councilmember Golder's um, initial comment, which is, you know, when we, so some of us on this call and um, along with uh, Supervisor Coonerty went over to the Life Moves model of um, homelessness response and housing. And one of the things they had is um, within their housing they had, for example, like apartments that were kind of transitional. Right, so you work your way up through the shelter, you you know, are in an apartment where you're stable, and then you move from there into you know more permanent housing. That was, and I and when I was when we were hearing the presentation, that kind of transitional housing was one of the things that I felt like was missing. And so, is that something that's under consideration? Like, you know, whether they're apartments or studios that, as people are kind of uh, stabilizing themselves, they can move into temporarily and then move on to something else, or, you know, and, and so what are your thoughts around that? So I'm gonna. I, this is one where I may actually use one of my lifeline calls and say, "Kate, hey, help me." What? Because most of you know, I am not a homeless expert. I'm one of those generalists that that your boss says, "Go work on this and make progress." But what I've learned is transitional housing. That idea here, you're in this one this thing for a little while, and then you'll move to another thing. That's kind of fallen out of favor. It's like, no, just just get someone to permanent housing. But with that. I'm going to use my lifeline call and say, Kate, is there anything you want to add about that concept of transitional housing um, and how we sort of, what, what's the, the current best practice around that? Right, thank you. Um, so uh, actually, um, so Focus Strategies actually does quite a bit of work in San Mateo County where Life Moves is based, so I'm very familiar with their program. Yeah, I see Elisa's right in that I think, I think what evidence shows from all around the country is the more people have to go from a place to a place to a place to a place to get to housing, the, the less effective that strategy is. So I mean, the, the goal is the fewest possible steps before someone's actually in a place where they can stay. That's the most trauma-informed way to address homelessness um, and uh, will get you the best results. Now, having said that, there certainly is a role for um, transitional housing for specialized populations that maybe need a little bit of a longer period of time to get stabilized. Um, but I think the, the thing I would tie back to is the parts of the framework that talk about um, bolstering the ability of the shelter system to provide people with the services they need. So the idea is, I mean, in a way, shelter becomes a variant of transitional housing. It's not as long, but it's the same idea that people are able to get in from outside have a safe place to be where they're going to work on the things that they need to do to get to housing as fast as they can. So, um, and really a lot of the transitional housing that Life Moves operates is is really in another community would be called shelter because their their length of stay are quite short. I hope that helps out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers and then Council Member Watkins. I'm just going to make my comments um, short because I'm privileged to work with these guys a lot through the two by two and I just mostly wanted to um, express my thanks again. You guys have been under an incredible amount of pressure over the last six months, actually over the last, well, coming up on a year it feels like. So um, I just want to publicly acknowledge the amount of work that Randy and his team and Elisa and um, everyone at the county um, has been doing on this. Um, plan in particular um, is greatly appreciated. Um, I think that when you can kind of see um, a framework that sort of has the elements in it that maybe you don't quite exactly understand as a, as a policymaker, someone who's trying to respond to community concerns, it's really, um, it's reassuring even though it is a very hard road ahead, it's just reassuring to start to see the puzzle a little bit clear, more clearly put together for us. So I think it gives us um, a really um, great guideline for, you know, how we describe the work to our community, which I think is one of the most important things we can do because our community, I think, is compassionate about this issue. They just cannot understand the ramifications or why it is happening. And I think that that just, you know, at a personal level, it's it's um, hard for people to really understand how we got here. And they want to help, but they're just not really sure exactly how to do it within the system. So I really appreciate you. Your presentation, I think, really um, shows that there's these pieces and these best practices, and we have to knit these things together, you know, to build a road that we can all follow. 
Um, so again, thank you for the presentation. Um, also, I just have one thing because they are such a um, prominent part of our community, you know, throughout the whole year, but I'm wondering if um, maybe you have done outreach um, with the university and potential, uh, you know, just some communication with them around these goals. Um, you know, we don't have a sense of whether students are becoming homeless or not. We've had um, public presentations and public comment that does state that. Um, and I know the university has tried to kind of grapple with, you know, standing up and making sure that there's availability of understanding those threats to students, but that might be one other audience to do maybe just um, a little bit of outreach with as well. So I don't want to add to your plate, but it just occurred to me um, as we as I heard the presentation. So again, thanks. Councilmember Myers, thank you for that. And honestly, I, um, I've had lots of conversations um, with uni university leadership around lots of things and sort of but around the edges of this. Um, so I feel like that's something we can we can and should do. I, it's interesting we when we we've actually done more work with Cabrillo around this. I know I don't know if it's just you know the nature of of the student population and, and some of the experience, but I think that's a great a, a great another you know anchor institution that needs. We're talking about getting in the boat. They got to get in the boat with us. We all need to be in this boat. So I really appreciate that feedback. Thank you. Councilmember Watkins. I will I'll just also express my appreciation of your time and the, um, just the comprehensive summary of this report. It's really great to see this as a foundational launch pad for our county. And, um, you know, we stand poised, ready to partner. And to your point, Randy, I think it's really important that we um, remember that we are in this boat together and that um, we need to think holistically about what we can do to leverage each other's partnerships. I guess just sort of um, maybe just piggybacking really quickly on Vice Mayor Myers' comments, one um, potential uh, way to really engage all of the education institutions is the Santa Cruz County College and Career Readiness Partnership, which includes the K-12 district, the COE, the County Office of Education, the UC Cabrillo, and CSUMB. So an opportunity really to hit all of those, given especially the um, the breadth of families and unaccompanied youth and foster youth that are uh, really making up a good portion of our homeless population here in Santa Cruz County and really what an opportunity to sort of shift directions for those um, those folks who could maybe get out of those cycles early in their lives I think is really a hopeful you know space as well as just the um, the heartache of having to understand that, that these are the realities for so many kids and, and young people in our community. Um, I think, you know, I, I think the, this is really complex and I, I'm sure we could get into so many aspects of the um, many issues and causes of homelessness in our community and just the root causes, just the whole, um, the whole gamut of um, really all the deep rooted issues. But one of the things, there's actually a couple things I wanted to, to check in with you about. And one is that, um, you know, the, um, if there's somebody who's experiencing mental health issues but is unwilling to accept um, uh, to go into some sort of treatment and or substance abuse um, issues, but un sort of willing to uh, get substance abuse treatment. And if then they do decide at, at one point, then um, the month long, you know, weeks long wait to actually get admitted. So how is that factored in um, given that that's one of the major kind of components of of those who are experiencing homelessness in our community. Um, so I'll, I'll ask that question. And then the, oh, the second question is, and then I'll, I know others want to ask questions as well, is we hear from uh, community members around, what about purchasing old hotels as potential transitional housing? So I don't know if you want to speak to that as well. Thank you. Sure. Um, so the, the, the question of on-demand treatment, I mean, that is, a huge issue. It's a huge issue for our homeless population. It's a huge issue for our homed population. And really, this is where I like need to turn to Eric Riera to like talk about that. Just the um, the depth of that problem. I what I can speak to a little bit in in this specific area 
is our um, focus intervention team, the FIT program that we had a year of experience with, but then with COVID basically had to put on hold. And I have to say that was part of our problem is, you know, we had some of our most um, challenging folk homeless. Well, it wasn't the criteria to be homeless, but it turned out most of the folks in that program were, um, you know, they almost all had alcohol and, and drug addiction issues. And not only was it hard to get treatment, Many of them were, you know, they had uh, cycled through so many times, programs didn't want them anymore. So there's this whole question of where do you even place people? You know, once, you know, they've been, what do we call it? Um, using jail time as a way to sort of, one, for people to get sober and maybe start thinking differently. Um, flash incarceration is I think what Eric called it. Um, but then that problem of placement, and like I said, that's not unique to homeless. It's a broader question of treatment capacity. What I know Erica said to me is when he's paying what I would say market rates for treatment beds, you know, even though Medi-Cal covers a certain rate, because he is literally competing with, you know, private insurers for those same beds. So, I mean, I'll be honest, this plan doesn't dig into that very, very challenging component of addiction in our community. But you know, again, you know, it, it's an onion. It's something we're going to have to look at for a portion of this population. We have lots um, of people who are sober. Randy, did you want to add something? Yeah, I want to piggyback a little bit. Um, first, is just by further introduction, the last position I had for eight years, I was the public conservator in Alameda County, um, which is Lansom and Petra Short LCS Mental Health Conservatorship Law. So for eight years, I watched the nexus of homelessness and voluntary versus involuntary treatment as literally the public conservator. Um, so I just want to share, I have that, that background where this issue has gotten so vexing and complicated. You might have seen legislation been passed and only San Francisco opted into trying to figure out how to have conservatorship. It's a very vexing issue because government does a horrible job picking and choosing who should have civil liberties to hold, even if there's due process in court. I just want to name that as one systemic issue. Number two, what I did not say in my introduction, but I think is enough on point that I'm going to say this. Um, Carlos, our county administrator, did not make the decision to have this office shifted from the CAO to human services. He made the decision to have it transferred to health and human services. And he left it up to me and Mimi Hall to make the decision how to do that because his direction is a very big picture vision guy, details. He hires people like me and Elisa and Mimi. The, the population needs the vent, the services of your shared safety net system. And so I just want to let you know that, but for the pandemic and some other financing issues that hit um, mental health more than human services, this could have easily moved to the health agency because of some of the very issues you're bringing up. But please know Eric and Mimi are actively involved behind the curtain in everything we're doing so we can keep working on that. And then the last, and please give Martine a little bit of credit here, we had a community hiring process and who we hired, who is the new director, is a medical doctor, public health professional who his last 13 years worked in the mental health system of a county as a housing director. So this nexus of housing and mental health and policies and civil liberties needs more attention, but I think we have the right people with experience looking at this. So let's keep this conversation active because it clearly needs more discussion and more resolution. Thank you, thank you. Okay, we'll have Council Member Matthews, then Council Member Brown. We, we didn't answer the question, that simple question about go by hotels. And oh yeah. It. <laughs> Let me answer that question. Okay, so um, Project Home Key, lots of money. So one, the application date was terrible, and it was right when we were heading into the fire. Um, we did work to try and see if we could pull something together, did a solicitation of hotel and motel all throughout the county. We had, um, I think we had one indicate they were somewhat interested in playing, um, but it's a very, very steep purchase price. And, and part of the problem with that is the way that Project Home Key uh, program worked is you were most competitive uh, based on your per door price. 
our core door, and it, the big thing was you wanted to be around $100,000 per door for hotel rooms. Um, and ours were between $250,000 and $280,000 per door. So the amount of money we would have had to generate locally to do it was much more. The other piece of it was you needed an operator. And because we didn't have a, a partnering operator to actually run the program um, over time, we were talking with Abode um, from Over the Hill, who does a lot of supportive housing and affordable housing and rapid re rental rehousing as well. And uh, because we didn't have a, an actual location, they sort of said, you know, this is a lot of work for an application that's not going to be very competitive. So we did not, we were not successful in getting it together for a project room key. That said, now that we've come out of the fires, we've come um, through this project, uh, the team is coming back together. We're, bringing, we're, we're talking to other partners from other parts of places in, in the state about operators, and we're gonna go back at this again. We're, we're pretty confident that more funds will go into whether it's Project Home Key or something like that moving forward, just given the perceived um, success of the initial program. So we're trying to gear up to figure out how we can be part of it moving forward. Thank you for the reminder, Randy. Okay, Council Member Matthews and then Council Member Brown. This is really an impressive report. I have not been involved in these discussions in any depth in the last couple of years. And I am really impressed with the amount of work that has gone into this and the structure of it. Um, I really look forward to looking at it in more detail. Um, I am impressed with the idea of um, having m more of the partners, hopefully all, um, on the same page about objectives and goals and so forth, and um, a real focus on um, call it accountability, successful outcomes, whatever, but, but feeling that we're making some tangible progress on this. Um, it's, um, the components just all make sense, and I think there is the will to, to go forward. Um, it does seem like, um, some of the assumptions that Randy mentioned um, are really optimistic in this horrible housing market here. I mean, it's way easier to do rapid rehousing in, I don't know, Central Valley or something, but this is brutal. So I don't know how much that reality has to weigh into this. Um, anyway, that's just my thought <laughs> looking at it. but. Um, I really was impressed. I look forward to looking at the full report. Uh, if it's not in the full report, I would be interested in some kind of an org chart. I mean, you all know I'm not, I'm not going to be sitting in this chair much longer, but it, it is an interest, and it's of interest to the, to the general public. It's always been kind of a mystery to me how all these pieces fit together and who's in charge of what, and I know that the people change, but it helps me, it helps sometimes to see a map <laughs> of who's in charge of what and who they work with, et cetera. So that's, that's just a comment and who the, the key people are. Just, just to get a sense of how, how the whole animal fits together. But it's really impressive work. And thank you for this presentation. You know, I just want to make one comment mindful. I've never been an elected official, but I've watched elected officials and worked with elected officials for a long time. Um, I'm sort of keying off of um, Vice Mayor Myers' comment about the I don't hope I don't butcher your words. The community's hungry to know like what to do. They care, but it's like so complicated. What do you do? You know, somewhere in here to your to your comment, um, Council Member Matthews. I don't know if you know when you look back 30 years and you think about all the different decision points over a long rear view mirror arc when communities have made decisions to not create housing in a way that catches up with <laughs> where we are today. In my experience, those turn into blame, finger pointing, it's very hard to have a conversation, people are polarized, but hopefully there can just be a more honest, like here's where we are today, can't do anything about what mm -hmm. happened. 
but just a really honest call to action that's not pointing fingers and blaming or asking for the impossible. But that's why this plan is a three-year plan. We are going to just slowly chip away at this and hopefully have a less finger pointing and more honest conversation about what can a community do during these difficult decisions when you have money that comes in and you can pick this or that or pick a fighting issue. They seem to be very complicated and get very polarized really quick. But maybe we can harness some of the interest in the community really to fix the issue if we can educate and do so in not a blame way, but in a empowering here's part of the solution. So I, I, I think your comment is spot on. It has to be front and center in the mix of discussions. I want to add one other thing around the reality of the housing market here. And I think that this was something that those of us who were able to do um, the Life Moves Tour, Mayor Cummings, remember that was December 13th. That was, we're almost a year away from that. Um, was that they had honest conversations with people about what does it cost to stay in the South Bay? What does it, and they also did a lot of work with their clients around employment. They had really strong relationships with, I'll just say, like major employers like Safeway and Costco and places like that. So if someone, well, you know, they were working, they were living in this sheltered environment with support, with behavioral health, with case management, and they were actually save, working and saving. And then they had conversations about you can transfer because of the nature of your employer to another community. And let's talk about what the actual average studio rent is across the state. So they had different kinds of conversations. And so, I mean, I, we don't know exactly how that's gonna look here, but part of it is I think Randy was saying, we have to have honest conversations mm -hmm. about what it's gonna take. And that in itself is going to be a set of of changes. That I mean, that doesn't mean no everyone has to move, but you have to have honest conversations about what it's going to take um, to stay here versus what your options are in other places. So I, I mean, that's you know, we can measure, but so much of this is going to be us coming together to have frank conversations about what's going to work and what and what's not. Thank you for those comments, uh, Councilmember Brown. Yeah, thank you for the presentation, Ditto, all the um, the kudos uh, for really giving us, uh, you know, an amazing overview of the work that's been done and planning for the future. It's really uh, exciting and I, I feel like a, a really positive uh, turn in our, um, in the ways that we think about and approach uh, addressing homelessness in our community. And um, so I, and I could, if I went into the weeds, I would have a million questions <laughs> because I really wanna know more about a lot of this stuff. But for now, I just wanted to ask two kind of bigger picture questions. Um, and I think one of them is related, so one of them's related to, you know, Randy, you said um, that uh, we've been able to demonstrate that with urgency and resources, we can, uh, you know, roll out uh, effective uh, approaches, effective ways of addressing these issues, maybe not so long-term solutions. Um, but um, given that and given the, um, the fact that our, our CARES Act funding will be um, uh, disappearing and we don't know uh, what the, the future holds, you, you do make some, uh, in addition to the housing market, some. Uh, optimistic assumptions, <laughs> and I hope those come true, that we do have uh, funding to maintain and expand upon the wonderful work that's been done. I'm just um, wondering if you could uh, say a little bit more about how you see that transition, um, in particular with respect to the, you know, the Benchlands encampment, which has been, um, from my perspective, uh, very successful, and I've heard wonderful things. I've, you know, been there and talked with people, and um, so that, you know, and, and now we have to move, and it's kind of the story, you know, and with the fighting issues and all that, it's just that we always kind of get something good going and then it's, you know, we either run out of funding or we have to move. And so I'm just wondering how you're thinking about that and what the potential is to keep, you know, g given that we are trying to make a transition to expand uh, space at the armory. Um, 
you know, ongoing operations for that because the issues are not going to go away. Um, so that's one question. And then the other one, um, it's kind of more of a comment, but I, I would be interested to hear if just there's any big picture thinking about how you are intending to uh, involve uh, people who are experiencing homelessness in uh, the work moving forward in program design and operations. Um, I'm really excited to hear that. I think it's you know something I've advocated for um, pretty consistently in the long time that I've been uh, working on these issues. And so I'd just love to hear just anything about that that you might want to add to, um, to help us understand where that's going. I'm going to talk first so I can leave the hard question for you, Elisa. Um, those are a couple different questions. I want to start with, um, you know, under key assumptions, and I agree with you, there was some ambitious, optimistic, um, heck, I'm thinking in this community it's safe to be like maybe we have a little hope with something that happened at the federal level. I don't know if that's inappropriate to bring up here. But um, there is an increasing uh, amount of certainly state and a little bit of federal narrative that's forming that because of FEMA money and states like California that put Project Lumpy money on the table, large numbers of people who had been in the streets that were, and again, the context was not get rid of encampments because I don't like to see them. It was stopping the spread of COVID. So we've been successful in this community, we did it. Well, now what? So this gets back to one of the assumptions is this is federal and state money, not city of Santa Cruz and county of Santa Cruz money. So how, you know, I'm talking to elected officials here, but you bump this up to state elected and federal elected, and my comment about federal, we have a different, we think, federal administration. There's gonna have to be a lot of advocacy. Is this country and is this state gonna accept these hundreds of thousands of people who have maybe for the first time in a long time a roof over their head, thanks to federal and state money, and then they're just gonna go back on the streets when the financial rule gets pulled. That's a political moment. And that's gonna be politics. And you are elected and you know the city tensions you deal with with competing priorities, but the state electives and the federal electives and the federal administration are gonna to have to make some hard decisions. I think there's a lot of advocacy, lobbying, media, et cetera, so that the rug doesn't get pulled. And maybe they reset the funding to say, let's at least not make it worse and hold this base funding. So I think there's a larger conversation that's going to take all communities to really lift up and pressure state and federal in, in a recession, so it's tough. I queued that up so I can let Elisa talk about the bench lands because she has the solution. <laughs> and then we do have your third, but we'll come back to that one last. Uh, so I guess I just wanted to say, um, I just think pre-COVID, as you know, we were watching the state legislature start, one of the key issues that was, was coming forward was you know, this one-off money every year from the state, but that, that, that you don't build a system with not getting, not sure what's coming and what you can use it for. And that was gonna be one of the, the big focus points for the state legislature around starting to recognize that one, local, local government cannot, you know, fund this problem, solve this problem alone, and that that was gonna have to be a part of it. Hopefully we will come back to that in, in, in future legislative sessions. At the same time, we do need to come up with local funding sources. You know, and, and one of the things you know, we, we talked with our city partners about, we were looking at raising our TOT with an idea that some piece of that would be focused on this community challenge. So we, I mean, I'm not, I'm not gonna, we have to figure out a way to fund quality programs moving forward. We have to. And we have to, you know, turn every dial for that. Um, in terms of, I mean, the armory is a class is, uh, is a classic one. All of you know the struggle to get that location, and we are so appreciative of the initial work of Ron Prince to make that happen, mm -hmm. um, and the fact that we're still there. Uh, we have to, you know, that we are all very sad that the Seaburg site acquisition did not happen. Um, we have to have locations to do this work. And we're gonna, we are just gonna have to, you know, roll up our sleeves as, 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 you know, appointed people like myself, elected folks like yourself to really work through that problem and figure out where are we going to cite quality programs. And, and by quality, it's yes, getting the outcomes, but it's also that are responsive to community concerns. That we, that there is a, there's a way to say we can do this 
we can do this in a way that does not cause undue negative impact to the neighbors around it. The city started that with the, with the River Street Camp. Now, I think if everyone goes back to that program where we had the police mobile site, you know, mobile fan thing on site, we had tons of security, and we little by little backed that off, and you had neighbors at the end of that program saying, it was fine. It was fine. So we have to have those conversations and we have to make the commitment to those conversations. Um, Randy, so I hope that starts to be a little bit responsive. It's not, I don't have a, I don't have a perfect answer, but I mean, I think those are the things we're gonna need to do. Randy, do you wanna talk about involving homeless? I actually opened to the plan so I can actually read the specific items that we're talking about for how do we authentically get the voices of people experiencing homelessness that we've articulated, but if there's something you want to speak to in that, I'm, I'm happy to, to yield my time. Uh, well, I just want to say, I, I heard you, Council Member Brown, say that's a meaningful thing too. I just want to name in my career, when I worked in the foster care system, I had the honor of standing up the first emancipated foster youth board in my time in Alameda County. It was painful and difficult and challenging, but very rewarding to actually have to confront the real people who you serve and hear really from them how short you fall. Um, and then when I promoted into aging, state law in California requires an in-home supportive services program, which is age blind and disabled Medi-Cal clients who get home and care and home, a consumer board that I met with for eight years, and to hear from people in wheelchairs what how hard it is to navigate this. So I'm, I'm forever changed as a public servant having been a participant in consumer groups. Um, I want to answer that in two ways. One is in our presentation, we did say, and it is going to happen, it's going to be a sample. There is going to be, in a COVID context, um, interviews to get feedback of people with lived experience now. But that's just part of it. The other part of it is um, there is expectations both by federal mandate, but not heavily policed. Um, but it is best practice to figure out a way to weave in current and past people with lived experience into your thinking systems. We don't do that here from what I can tell. I mean, there's bits and pieces, but they're not built in. And I can tell you, having done those two previous efforts in foster care and IHSS, it's not a simple task because you really have to build supports and systems in place. And sometimes it can be very traumatizing for people to come in with a bunch of people who have a good life and then have to leave and go back to their life. I mean, it's, there's a lot to it. So I think part of um, this three-year plan, I'd like to think that we can, if we choose to have this be a priority, we're gonna have to get the best heads together to figure out how to do it, but provide the support so that's real and meaningful and not just something that makes us feel good, but something that actually we really truly listen. And, I, and I've seen both happen. It's, I don't wanna be part of anything disingenuous and tokenizing. So we have to be really hold ourselves to task to do it correctly. I think Randy's answer is better than me reading anything from page 19 of the framework. <laughs> but it really, I, I think we already have some experience. Well, we we have folks with lived experience on the HAP currently, and they struggle to get gas money to come to the meeting. You know, they, they you know, we 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 need to look at this. You know, I'm paid to be there. You know, how do we, as Randy said, how do we support people to fully participate? Um, and 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 not have it be tokenism. One of the things we are saying about this is like, create a working group of advocates and those experiencing homelessness, that there's a group that comes together. So they're not a single person that's on this larger team that's supposed to represent that experience. And then that's the sort of commitment that, you know, they're squishy, but they're real. And those are the, the and, we're, and that's something that comes with trust. You know, you don't just, move your magic wand and make it happen. It's gonna, it's gonna come with trust and just sticking with it. And, and I actually I think, you know, when Robert comes, our new director, I think Robert has a lot of experience. I mean, I'll say this, this is, this is who we've hired. So he's not yet moving down to Santa Cruz, but he plans to be here on a regular basis. He's gonna be leading a team. And, and Randy shared this with me, I'm sharing it. He's like, well, can I just stay at one of the um, hotels that you guys are using for COVID shelter so I can be with the people that we're serving. Now, of course, our rooms are all full, so no, he can't, but that's who Robert is. 
you know, I want to be with the people I'm serving. I want to understand their experience. So he's here on Monday. <laughs> Great. Uh, Council Member Golder and then Vice Mayor Myers. So I have like 8,000 other ideas and things that I'd love to talk about, but I know you guys have somewhere else to be at six and we, we, and we have other things to cover this evening. So I was just wondering, um, so for us or other electeds to get involved in this new strategy, like what's the timeline and can you give some more details about that? Um, you got this, Lisa, or you want me to? Well, go ahead, Randy. Well, can I, with a healthy and appropriate lean on the mayor and the vice mayor and Martine, <clears throat> I, don't want to inter I don't want to tell you how to do your process. <laughs> but what I can say is, you know there's this existing forum called the two by two, where everybody I just named is a participant. That will or won't be a recurring forum over these next two months. Um, but we're really, the door is open for a couple of months. You can individually um, respond to the survey. You can engage those, and I know you guys are rotating, um, those who represent you at the two by two, um, or one off, you know, reach out, reach out to us. And again, it's probably worth naming. It's not as if the door closes in two months when we finalize the plan. We can just celebrate the plan's gonna look nice and should be a frame. Throughout the three years, there's gonna be ample room for ample conversation and a reset every six months. So plenty of moments to engage in the process. Elisa, do you want to say anything more specific? But I just don't want to get in your house. No, uh, no, uh, no, you know, I, 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 would that, I would just say the same exact thing. I mean, the framework we're going to have to adapt over time. This is not the last moment. Probably what's more important is that you're involved moving forward. And I think part of the conversations we have to have is what does that look like? And I don't know the answer. What does that look like? What piece of this, of this framework do you want to adopt, that, that you want to champion, that you want to watch, that you want to challenge us on? And, and just, you know, that you want to say, hey, I can help you connect with this part of the community for this piece of the solution. Because that's what it's going to take. I mean, we need to engage, you know, a whole bunch of our real estate and property management professionals to have hard conversations about what are people's fears about renting to very, very low income people who may have, as you said, bad credit or whatever. There is work that we can share. You know, it's not, it's not Randy's new team isn't gonna do all that work. We're gonna, this is gonna be a collective impact, spread the wealth moment. So um, we absolutely welcome your participation right now and moving forward. So then I have my one idea, I'm just gonna throw it on the table. So I know that we're thinking about this as getting these people into houses where you're thinking apartments or studios, but there's a lot of people in our community that, and, and I, I'm not trying to be rude, but they're probably a little older than me because their kids have moved out, but they might have an extra bedroom and maybe they haven't rented it out in the past and they don't need the income, but maybe they have a heart that wants to give and, and then like reaching out to that segment of our community that maybe they could be an opportunity where they haven't rented before. I think that's a great, great concept. And quite frankly, there is a program with our, with our um, YHDP, our Youth Homelessness Demonstration Project, and we have a team that actually is trying to work on that. And of course, big problem, COVID. So it's like, I think there are some like great ideas like that, you know, that could, you know, it's, it's all there for us to do, and this dang pandemic kind of put a big wrench in those kind of creative creative approaches to really, really utilize the assets we have in place. So I think, but that's exactly the kind of stuff we need to do. All right, uh, Vice Mayor Myers. Super quick question. Um, uh, you guys mentioned a new govern, kind of a new governance structure, and I'm just kind of maybe just a few seconds um, timing, kind of what this may mean. I know there's a lot of acronyms involved, but um, probably from maybe the perspective of um, sort of electeds and you know how you know we have the two by two, but there's two other cities in the county. Just just curious if you could just provide a tiny bit on that. 
So there has been lots of starts and stops on this, right? And right now, I mean, the biggest, the fo we've been focused on the continuum of care, the HAP, right? This HUD required structure as the place where by default, different kinds of money has come in. And you know, do we, do we, do we fix that? The other idea that has come up is do we have some kind of commission, right? where it's like it has elected, it may have some other stakeholders on it. Um, and, and there's some functions that, that, that the COC has to do that makes it challenging to mix the two up. So we've been wrestling with, do you need more than one and how do they relate to another each other? The other thing that the, the work group that was convened talked about, and actually I think was the, really the strongest preference was ultimately as we really uh, mature as a system is you probably need a JPA. That you, re you, know, that you really need to do something that, that has a, a lot more attention to how you manage finances that is, that is focused. And, and there's you know, good and bad examples of that in this field area. Um, but we don't have the answer. We have to, I think we're going to have to, we're going to have to move with something that where it's, you know, that classic don't let perfect be the enemy of the good, or how about don't let the good be the enemy of doing something. We have to do something. And it, and it does have to, I think it has to, it has to reflect the broad representation of the county as a whole, you know, because the issues of homelessness, there's a lot of commonality, but the faces across our county are a little different. And quite frankly, from me, from a staffing standpoint, I really would welcome the support and help of our elected officials with these dang siting issues. Because it's hard and it takes so, so, so much of our time. Thank you. I'd like to throw one more thing out there. I, I, the vision I would have to your question about what can, what's the elected officials role. So it's a little bit sideways on the governance. If we can do this right, and we all agree to using this frame, and we all buy into the six-month plan and who's going to do what and who's willing to you know, help be on a committee, I think it helps all of our elected city and county be able to have the same story they're telling constituents because people, for the most part, are very hungry. You know, what the heck's going on? And it's hard to answer that. <laughs> so call it governance, call it something else. If we all got in the same boat, and this is where I think my department and the baton being passed to me, if we can start producing information that's um, more consistent and tells the story, and it's a, fair, a story that's owned and embraced by everybody, I think there's an efficiency there. Because, <laughs> I mean, unless you all are different human beings in my last 30 years of experience in my other job, I mean, you all huddle behind, we all huddle behind closed doors and figure out who to point a finger at and what to do. I mean, it's a ton of time and energy that we could kind of refocus it. And, but, but I think we have to get the system up and running and then get to a point where we're all telling the same story and we're all communicating on more of a flow basis. And it's just more efficient. Great. Are there any final comments or questions from council members? Okay, hearing none, it looks like we're running up. Um, getting close to six o'clock and I know you all have another meeting to go to. So I just wanna thank you again for all the hard work you all put into this and everything that you've been doing around the standing up the shelters for COVID um, because I've been, you know, I don't think I've been, we, we haven't been getting many complaints. I think if anything, I've been hearing compliments on, you know, how well all these shelters have been being run and um, the positive impacts that they're having on the people who are, you know, staying in these in these facilities and in these shelters. So I just want to thank you all for all the hard work you've done to really stand up um, and, and provide an example for our community of what can be done effectively moving forward. So uh, thank you all again. Thank you. Good to see you all. Okay. Okay, with that, why don't we take a short break and then we'll, or actually, you know, I think that maybe what we can do is we can go ahead. Um, the next item on our agenda is oral communications. And so we can just go ahead with oral communications and um, 
after oral communications, we'll close out and we will reconvene at 7 p.m. for our evening item. And so for members of the public who are watching, oral communications is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us on items that were not on our agenda. And so if you'd like to address the council during oral communications, now is the time to call in using the number on your screen. Once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when you've been called upon, you'll be given two minutes to address the council. So again, if there's any members of the public who are watching who would like to address the council during oral communications, now is the time to call in. And once you dialed in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Okay, well, it doesn't look like we have anyone um, wanting to call in to address the council during oral communications. So I'll bring it back to council. It looks like Councilmember Matthews, you have a question or a comment? Yeah, um, this afternoon we got uh, by email a letter challenging the work master plan, a legal challenge. And so I'm just wondering if Tony's had a chance to take a look at that and how you want to communicate with us about that um, prior to the hearing. Like <laughs> Front Street revisited. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> thanks for your patience um, while I shut off my phone. Um, I, I have not had a chance to fully digest that, but I know that the staff and our uh, uh, consultant from DUDEC, Stephanie Strilo, have been working diligently to prepare a response, and I hope that they will be able to uh, respond uh, point by point at this evening's um, hearing. I think it would be appropriate, an appropriate question to ask at the outset so that we don't waste everyone's time if, if there's a recommendation for a continuance, but I'm not uh, prepared to make a recommendation uh, at this point. And if I could continue, do you think that that recommendation would come as a I'm result? I'm not hearing Councilman Matthews. Oh, pardon, pardon? Okay, sorry. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you, I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear your comment. Um, my question was, do you see any recommendations coming from staff after their consultation with Stephanie Strilo and Dudek, um, if they felt there were substantive issues that we should continue, that is, would the question be posed to them at the beginning of the meeting? Yes. Yeah, that, okay. that, that's correct. I know that they've made good progress in um, identifying the issues, and my sense is that we're probably uh, going to be recommending moving forward, but I haven't had a chance to circle back um, during this meeting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, if there's no other questions or comments from council members, uh, we'll go ahead and take a break, and we will reconvene at 7 p.m. and welcome to the 7 p.m. session of the Santa Cruz uh, November 10, 2020 meeting of the City Council. I have a few announcements and then we'll continue with our regular meeting. Tonight's meeting is being broadcast live on Community Television Channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All council members are um, participating in this meeting remotely and I want to thank the public for staying home to view tonight's City Council meeting. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, call in at the beginning of the item you wish to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you've called in and listen through the phone. Please note there's a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen through your television or your streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. 
When it's time for public comment, you'll want to press star 9 on your phone to raise your hand. And when it's your time to speak during public comment, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. The time will then be set to two minutes, and you may hang up once you've finished commenting on your item of interest. And with that, I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Byers? Here. Matthews? Here. Brown? Here. Golder? Here. Watkins? Here. Vice Mayor Myers? Here. And Mayor Cummings? Here. So uh, the next item on our agenda is the Santa Cruz Wharf Master Plan and Environmental Determination. Uh, for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you'd like to comment on, now's the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council, who then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. Um, this evening, um, we actually received some legal correspondence regarding this item, and so before we kick this item off, I'd like to defer to the uh, city attorney regarding the letter that we received earlier today. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Cummings, members of the city council, I, I would just like to ask for a five or 10 second delay while my wife and daughter take our dog out of the house. Unfortunate timing there. Um, he gets excited. Um, yes, so thank you. Uh, I, I'm going to make my comments uh, fairly brief. Um, the Work Master Plan is a comprehensive uh, document to update um, the, the planning for the Santa Cruz Municipal Work for the, the upcoming you know, long-term future, and uh, it's an exciting time for the city to really uh, think about uh, potential future uses of the work, preserving its character and history while still making it um, a more enjoyable place for uh, use by members of the public um, and the community. Um, I believe that the process for developing the plan started as early as back in like 2014. So it's been a very long-term process. And in the course of that process, we have also um, uh, spent a considerable effort in preparing uh, an environmental impact report pursuant to the requirements of CEQA. And, the, and generally, the way that works is that um, first, an initial study is prepared that looks at potential environmental impacts of the project. And then the notice of preparation goes out in which members of the public have an opportunity to comment on uh, and raise concerns about potential environmental impacts associated with the project. And those are all taken into account in determining whether or not um, an environmental impact report is required or if any potential impacts, impacts to the uh, environment associated with the project can be mitigated to a level of insignificance, then uh, it's possible to go forward with a shorter process uh, in, and adopt a negative declaration or a mitigated negative declaration. In this case, the city went back to mile and prepared an environmental impact report. And what happens then is that a draft is put out and it's uh, circulated and, um, and then uh, it's distributed to all uh, potentially responsible public agencies, entities that have oversight over uh, certain permit aspects or, or regulatory aspects of the project, as well as members of the community who have the chance then to come in and make comments and address what are perceived as uh, issues that have been overlooked or deficiencies in the analysis. And, um, and then what happens is those comments are taken into account and each and every one of the comments are um, are analyzed and responded to. And so the initial environmental impact report and the comments and the staff's responses to the comments and any adjustments to the environmental impact report that are made in response thereto are then 
compiled into the final environmental impact report. And so that's what's happened in this case. <clears throat> the, the, uh, the project here is the work master plan. It has been reviewed by the planning commission and the planning commission has recommended that it be adopted. Um, and so now it's come before the city council for uh, consideration of adoption of the work master plan and certification of the environmental impact report. And here's what happens frequently in these uh, situations is that there will be a um, potentially a flurry of last minute comments that are made that require further analysis or at least a response from the city staff. And that's what happened in this instance is that we got comments that weren't formally submitted to the city clerk as far as I am aware, but they were sent to council members and, and made their way to city staff. And that happened uh, late last evening and didn't cross my desk until after 1 p.m. this afternoon. So the staff have been diligently analyzing and look at th looking at these comments and uh, as a result of that, um, I'm afraid that at least as far as the staff recommendation goes, this evening's uh, uh, hearing may be anticlimactic because we would like to have some additional time to review, analyze, and, and really be able to more meaningfully respond to some of the last minute comments that we got. And so um, the recommendation, and I'm happy to allow planning director or the economic development director to weigh in here, but recommendation is to, like we did earlier this afternoon, as much as I did say it, uh, continue this item to provide us with more of an opportunity to fully analyze and meaningfully respond to the last minute salvo um, that, that we, we got on this project. Happy to answer any questions on the comments. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to mention, I think your sound is a little, you sound a little distant, Tony, so I don't know if there's a way to call in, um, but it might help with the sound on your end. I'll do that right now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I guess um, I'd like to ask my colleagues if they have any thoughts on this evening's item. I do kind of feel like similar to earlier, if we go through the process of um, getting a full presentation and going into some of the details we might be coming back to the same position where we have to go through it again if there's any necessary changes that have to be made. So um, I'd like to understand what people's thoughts are and whether, um, similar to the conversation we had earlier, if we wanted to have a date certain for when this should come back. And if that's the case, then I'd like to get a sense from the city attorney, from the planning and economic development director, what a good date for that would be. Um, and so I'll just open it up for discussion around those points with my colleagues. Councilmember Golder. Um, I think those of you that know me know I don't like wasting time. And again, I feel like this is a last ditch effort to stop something because somebody's not happy about it. And I think it's disappointing um, for those of us that are here and prepared and have taken off work or wherever we're, for whatever reason we're here and prepared. And um, I also think it's kind of almost weird and ominous for the public listening in that we've now canceled like both of our, or might cancel both of our main items. And I'm wondering, I know someone asked about um, having that last, correspondence be public record, I'm sure eventually it will be, but for this one, I'm just like wondering, is there a way that we can at least let the public know why we're doing this? And I just, yeah, that's because it, it seems, you know, disappointing for people that have been waiting for so many years and such a long time for today. On the last point, with me. That's better. You're good now. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, apparently my uh, my sound was turned off, but not my mic. Um, yeah, the letter is a public record. It's been received by the city clerk, and so it's available to members of the public on request. 
uh, and will also be included in the agenda packet uh, when the item comes back to you. If the council's pleasure it is to uh, put it put it over uh, to another meeting. Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, hi, uh, yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly disappointing. I think I spent pretty much most of my weekend meeting with people about the wharf project. Um, uh, it looks like there was a letter received, um, went to only four, three of the council members. Um, not quite sure why it wasn't given to the full council. Um, but I, I, I mean, I think uh, to the point of um, Mr. Condotti's comments, I think it's important for the city, especially with our financial straits that we're in, to um, evaluate all necessary, you know, risks that we have to evaluate as we move through different project um, considerations and approvals. So, um, kind of a, a double strike today. Um, and um, also this afternoon's uh, agenda item in terms of, you know, uh, definitely working with a lot of folks who are very interested in trying to understand um, how to get more housing downtown. And um, uh, so it's disappointing to have two major items um, at this point in time with these late letters arriving um, basically be postponed. Um, I guess my support would be that, or my proposal is that uh, I think we have um, potentially have the Front Street project coming back in December, uh, December 8th. Um, I hate to kick the wharf back and staff can um, correct me, but I, I think realistically the wharf's gonna have to move back to January at this point. Um, and hopefully we can um, address some of the issues brought up in the letters and um, you know, provide the opportunity for our community to weigh in on, on this important feature in our community. Certainly we've gotten lots of correspondence on it and um, just, uh, yeah, regretful that we've got two big projects and both of them uh, look like they probably have to be continued in the late, late communication. So um, my preference would be to um, try not to load up the December 8th meeting with two big uh, hearings. Um, and I think realistically, the wharf should probably be pushed back uh, to um, to January. I know there's incoming council members, but I believe that those council members can be adequately brought up to speed with regards to the wharf project. And I, I think it's, um, I think it's important to uh, recognize their um, you know, their role on the city council in moving something as important as the war forward, which is a major piece of infrastructure that I think they deserve to uh, have a vote on. So those are my thoughts. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Um, and I'll just say as well that I want to acknowledge how important this document is because it's come up in, uh, you know, our, our wharf, you know, some people may think that it doesn't need repair, but I think that it def definitely um, is going to, you know, there's parts of it that will start failing, especially if we're seeing intensified storms and intensified wave action. And we really need to, you know, get this master plan approved so that we can um, access state funds and begin to do some of the necessary improvements um, so that we don't lose our wharf because that's, you know, the other option is that if we don't, um, pass one of these plans and do the necessary maintenance, then uh, we can possibly see parts of our wharf fail and then, you know, we don't have a wharf. So, you know, I think that we need to do what we can to, to get um, this moving forward so that we can make the necessary repairs and really put um, the effort into, you know, upkeeping and renovating the wharf so that it's something that we can all enjoy moving forward. Uh, Council Member Golder. Before I make a motion, I just wanted to ask Tony Elliott if, um, if by postponing this, we are um, limiting our access to any grants or state funds that we would have had if we had moved the project or at least come to a vote today. Economic Development Director may have a comment about that. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. Um, just one comment we would make is there was a, a, there is a grant that we were hoping to apply for 
in December. December 19th is the deadline. So if it was possible, or, uh, if it would be possible to hear this at the November 24th meeting, that would be preferable. Um, and I just got off the phone with um, Director Lee Butler of Planning, and he, he seems to think that's, that's doable as well. And um, mm -hmm. uh, David McCormick, who is our asset manager, has been tracking closely at this. And so if you have additional gr uh, questions about that grant opportunity, he could answer those questions. David, if you'd like to weigh in, um, feel free. Yeah, I mean, I think Bonnie said it, uh, the SPP grant, uh, which I believe Claire from Public Works recently brought forward for the Riverwalk, uh, it's a substantial pot of money. It's the last round of it, uh, to my knowledge, um, up to eight, eight and a half million dollars. Uh, and we're watching as the state continues to cut funding for grant programs across the board. Uh, so it's very likely that, you know, if we miss these rounds, uh, there won't be a lot of money for a while for anything on the wharf uh, or more broadly. Um, as you may recall, this summer we applied for uh, a number of design grants for wharf landings. Um, we missed that timeline. We were not able to get the IR certified in time for them to make the decision uh, with the Wildlife Conservation Board. And so we lost, lost out on potentially a million dollars uh, worth of design grants uh, for these landings. So every time that we, we defer this and, and don't take action because someone's legislating, legislating through a lawsuit, um, you know, we're risking the future of the war. So it's just disappointing, but understandable. So can I, can I go ahead and make a motion? And I know there's other people that have comments, so I can hold off if you want, but um, maybe I'll wait till my colleagues make their comments and then I'm happy to make a motion. Okay. Uh, Council Member Brown. <clears throat> And Councilmember Watkins. Uh, yeah, I don't have any uh, specific comments um, other than being uh, disappointed as well. Um, and but I do think it's important for us to try to get this done uh, to. Uh, you know, potentially be able to access some grant money. I mean, that's that's really one of the primary drivers of getting this done. Uh, so I would suggest if we can't fit it on the 24th, I mean, I'd definitely be willing to call a special meeting and make sure that we get this done uh, so that you have the time you need, or, or Claire has the time and other staff to get a grant proposal in. I think it's, I think that's really important, so. Councilmember Watkins and Councilmember Matthews. Um, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, no, I echo everybody's comments thus far, and I'm just kind of curious as to whether, um, you know, the 24th is actually soon, right, in terms of preparing for um, a response. And so in terms of the timing, I don't know if, um, you know, uh, Lee wants to share or others, but um, what is actually necessary to have a response to the letter we received today? Um, so that we're able to make a decision because we absolutely don't want to miss out on potential funding opportunities. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you want to weigh in or, or Tony, if you want to elaborate further. Sure, I, I can just weigh in and say that um, for um, comments that come in during the, um, the public review period, we are legally required to provide written responses um, we're not legally required to provide a written response to the information that came in um, today. However, um, through the conversations that we've had, um, we have um, started preparing a uh, response um, and um, we're, we're uh, striving to be able to um, provide that information to the council tonight um, verbally, um, if nothing else, um, to establish that we um, uh, can address those issues. Um, we, uh, while we don't have uh, that legal requirement to prepare a written response, uh, you know, having that extra time um, would give us an opportunity, hopefully, to not only more carefully analyze what has been um, provided to us, but also to um, thoughtfully prepare a response that um, otherwise, you know, uh, may have missed something through the, the 
quick turnaround that we had during the council meeting today. If I'm, if I may, Mayor, for follow up, then so if I'm hearing you correctly, Lee, then what you're saying is that you know essentially you were anticipating us to move forward with the item this evening with a verbal response, but given the late nature of receiving this document, that we're not legally required to have a, a sort of a written response. But if I'm hearing Tony correctly, then I'm hearing you say that legally we want to defer. So I'm just trying to make sure I'm clear on what the recommendation. We do want to continue this to make sure that we can provide a thorough and complete response. Um, it's not mandated that that is a written response, but um, nevertheless, um, we, um, even though we were striving to provide a verbal response tonight, in our, in our uh, hustle, to, to respond, we didn't want to miss something. We, we said, you know, it's, it's better to take a step back and um, make sure that we're um, fully evaluating everything in the comment letters. You know, we don't want to miss something and then, you know, have to, you know, start over from scratch six or eight months from now through a lawsuit as a result of um, not, you know, putting this off for a short period of time. Okay, no, thank you for the clarification. I appreciate that. Councilmember Matthews. To say that this is disappointing is just uh, so far <laughs> inadequate. Um, the work that's gone into this for literally years and um, making the decision to pursue an EIR and a very thorough process and vetting to the commission and to have this come at the 11th hour again, um, I, I think probably most members of the public don't realize how um, really demoralizing this is to those who, who've worked on trying to um, preserve the war, both structurally and economically, and as a, as a, a cultural destination uh, for years. And, um, uh, it's been it's been said we have and will continue to lose major grant opportunities to sustain a, what is really a community treasure. It's, it's, it's very well spelled out in the staff report, and I would suggest to um, those members of the public who wrote take time to look up the staff report and read it. The agenda report. Um, it really is exceedingly complete. So I do support, unfortunately, continuing this. Um, you know, abundance of caution, but um, I also do want to uh, get questions answered and move forward. Okay. If there's no further discussion, um, <clears throat> I guess my last, um, my last couple of questions, and maybe this is for uh, the planning director and the city attorney. I guess when, how much time would you all need? Kind of given, you know, the turnaround in terms of, I think Thursday is when we're supposed to have, you know, agenda items to the city clerk. Um, so what would be kind of the recommendation if we're hoping to be able to, you know, have um, a decision made so that we can apply for these grants mid-December? Um, to me, that means we either need to bring it back on or before the first meeting in December. Hopefully, I would imagine that, that the sooner the better to give staff more time to apply for the grant. So I just wanted to get some thoughts from you on, on how much time to respond and, and what we should be thinking and considering with regards to continuing this. So, uh, Mr. McCormick, go ahead. I just wanted to mention, uh, as far as the grant goes, there is a little bit of preliminary work. Um, the FPP gro program is really centered around uh, engagement uh, with disadvantaged communities. Um, so there's a little bit of outreach, and uh, uh, which is always challenging at this time, um, but th that needs to happen with the, most likely the Beach Flats community and the areas around the, the wharf and beach area. As far as uh, sort of focusing on a project and, and what they'd like to see out of it, um, you know, the abundance of hearings we've had helps support that case, but um, potentially working through community bridges or somebody. Uh, I know uh, Noah and Parks is very interested in supporting the effort. Um, and uh, to that end, uh, you know, to, if, if council 
is able to support that or direct staff towards uh, conducting that outreach even in advance of approving the master plan, um, you know, that, that's sort of a necessary step to get these grants done. We were hoping to have it approved already so we could do that. So I guess Tony, to my question in terms of, yeah. I don't have, I don't anticipate a lot of additional uh, written material coming forward. Excuse me, how's that sneeze? Um, I don't anticipate a lot of additional written material coming forward. Um, I really think that the focus should be on uh, analyzing the comments and then uh, providing the council with a, 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 a more detailed response, even if it's just um, you know a verbal response at the meeting at the, when it when it comes back. Okay. Um, okay. And then I guess um, a follow-up question: Would we be able to, to provide? So if we if we were going to continue the item tonight, which it sounds like we're likely going to be doing. Would we be able to provide that additional direction to staff about conducting community engagement in anticipation um, for that grant? Um, or would we need to hear from the public and then bring it back and then make a separate motion since it's not part of the, it's not really the continuance that we're discussing at that point? I think it would be fine for the council to mm -hmm. uh, just a general direction to staff with regard the outreach um, that could be also brought back to the council for further discussion at the next meeting. So I don't see any problem with giving that preliminary direction at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll go with council member Watkins and then council member Matthews. Um, given the, the information we received this evening, then I'm happy to um, make a motion. I know that council member Golder was planning on doing that as well. Um, so however we would like to do it um, in regards to sort of just to, to move that we would have this item continued until our next meeting and also give direction for community outreach in preparation for the grant application to occur prior to that official action on the, the 24th, I believe. Okay, uh, we have a motion by Council Member Watkins. I'll go ahead and second the motion. Council Member Matthews. Again, um, I just raised the possibility of putting this on a closed session agenda item as, as a closed session agenda item as well, so we can ask questions in that environment that we may have regarding legal, legal issues. Well, I would just, uh, just responding to Council Member Matthews, um, I would note that the, the email thread that uh, presented you with the um, letter from the attorney mentioned uh, possible concessions that might avoid the possibility of litigation. So there is a threat of litigation that has been well, made definitely. in this case. Yeah. I, and, yeah. I, read, yeah. I read this. Yeah, the threat of litigation. Yeah. And so it would qualify for discussion in closed session as uh, significant exposure to litigation. Yeah. Okay, so we'll, so we'll also add that on to closed session for the next meeting as well then. Okay. All right, so we have a um, motion made by Council Member Watkins to continue this item to the next meeting and to direct staff to begin conducting uh, preliminary community outreach um, and to bring back recommendations before the next meeting. Is that correctly captured? Okay. So with that, uh, and then to also put this item on our, our next uh, closed session. Okay, so with that, I'll turn it to the clerk to conduct the roll call vote on this item. Thank you, Mayor. I just clarify, um, it was significant exposure, right, to litigation? Yes. Okay. That's right, Mike. Councilmember Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. 
Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. So that this item has been continued to our next meeting on November 24th. And with that, um, it looks like we'll conclude our, e our meeting for today and we'll see you all at our special city council meeting on November 16th.